Machine learning is one of the top technologies of the 21st century. It has brought in a revolution in the business sectors. Hello everyone. Welcome to this full course video on machine learning. This video will help you understand all the concepts and give you ample hands-on experience building machine learning models. We have our experienced instructors who will take you through this course. First, you will learn the basics of machine learning and jump into understanding the various machine learning algorithms. You will learn about linear regression, logistic regression, decision trees, support vector machines and many more. Then you will look at reinforcement learning and understand mathematics for machine learning. You will learn the concepts such as principal component analysis, regularization and feature selection. Finally, you will perform US election prediction analysis and understand the machine learning roadmap for 2021. So let's begin with a short animated video on machine learning. We know humans learn from their past experiences and machines follow instructions given by humans. But what if humans can train the machines to learn from their past data and do what humans can do and much faster? Well, that's called machine learning. But it's a lot more than just learning. It's also about understanding and reasoning. So today, we will learn about the basics of machine learning. So that's Paul. He loves listening to new songs. He either likes them or dislikes them. Paul decides this on the basis of the song's tempo, genre, intensity, and the gender of voice. For simplicity, let's just use tempo and intensity for now. So here, tempo is on the x-axis, ranging from relaxed to fast, whereas intensity is on the y-axis, ranging from light to soaring. We see that Paul likes the song with fast tempo and soaring intensity, while he dislikes the song with relaxed tempo and light intensity. So now we know Paul's choices. Let's say Paul listens to a new song. Let's name it as song A. Song A has fast tempo and a soaring intensity. So it lies somewhere here. Looking at the data, can you guess whether Paul will like the song or not? Correct. So Paul likes this song. By looking at Paul's past choices, we were able to classify the unknown song very easily. Right? Let's say now Paul listens to a new song. Let's label it as song B. So song B lies somewhere here with medium tempo and medium intensity. Neither relaxed nor fast, neither light nor soaring. Now can you guess whether Paul likes it or not? Not able to guess whether Paul will like it or dislike it? Are the choices unclear? Correct. We could easily classify song A. But when the choice became complicated as in the case of song B, yes, and that's where machine learning comes in. Let's see how. In the same example, for song B, if we draw a circle around the song B, we see that there are four votes for like, whereas one vote for dislike. If we go for the majority votes, we can say that Paul will definitely like the song. That's all. This was a basic machine learning algorithm also. It's called K-Nearest Neighbors. So this is just a small example in one of the many machine learning algorithms. Quite easy, right? Believe me, it is. But what happens when the choices become complicated, as in the case of song B? That's when machine learning comes in. It learns the data, builds the prediction model, and when the new data point comes in, it can easily predict for it. More the data, better the model, higher will be the accuracy. There are many ways in which the machine learns. It could be either supervised learning, unsupervised learning or reinforcement learning. Let's first quickly understand supervised learning. Suppose your friend gives you 1 million coins of 3 different currencies, say 1 rupee, 1 euro and 1 dirham. Each coin has different weights. For example, a coin of 1 rupee weighs 3 grams, 1 euro weighs 7 grams and 1 dirham weighs 4 grams. Your model will predict the currency of the coin. Here, your weight becomes the feature of coins, while currency becomes their label. When you feed this data to the machine learning model, it learns which feature is associated with which label. For example, it will learn that if a coin is of 3 grams, it will be a 1 rupee coin. Let's give a new coin to the machine. On the basis basis of the weight of the new coin, your model will predict the currency. Hence, supervised learning uses labeled data to train the model. Here the machine knew the features of the object and also the labels associated with those features. On this note, let's move to unsupervised learning and see the difference. 
Suppose you have cricket data set of various players with their respective scores and the wickets taken. When we feed this data set to the machine, the machine identifies the pattern of player performance. So it plots this data with the respective wickets on the x-axis while it runs on the y-axis. By looking at the data, you will clearly see that there are two clusters. The one cluster are the players who scored high runs and took less wickets, while the other cluster is of the players who scored less runs but took many wickets. So here we interpret these two clusters as batsmen and bowlers. The important point to note here is that there were no labels of batsmen and bowlers. Hence, the learning with unlabeled data is unsupervised learning. So we saw supervised learning where the data was labeled and the unsupervised learning where the data was unlabeled. And then there is reinforcement learning, which is a reward-based learning, or we can say that it works on the principle of feedback. Here, let's say you provide the system with an image of a dog and ask it to identify it. The system identifies it as a cat. So you give a negative feedback to the machine, saying that it's a dog's image. The machine will learn from the feedback and finally if it comes across any other image of a dog, it will be able to classify it correctly. That is reinforcement learning. To generalize machine learning model, let's see a flowchart. Input is given to a machine learning model, which then gives the output according to the algorithm applied. If it's right, we take the output as our final result. Else, we provide feedback to the training model and ask it to predict until it learns. I hope you've understood supervised and unsupervised learning. So let's have a quick quiz. You have to determine whether the given scenarios uses supervised or unsupervised learning. Simple, right? Scenario 1. Facebook recognizes your friend in a picture from an album of tagged photographs. Scenario 2. Netflix recommends new movies based on someone's past movie choices. Scenario 3. Analyzing bank data for suspicious transactions and flagging the fraud transactions. Think wisely and comment below your answers. Moving on, don't you sometimes wonder how is machine learning possible in today's era? Well, that's because today we have humongous data available. Everybody is online, either making a transaction or just surfing the internet. And that's generating a huge amount of data every minute. And that data, my friend, is the key to analysis. Also, the memory handling capabilities of computers have largely increased, which helps them to process such huge amount of data at hand without any delay. And yes, computers now have great computational powers. So there are a lot of applications of machine learning out there. To name a few, machine learning is used in healthcare where diagnostics are predicted for doctor's review. The sentiment analysis that the tech giants are doing on social media is another interesting application of machine learning, fraud detection in the finance sector and also to predict customer churn in the e-commerce sector. While booking a cab, you must have encountered surge pricing often where it says the fare of your trip has been updated continue booking? Yes, please. I'm getting late for office. Well, that's an interesting machine learning model which is used by global taxi giant Uber and others where they have differential pricing in real time based on demand, the number of cars available, bad weather, rush hour, etc. So they use the surge pricing model to ensure that those who need a cab can get one. Also, it uses predictive modeling to predict where the demand will be high with the goal that drivers can take care of the demand and search pricing can be minimized. Great! Hey Siri, can you remind me to book a cab at 6 p.m. today? Okay, I'll remind you. Thanks! No problem. Comment below some interesting everyday examples around you where machines are learning and doing amazing jobs. So that's all for machine learning basics today from my side. What is machine learning? Hello, my name is Richard Kirshner. I'm with the Simply Learn team. That's www.simplylearn.com. Get certified, get ahead. Today we're covering what is machine learning. What's in it for you? We're going to cover the basics of machine learning. What is machine learning? Artificial intelligence versus machine learning versus deep learning. How does machine learning work? Types of machine learning. Machine learning prerequisites. Applications of machine learning. Here we have our, um, it looks a little bit like Frankenstein, our Frankenstein looking robot. Today let me tell you what is machine learning. Machine learning works on the development of computer programs that can access data and use it to automatically learn and improve from experience. Watch a robot builder construct a house in two days. This was back in July 29th, 2016, so that's pretty impressive. This amount of time to continue to grow in its development. And it's smart enough to leave spaces in the brickwork for wiring and plumbing and can even cut and shape bricks to size. 
Amazon Echo relies on machine learning, and with more data it becomes more accurate. Play your favorite music, order pizza from Domino's, voice control your home, request rides from Uber. Have you ever wondered the difference between AI, machine learning, and deep learning? Artificial intelligence, a technique which enables machines to mimic human behavior. This is really important because this is how we are able to gauge how well our computations or what we're working on works is the fact that we're mimicking human behavior. We're using this to replace human work and make it more efficient and make it more streamlined and more accurate. And so the center of artificial intelligence is the big picture of all of this put together. IBM Deep Blue Chess, electronic game characters. Those are just a couple examples of artificial intelligence. Machine learning, a technique which uses statistical methods enabling machines to learn from their past data. So this means if you have your input from last time and you have your answer, you use that to help prove the next guess it makes for the correct answer. IBM Watson, Google search algorithm, email spam filters, these are all part of machine learning. And then deep learning, which is a subset of machine learning, composing algorithms that allow a model to train itself and perform tasks. AlphaGo, natural speech recognition. These are a couple examples. Deep learning is associated with tools like neural networks where it's kind of a black box. As it learns, it changes all these things that are, as a human, we'd have a very hard time tracking. And it's able to come up with an answer from that. Now, let's see how machine learning works. First, we start with training the data. Once we've trained the data, the train, we go into the machine learning algorithm, which then puts the data into a processing which then goes down to machine, another machine learning algorithm. And then we take new data, because you have to test whatever you did and make sure it works correctly, and we put that into the same algorithm. Once we do that, we check our prediction, we check our results, and from the prediction, if we've set aside some training data and we find out it didn't do a good job predicting it, and it gets a thumbs down, as you see, then we go back to the beginning and we retrain the algorithm. And a lot of times, it's not just about getting the wrong answer. It's about continually trying to get a better answer. So you'll see the first time, you might be like, oh, this is not the answer I want, depending on what domain you're working in, whether it's medical, economical, business, stocks, whatever. You try out your model, and if it's not giving you a good answer, you retrain it. If you think you can get a better answer, you retrain it. And you keep doing that until you get the best answer you can. Let's see the types of machine learning. Supervised learning, unsupervised learning. There's a number of ways to divide up machine learning and how it works. These are two main categories you can divide it into. Supervised learning, we have a known amount of data. So in this case, we have a bunch of apples. We have a machine learning algorithm. It goes through the process. It goes through and trains a model based on that known data. And then once you've trained your model on the known stuff, you can then put an unknown data in there and you get a new response. And of course, in this particular one, it's an apple. So it's trying to figure out whether it's an apple or another fruit. There are many different algorithms you can use for computing this information, for doing this supervised training. Just to list the, some of the top ones that are currently being used, and by no means, not there's more than just this. So by no means, this isn't the complete list. There's polynomial regression. There's a random forest. There's linear regression. There's logistic regression. There's decision trees, there's k-nearest neighbors, and there's naive bays. Like I said, this is just a short list of some of the many tools that are out there nowadays. And if you have supervised learning, then we should also look at unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning. So we have unknown data. In this case, you can see we have a bunch of fruit. And we might not have labeled it. We don't know. We've never had anybody look at it and say, this is what this is. And we take that data, and we put it through the machine learning algorithm. And then that goes through the processing and then the trained model. And what the trained model says, hey, can I see a pattern here? And from that pattern, it divides it up into a response, in this case, apples and pears. You can see some of these things look just like the other, and it tries to put them all together so that you get similar things in similar groups. And again, we have a nice list of algorithms here, and this is not uh, the only algorithms used for this. So don't limit yourself to this. just these. These are just some of the primary ones used today. And of course, we have the k-means clustering, singular value decomposition, fuzzy means, partial least squares, a priori, hierarchical clustering, principal component analysis. Machine learning prerequisites. Computer science, fundamentals and programming. So any of the machine learning out today, you have to know some basic scripting or programming. Intermediate statistical knowledge. You have to understand a little bit about probabilities. If A is current, how likely is B going to happen? 
if there's clouds overhead, how likely is it going to rain? Linear algebra and intermediate calculus. The linear algebra is very important because you have to understand basically drawing a line through the data points and what that means. That's the most fundamental linear regression model is you draw a line through all your data and you use that line to compute new values. Intermediate calculus means you need to have a little bit of understanding of what a differential equation is. You really don't need to be an expert because the computer does all the heavy lifting for you, but it's important to know the terms when they come up, unless you're doing some advanced programming on the actual models themselves. And data wrangling and cleaning. I would say this might be the biggest one in here is you have to start getting a grip on how to clean up your data. There's a saying is bad data in, bad data out. Good data in, you're more likely to have good data out. Some applications of machine learning. Instance segmentation. Object detection. Instant segmentation. You can see here where they use machine learning to go in there and find where the different cats are and the different objects are in the picture. And then in segmentation, it actually cuts them out. Kind of a fun one, especially if you have a Google Pixel phone and you can do little animation objects on top of your uh, ongoing pictures you're taking or movies. Number plate detection. You can see here where we have a car and it comes in there and it finds a number plate on the car. Once it's done that, it can then do automatic translation. Automatic translation is we pick up some symbols, in this case on a machine, and it does machine translation so that you can know what it's saying even if you don't speak that language. Let's look at another example of machine learning. Based on the amount of rainfall, how much would be the crop yield? So we, here we have our crops, we have our rainfall, and we want to know how much we're going to get from our crops this year. So we're going to introduce two variables, independent and dependent. The independent variable is a variable whose value does not change by the effect of other variables and is used to manipulate the dependent variable. It is often denoted as x. In our example, rainfall is the independent variable. This is a wonderful example because you can easily see that we can't control the rain, but the rain does control the crop. So when we talk about the independent variable controlling the dependent variable, let's define dependent variable as a variable whose value change when there is any manipulation in the values of the independent variables. It is often denoted as y. And you can see here our crop yield is dependent variable, and it is dependent on the amount of rainfall received. Now that we've taken a look at a real life example, let's go a little bit into the theory and some definitions on machine learning and see how that fits together with linear regression. Numerical and categorical values. Let's take our data coming in. And this is kind of random data from any kind of project. We want to divide it up into numerical and categorical. So numerical is numbers, age, salary, height, where categorical would be a description, the color, a dog's breed, gender. Categorical is limited to very specific items, where numerical is a range of information. Now that you've seen the difference between numerical and categorical data, let's take a look at some different machine learning definitions. When we look at our different machine learning algorithms, we can divide them into three areas. Supervised, unsupervised, reinforcement. We're only going to look at supervised today. Unsupervised means we don't have the answers, so we're just grouping things. Reinforcement is where we give positive and negative feedback to our algorithm to program it, and it doesn't have the information until after the fact. But today we're just looking at supervised, because that's where linear regression fits in. In supervised data, we have our data already there and our answers for a group. And then we use that to program our model and come up with an answer. The two most common uses for that is through the regression and classification. Now we're doing linear regression, so we're just going to focus on the regression side. And in the regression, we have simple linear regression, we have multiple linear regression, and we have polynomial linear regression. Now on these three, simple linear regression is the examples we've looked at so far where we have a lot of data and we draw a straight line through it. Multiple linear regression means we have multiple variables. Remember where we had the rainfall and the crops? We might add additional variables in there like how much food do we give our crops? When do we harvest them? Those would be additional information add into our model. And that's why it'd be multiple linear regression. And finally, we have polynomial linear regression. That is, instead of drawing a line, we can draw a curved line through it. Now that you see where regression model fits into the machine learning algorithms, and we're specifically looking at linear regression, let's go ahead and take a look at applications for linear regression. Let's look at a few applications of linear regression. Economic growth used to determine the economic growth of a country or a state in the coming quarter, can also be used to predict the GDP of a country. 
product price can be used to predict what would be the price of a product in the future. We can guess whether it's going to go up or down or should I buy today. Housing sales to estimate the number of houses a builder would sell and what price in the coming months. Score predictions. Cricket fever. To predict the number of runs a player would score in the coming matches based on the previous performance. I'm sure you can figure out other applications you could use linear regression for. So let's jump in and let's understand linear regression and dig into the theory. Understanding linear regression. Linear regression is a statistical model used to predict the relationship between independent and dependent variables by examining two factors. The first important one is which variables in particular are significant predictors of the outcome variable. And the second one that we need to look at closely is how significant is the regression line to make predictions with the highest possible accuracy. If it's inaccurate, we can't use it. So it's very important we find out the most accurate line we can get. Since linear regression is based on drawing a line through data, we're going to jump back and take a look at some Euclidean geometry. The simplest form of a simple linear regression equation with one dependent and one independent variable is represented by y equals m times x plus c. And if you look at our model here, we plotted two points on here, uh, x1 and y1, x2 and y2. y being the dependent variable, remember that from before, and x being the independent variable. So y depends on whatever x is. m, in this case, is the slope of the line, where m equals the difference in the y2 minus y1 and x2 minus x1. And finally, we have c, which is the coefficient of the line, or where it happens to cross the zero axes. Let's go back and look at an example we used earlier of linear regression. We're going to go back to plotting the amount of crop yield based on the amount of rainfall. And here we have our rainfall. Remember, we cannot change rainfall. And we have our crop yield, which is dependent on the rainfall. So we have our independent and our dependent variables. We're going to take this and draw a line through it as best we can through the middle of the data. And then we look at that. We put the red point on the y-axis is the amount of crop yield you can expect for the amount of rainfall represented by the green dot. So if we have an idea what the rainfall is for this year and what's going on, then we can guess how good our crops are going to be. And we've created a nice line right through the middle to give us a nice mathematical formula. Let's take a look and see what the math looks like behind this. Let's look at the intuition behind the regression line. Now, before we dive into the math and the formulas that go behind this and what's going on behind the scenes, I want you to note that when we get into the case study and we actually apply some Python script, that this math that you're going to see here is already done automatically for you. You don't have to have it memorized. It is, however, good to have an idea what's going on, so if people reference the different terms, you'll know what they're talking about. Let's consider a sample data set with five rows and find out how to draw the regression line. We're only going to do five rows because if we did like the rainfall with hundreds of points of data, that would be very hard to see what's going on with the mathematics. So we'll go ahead and create our own two sets of data. And we have our independent variable x and our dependent variable y. And when x was 1, we got y equals 2. When x was uh, 2, y was 4, and so on and so on. If we go ahead and plot this data on a graph, we can see how it forms a nice line through the middle. You can see where it's kind of grouped going upwards to the right. The next thing we want to know is what the means is of each of the data coming in, the x and the y. The means doesn't mean anything other than the average. So we add up all the numbers and divide by the total. So 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 over 5 equals 3. And the same for y, we get 4. If we go ahead and plot the means on the graph, we'll see we get 3 comma 4, which draws a nice line down the middle. A good estimate. Here we're going to dig deeper into the math behind the regression line. Now remember before I said you don't have to have all these formulas memorized or fully understand them, even though we're going to go into a little more detail of how it works. And if you're not a math whiz and you don't know if you've never seen the sigma character before, which looks a little bit like an E that's opened up, 
that just means summation. That's all that is. So when you see the sigma character, it just means we're adding everything in that row. And for computers, this is great because as a programmer, you can easily iterate through each of the x, y points and create all the information you need. So in the top half, you can see where we've broken that down into pieces. And as it goes through the first two points, it computes the squared value of x, the squared value of y, and x times y. And then it takes all of x and adds them up, all of y adds them up, all of x squared adds them up, and so on and so on. And you can see we have the sum of equal to 15, the sum is equal to 20, all the way up to x times y where the sum equals 66. This all comes from our formula for calculating a straight line, where y equals the slope times x plus the coefficient c. So we go down below, and we're going to compute more like the averages of these, and we're going to explain exactly what that is in just a minute, and where that information comes from. It's called the square means error. But we'll go into that in detail in a few minutes. All you need to do is look at the formula and see how we've gone about computing it line by line instead of trying to have a huge set of numbers pushed into it. And down here you'll see where the slope m equals, and on the top part if you read through the brackets you have the number of data points times the sum of x times y, which we computed one line at a time there, and that's just the 66, and take all that and you subtract it from the sum of x times the sum of y. And those have both been computed, so you have 15 times 20. And on the bottom, we have the number of lines times the sum of x squared, easily computed as 86 for the sum, minus, I'll take all that and subtract, the sum of x squared. And we end up, as we come across with our formula, you can plug in all those numbers, which is very easy to do on the computer. You don't have to do the math on a piece of paper or a calculator. And you'll get a slope of 0.6. And you'll get your C coefficient. If you continue to follow through that formula, you'll see it comes out as equal to 2.2. Continuing deeper into what's going behind the scenes, let's find out the predicted values of y for corresponding values of x using the linear equation where m equals 0.6 and c equals 2.2. We're going to take these values and we're going to go ahead and plot them. We're going to predict them, so y equals 0.6 times where x equals 1 plus 2.2 equals 2.8, so on and so on. And here, the blue points represent the actual y values, and the brown points represent the predicted y values based on the model we created. The distance between the actual and predicted values is known as residuals or errors. The best fit line should have the least sum of squares of these errors, also known as e square. If we put these into a nice chart where you can see x and you can see y, what we actual values were, and you can see y predicted, you can easily see where we take y minus y predicted and we get an answer. What is the difference between those two? And if we square that, y minus y prediction squared, we can then sum those squared values. That's where we get the 0.64 plus the 0.36 plus 1 all the way down until we have a summation equals 2.4. So, the sum of squared errors for this regression line is 2.4. We check this error for each line and conclude the best fit line having the least e square value. In a nice graphical representation, we can see here where we keep moving this line through the data points to make sure the best fit line has the least square distance between the data points and the regression line. Now, we only looked at the most commonly used formula for minimizing the distance. There are lots of ways to minimize the distance between the line and the data points, like sum of squared errors, sum of absolute errors, root mean square error, etc. What you want to take away from this is whatever formula is being used, you can easily, using a computer programming and iterating through the data, calculate the different parts of it. That way, these complicated formulas you see with the different summations and absolute values are easily computed one piece at a time. Up until this point, we've only been looking at two values, x and y. Well, in the real world, it's very rare that you only have two values when you're figuring out a solution. So let's move on to the next topic, multiple linear regression. Let's take a brief look at what happens when you have multiple inputs. So in multiple linear regression, we have, uh, well, we'll start with the simple linear regression, where we had y equals m plus x plus c, and we're trying to find the value of y. Now with multiple linear regression, we have multiple variables coming in. So instead of having just x, we have x1, x2, x3. 
And instead of having just one slope, each variable has its own slope attached to it. As you can see here, we have m1, m2, m3, and we still just have the single coefficient. So when you're dealing with multiple linear regression, you basically take your single linear regression and you spread it out. So you have y equals m1 times x1 plus m2 times x2, so on all the way to m to the nth, x to the nth, and then you add your coefficient on there. Implementation of linear regression. Now we get into my favorite part. Let's understand how multiple linear regression works by implementing it in Python. If you remember before, we were looking at a company and just based on its R&D, trying to figure out its profit, we're going to start looking at the expenditure of the company. We're going to go back to that. And we're going to predict its profit. But instead of predicting it just on the R&D, we're going to look at other factors like administration costs, marketing costs, and so on. And from there, we're going to see if we can figure out what the profit of that company is going to be. To start our coding, we're going to begin by importing some basic libraries. And we're going to be looking through the data before we do any kind of linear regression. We're going to take a look at the data to see what we're playing with. Then we'll go ahead and format the data to the format we need to be able to run it in the linear regression model. And then from there we'll go ahead and solve it and just see how valid our solution is. So let's start with importing the basic libraries. Now I'm going to be doing this in Anaconda Jupyter Notebook, a very popular IDE. I enjoy it because it's such a visual to look at and it's so easy to use. Um, just any IDE for Python will work just fine for this. So break out your favorite Python IDE. So here we are in our Jupyter Notebook. Let me go ahead and paste our first piece of code in there and let's walk through what libraries we're importing. First we're going to import numpy as np and then I want you to skip one line and look at import pandas as pd. These are very common tools that you need with most of your linear regression. The numpy, which stands for number Python, is usually denoted as np, and you have to almost have that for your sklearn toolbox. So you always import that right off the beginning. Pandas, although you don't have to have it for your sklearn libraries, it does such a wonderful job of importing data, setting it up into a data frame so we can manipulate it rather easily, and it has a lot of tools also in addition to that. So we usually like to use the pandas when we can, and I'll show you what that looks like. The other three lines are for us to get a visual of this data and take a look at it. So we're going to import matplotlibrary.pyplot as plt and then seaborn as sns. Seaborn works with the matplot library. So you have to always import matplot library and then seaborn sits on top of it. And we'll take a look at what that looks like. You could use any of your own plotting libraries you want. There's all kinds of ways to look at the data. These are just very common ones, and the Seaborn is so easy to use, it just looks beautiful. It's a nice representation that you can actually take and show somebody. And the final line is the ambersigned matplot library inline. That is only because I'm doing an inline IDE. My interface in the Anaconda Jupyter Notebook requires I put that in there, or you're not going to see the graph when it comes up. Let's go ahead and run this. It's not going to be that interesting, because we're just setting up variables. In fact, it's not going to do anything that we can see, but it is importing these different libraries and setup. The next step is load the data set and extract independent and dependent variables. Now, here in the slide you'll see companies equals pd.read csv and it has a long line there with the file at the end, 1000companies.csv. You're going to have to change this to fit whatever setup you have. And the file itself you can request. Just go down to the commentary below this video and put a note in there and Simply Learn will try to get in contact with you and supply you with that file so you can try this coding yourself. So we're going to add this code in here and we're going to see that I have companies equals pd.reader underscore csv and I've changed this path to match my computer c colon slash simply learn slash 1000 underscore companies dot csv and then below there we're going to set the x equals to companies under the i location and because this is companies is a pd data set I can use this nice notation that says take every row that's what the colon, the first colon is, comma, except for the last column. That's what the second part is, where we have a colon minus one, and we want the values set into there. So X is no longer a data set, a pandas data set, but we can easily extract the data from our pandas data set with this notation. And then Y, we're going to set equal to the last row. Well, the question is going to be, what are we actually looking at? So let's go ahead and take a look at that. And we're going to look at the companies.head 
which lists the first five rows of data. And I'll open up the file in just a second so you can see where that's coming from. But let's look at the data in here as far as the way the pandas sees it. When I hit run, you'll see it breaks it out into a nice setup. This is what pandas, one of the things pandas is really good about is it looks just like an Excel spreadsheet. You have your rows, and remember, when we're programming, we always start with zero. We don't start with one. So it shows the first five rows. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then it shows your different columns. R&D spend, administration, marketing spend, state, profit. It even notes that the top are column names. It was never told that, but Pandas is able to recognize a lot of things that they're not the same as the data rows. Why don't we go ahead and open this file up in a CSV so you can actually see the raw data. So here I've opened it up as a text editor, and you can see at the top we have R&D spend, comma, administration, comma, marketing spend, comma, state, comma, profit, carriage return. I don't know about you, but I'd go crazy trying to read files like this. That's why we use the Pandas. You could also open this up in an Excel and it would separate it since it is a comma separated variable file. But we don't want to look at this one. We want to look at something we can read rather easily. So let's flip back and take a look at that top part, the first five rows. Now, as nice as this format is where I can see the data, to me it doesn't mean a whole lot. Maybe you're an expert in business and investments and you understand what uh, $165,349.20 compared to the administration cost of $136,897.80, so on, so on, helps to create the profit of $192,261.83. That makes no sense to me whatsoever, no pun intended. So let's flip back here and take a look at our next set of code where we're going to graph it so we can get a better understanding of our data and what it means. So at this point, we're going to use a single line of code to get a lot of information so we can see where we're going with this. Let's go ahead and paste that into our uh, notebook and see what we got going. And so we have the visualization. And again, we're using SNS, which is pandas. As you can see, we imported the matplot library, dot pyplot as PLT, which then the Seaborn uses. And we imported the Seaborn as SNS. And then that final line of code helps us show this in our um, inline coding. Without this, it wouldn't display, and you could display it to a file and other means. And that's the matplot library inline with the amber sign at the beginning. So here we come down to the single line of code. Seaborn is great because it actually recognizes the panda data frame. So I can just take the companies.core for coordinates, and I can put that right into the Seaborn. And when we run this, we get this beautiful plot. And let's just take a look at what this plot means. If you look at this plot on mine, the colors are probably a little bit more purplish and blue than the original one. Uh, we have the columns and the rows. We have R&D spending, we have administration, we have marketing spending, and profit. And if you cross-index any two of these, since we're interested in profit, if you cross-index profit with profit, it's going to show up, if you look at the scale on the right, way up in the dark. Why? Because those are the same data. They have an exact correspondence. So R&D spending is going to be the same as R&D spending and the same thing with administration costs. So right down the middle you get this dark row or dark um, diagonal row that shows that this is the highest corresponding data that's exactly the same. And as it becomes lighter, there's less connections between the data. So we can see with profit, obviously profit is the same as profit, and next, it has a very high correlation with R&D spending, which we looked at earlier. And it has a slightly less connection to marketing spending, and even less to how much money we put into the administration. So now that we have a nice look at the data, let's go ahead and dig in and create some actual useful linear regression models so that we can predict values and have a better profit. Now that we've taken a look at the visualization of this data, we're going to move on to the next step. Instead of just having a pretty picture, we need to generate some hard data, some hard values. So let's see what that looks like. We're going to set up our linear regression model in two steps. The first one is we need to prepare some of our data so it fits correctly. And let's go ahead and paste this code into our Jupyter Notebook. And what we're bringing in is we're going to bring in the sklearn preprocessing, where we're going to import the label encoder and the one hot encoder. To use the label encoder, we're going to create a variable called label encoder and set it equal to capital L label capital E encoder. This creates a class that we can reuse for transferring the labels back and forth. Now about now you should ask, what labels are we talking about? Let's go take a look at the data we processed before and see what I'm talking about here. If you remember when we did the companies.head and we printed the top five rows of data, we have our columns going across. We have column 0, which is R&D spending, 
column one, which is administration, column two, which is marketing spending, and column three is state. And you'll see under state, we have New York, California, Florida. Now, to do a linear regression model, it doesn't know how to process New York. It knows how to process a number. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to change that New York, California, and Florida, and we're going to change those to numbers. That's what this line of code does here. X equals, and then it has the colon, comma, three in brackets. The first part, the colon, comma, means that we're going to look at all the different rows. So we're going to keep them all together. But the only row we're going to edit is the third row. And in there, we're going to take the label coder, and we're going to fit and transform the X, also the third row. So we're going to take that third row, and we're going to set it equal to a transformation. And that transformation basically tells it that instead of having a uh, New York, it has a 0 or a 1 or a 2. And then finally, we need to do a one hot encoder, which equals one hot encoder categorical features equals 3. And then we take the X, and we go ahead and do that equal to one hot encoder fit transform X to array. This final transformation preps our data for us so it's completely set the way we need it as just a row of numbers. Even though it's not in here, let's go ahead and print X and just take a look at what this data is doing. You'll see you have an array of arrays, and then each array is a row of numbers. And if I go ahead and just do row zero, you'll see I have a nice organized row of numbers that the computer now understands. We'll go ahead and take this out there because it doesn't mean a whole lot to us. It's just a row of numbers. Next, on setting up our data, we have avoiding dummy variable trap. This is very important. Why? Because the computer has automatically transformed our header into the setup. And it's automatically transformed all these different variables. So when we did the encoder, the encoder created two columns. And what we need to do is just have the one because it has both the variable and the name. That's what this piece of code does here. Let's go ahead and paste this in here. And we have x equals x colon comma one colon. All this is doing is removing that one extra column we put in there when we did our one hot encoder and our label encoding. And let's go ahead and run that. And now we get to create our linear regression model. And let's see what that looks like here. And we're going to do that in two steps. The first step is going to be in splitting the data. Now, whenever we create a uh, predictive model of data, we always want to split it up so we have a training set and we have a testing set. That's very important. Otherwise, we'd be very unethical without testing it to see how good our fit is. And then we'll go ahead and create our multiple linear regression model and train it and set it up. Let's go ahead and paste this next piece of code in here. And I'll go ahead and shrink it down a size or two so it all fits on one line. So from the sklearn model selection, we're going to import train test split. And you'll see that we've created four completely different variables. We have capital X train, capital X test, smaller case Y train, smaller case Y test. That is the standard way that they usually reference these when we're doing different uh, models. You usually see that a capital X, and you see the train and the test and the lowercase y. What this is, is X is our data going in. That's our R&D spin, our administration, our marketing. And then Y, which we're training, is the answer. That's the profit. Because we want to know the profit of an unknown entity. So that's what we're going to shoot for in this tutorial. The next part, train test split, we take X and we take Y. We've already created those. X has the columns with the data in it, and Y has a column with profit in it. And then we're going to set the test size equals 0.2. That basically means 20%. So 20% of the rows are going to be tested. We're going to just put them off to the side. So since we're using 1,000 lines of data, that means that 200 of those lines we're going to hold off to the side to test for later. And then the random state equals 0. We're going to randomize which ones it picks to hold off to the side. We'll go ahead and run this. It's not overly exciting because it's setting up our variables. But the next step is, the next step we actually create our linear regression model. Now that we got to the linear regression model, we get that next piece of the puzzle. Let's go ahead and put that code in there and walk through it. So here we go. We're going to paste it in there. And let's go ahead and, uh, since this is a shorter line of code, let's zoom up there so we can get a good look. And we have from the sklearn.linear underscore model, we're going to import linear regression. Now, I don't know if you recall from earlier, when we were doing all the math, let's go ahead and flip back there and take a look at that. Do you remember this, where we had this long formula on the bottom, and we were doing all this summization? And then we also looked at uh, setting it up with the different 
lines, and then we also looked all the way down to multiple linear regression, where we're adding all those formulas together. All of that is wrapped up in this one section. So what's going on here is I'm going to create a variable called regressor. And the regressor equals the linear regression. That's the linear regression model that has all that math built in. So we don't have to have it all memorized or have to compute it individually. And then we do the regressor.fit. In this case, we do x train and y train because we're using the training data, x being the data in and y being profit, what we're looking at. And this does all that math for us. So within one click and one line, we've created the whole linear regression model and we fit the data to the linear regression model. And you can see that when I run the regressor, it gives an output linear regression. It says copy x equals true, fit intercept equals true, in jobs equal one, normalize equals false. It's just giving you some general information on what's going on with that regressor model. Now that we've created our linear regression model, let's go ahead and use it. And if you remember, we kept a bunch of data aside. So we're going to do a y predict variable, and we're going to put in the x test. And let's see what that looks like. Yeah, scroll up a little bit, paste that in here. Predicting the test set results. So here we have y predict equals regressor dot predict x test going in. And this gives us y predict. Now because I'm in Jupyter inline, I can just put the variable up there. And when I hit the run button, it'll print that array out. I could have just as easily done print y predict. So if you're in a different IDE that's not an inline setup like the Jupyter Notebook, you can do it this way, print y predict. And you'll see that for the 200 different test variables we kept off to the side, it's going to produce 200 answers. This is what it says the profit are for those 200 predictions. But let's don't stop there. Let's keep going and take a couple look. We're going to take just a short detail here and calculating the coefficients and the intercepts. This gives us a quick flash at what's going on behind the line. We're going to take a short detour here, and we're going to be calculating the coefficient and intercepts. So you can see what those look like. What's really nice about our regressor we created is it already has the coefficients for us. And we can simply just print regressor.coefficient underscore. When I run this, you'll see our coefficients here. And if we can do the regressor coefficient, we can also do the regressor intercept. And let's run that and take a look at that. This all came from the multiple regression model. And we'll flip over so you can remember where this is going into and where it's coming from. You can see the formula down here where y equals m1 times x1 plus m2 times x2 and so on and so on plus c, the coefficient. So these variables fit right into this formula. y equals slope 1 times column 1 variable plus slope 2 times column 2 variable all the way to the m into the n and x to the n plus c, the coefficient. Or in this case, you have minus 8.89 to the power of 2, et cetera, et cetera, times the first column and the second column and the third column. And then our intercept is the minus 103009 point. Boy, it gets kind of complicated when you look at it. This is why we don't do this by hand anymore. This is why we have the computer to make these calculations easy to understand and calculate. Now, I told you that was a short detour, and we're coming towards the end of our script. As you remember from the beginning, I said if we're going to divide this information, we have to make sure it's a valid model, that this model works and understand how good it works. So calculating the R squared value, that's what we're going to use to predict how good our prediction is. And let's take a look at what that looks like in code. And so we're going to use this from sklearn.metrics. We're going to import R2 score. That's the R squared value. And we're looking at the error. So in the R2 score, we take our Y test versus our Y predict. Y test is the actual values we're testing. That was the one that was given to us so we know are true. The Y predict of those 200 values is what we think it was true. And when we go ahead and run this, we see we get a 0.9352. That's the R2 score. Now, it's not exactly a straight percentage, so it's not saying it's 93% correct. But you do want that in the upper 90s oh, and higher shows that this is a very valid prediction based on the R2 score. And if our squared value of 0.91, or 92 as we got on our model, because remember it does have a random generation involved, this proves the model is a good model, which means success! Yay! We successfully trained our model with certain predictors and estimated the profit of the companies using linear regression. What is logistic regression? As I mentioned earlier, logistic regression is an algorithm for performing binary classification. So let's take an example and see how this works. 
Let's say your car has not been serviced for quite a few years and now you want to find out if it is going to break down in the near future. So this is like a classification problem, find out whether your car will break down or not. So how are we going to perform this classification? So here's how it looks. If we plot the information along the x and y axis x is the number of years since the last service was performed and y is the probability of your car breaking down and let's say this information was this data rather was collected from several car users it's not just your car but several car users so that is our labeled data so the data has been collected and um, for for the number of years and when the car broke down and what was the probability and that has been plotted along x and y axis so this provides an idea or from this graph we can find out whether your car will break down or not we'll see how so first of all the probability can go from 0 to 1 as you all are aware probability can be between 0 and 1 and as we can imagine it is intuitive as well as the number of years are on the lower side maybe one year two years or three years till after the service the chances of your car breaking down are very limited right so for example chances of your car breaking down or the probability of your car breaking down within two years of your last service are 0.1 probability similarly three years is maybe 0.3 and so on but as the number of years increases let's say if it was six or seven years there is almost a certainty that your car is going to break down that is what this graph shows so this is an example of a application of the classification algorithm and we will see in little details how exactly logistic regression is applied here one more thing needs to be added here is that the dependent variables outcome is discrete so if we are talking about whether the car is going to break down or not so that is a discrete value the y that we are talking about the dependent variable that we are talking about what we are looking at is whether the car is going to break down or not yes or no that is what we are talking about so here the outcome is discrete and not a continuous value so this is how the logistic regression curve looks let me explain a little bit what exactly how exactly we are going to uh, determine the class at the outcome rather so for a logistic regression curve a threshold has to be set saying that because this is a probability calculation remember this is a probability calculation and the probability itself will not be zero or one but based on the probability we need to decide what the outcome should be so there has to be a threshold like for example 0.5 can be the threshold let's say in this case so any value of the probability below 0.5 is considered to be zero and any value above 0.5 is considered to be one so an output of let's say 0.8 will mean that the car will break down so that is considered as an output of one and let's say uh, an output of 0.29 is considered as zero which means that the car will not break down so that's the way logistic regression works now let's do a quick comparison between logistic regression and linear regression because they both have the term regression in them so it can cause confusion so let's try to remove that confusion so what is linear regression linear regression is a process is once again an algorithm for supervised learning however here you're going to find a continuous value you're going to determine a continuous value it could be the price of a real estate property it could be your hike how much hike you're going to get or it could be a stock price these are all continuous values these are not discrete compared to a yes or a no kind of a response that we are looking for in logistic regression so this is one example of a linear regression let's say at the HR team of a company tries to find out what should be the salary hike of an employee so they collect all the details of their existing employees their ratings and their salary hikes what has been given and that is the labeled information that is available and the system learns from this it is trained and it learns from this labeled information so that when a new employee's information is fed based on the rating it will determine what should be the height so this is a linear regression problem and a linear regression example now salary is a continuous value you can get 5000 5500 
by 1600. It is not discrete like a cat or a dog or an apple or a banana. These are discrete or a yes or a no. These are discrete values. Right? So this where you are trying to find continuous values is where we use linear regression. So let's say just to extend on this scenario, we now want to find out whether this employee is going to get a promotion or not. So we want to find out that is a discrete problem, right? A yes or no kind of a problem. In this case, we actually cannot use linear regression, even though we may have labeled data. So this is the labeled data. So based on the employee rating, these are the ratings and then some people got the promotion and this is the ratings for which people did not get promotion. That is a no. And this is the rating for which people got promotion. We just plotted the data about whether a person has got, an employee has got promotion or not. Yes, no, right? So there is nothing in between. And what is the employee's rating? Okay. And ratings can be continuous. That is not an issue. But the output is discrete in this case. Whether employee got promotion? Yes, no. Okay. So if we try to plot that and we try to find a straight line, this is how it would look. And as you can see, it doesn't look very right because it looks like there will be a lot of errors. This root mean square error, if you remember for linear regression, would be very, very high. And also the, the values cannot go beyond zero or beyond one. So the graph should probably look somewhat like this, clipped at zero and one. But still, the straight line doesn't look right. Therefore, instead of using a linear equation, we need to come up with something different. And therefore, the logistic regression model looks somewhat like this. So we calculate the probability. And if we plot that probability, not in the form of a straight line, but we need to use some other equation, we will see very soon what that equation is, then it is a gradual process, right? So you see here, people with some of these ratings are not getting any promotions, and then slowly uh, at, at certain rating, they get promotion. So that is a gradual process. And uh, this is how the math behind logistic regression looks. So we are trying to find the odds for a particular event happening. And this is the formula for finding the odds. So the probability of an event happening divided by the probability of the event not happening. So P, if it is the probability of the event happening, probability of the person getting a promotion and divided by the probability of the person not getting a promotion, that is one minus P. So this is how you measure the odds. Now, the values of the odds range from 0 to infinity. So when this probability is 0, then the odds will, the value of the odds is equal to 0. And when the probability becomes 1, then the value of the odds is 1 by 0, that will be infinity. But the probability itself remains between 0 and 1. Now, this is how an equation of a straight line looks. So y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1x, where beta 0 is the y-intercept and beta 1 is the slope of the line. If we take the odds equation and take a log of both sides, then this would look somewhat like this. And the term logistic is actually derived from the fact that we are doing this. We take a log of px by 1 minus px. This is an extension of the calculation of odds that we have seen, right? And that is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1x, which is the equation of the straight line. And now from here, if you want to find out the value of px, you will see we can take the exponential on both sides. And then if we solve that equation, we will get the equation of px like this. px is equal to 1 by 1 plus e to the power of minus beta 0 plus beta 1x. And recall, this is nothing but the equation of the line, which is equal to y. y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1x. So that this is the equation also known as the sigmoid function. And this is the equation of the logistic regression algorithm. All right. And if this is plotted, this is how the sigmoid curve is obtained. So let's compare linear and logistic regression, how they are different from each other. Let's go back. So linear regression is solved or used to solve regression problems and logistic regression is used to solve 
classification problems. So both are called regression, but linear regression is used for solving regression problems where we predict continuous values, whereas logistic regression is used for solving classification problems where we have had to predict discrete values. The response variables in case of linear regression are continuous in nature, whereas here they are categorical or discrete in nature. And uh, the linear regression helps to estimate the dependent variable when there is a change in the independent variable, whereas here in case of logistic regression, it helps to calculate the probability or the possibility of a particular event happening. And linear regression, as the name suggests, is a straight line that's why it's called linear regression whereas logistic regression is a sigmoid function and the curve is the shape of the curve is s it's an s-shaped curve this is another example of application of logistic regression in weather prediction whether it's going to rain or not rain now keep in mind both are used in weather prediction if we want to find the discrete values like whether it's going to rain or not rain that is a classification problem we use logistic regression but if we want to determine what is going to be the temperature tomorrow then we use linear regression so just keep in mind that in weather prediction we actually use both but these are some examples of logistic regression so we want to find out whether it's going to be rain or not whether it's going to be sunny or not whether it's going to snow or not these are all logistic regression examples a few more examples classification of objects this is a again another example of logistic regression now here of course one distinction is that these are multi-class classification so logistic regression is not used in its original form but it is used in a slightly different form so we say whether it is a dog or not a dog i hope you understand so instead of saying is it a dog or a cat or an elephant we convert this into saying so because we need to keep it to binary classification so we say is it a dog or not a dog? Is it a cat or not a cat? So that's the way logistic regression can be used for classifying objects. Otherwise, there are other techniques which can be used for performing multi-class classification. In healthcare, logistic regression is used to find the survival rate of a patient. So they take multiple parameters like trauma score and age and so on and so forth and they try to predict the rate of survival. All right, now finally, let's take an example and see how we can apply logistic regression to predict the number that is shown in the image. So this is actually a live demo. I will take you into Jupyter Notebook and um, show the code. But before that, let me take you through a couple of slides to explain what we are trying to do. So let's say you have an eight by eight image and there the image has a number, one, two, three, four, and you need to train your model to predict what this number is. So how do we do this? So the first thing is obviously in any machine learning process, you train your model. So in this case, we are using logistic regression. So, and then we provide a training set to train the model. And then we test how accurate our model is with the test data, which means that like any machine learning process, we split our initial data into two parts, training set and test set. With the training set, we train our model. And then with the test set, we, we test the model till we get good accuracy. And then we use it for, for inference, right? So that is typical methodology of uh, uh, training, testing, and then deploying of machine learning models. So let's uh, take a look at the code and uh, see what we are doing. So I will not go line by line, but just take you through some of the blocks. So first thing we do is import all the libraries, and then we basically take a look at the images and see what is the total number of images. We can display using matplotlib some of the images or a sample of these images and um, then we split the data into training and test as i mentioned earlier and we can do some exploratory analysis and uh, then we build our model we train our model with the training set and then we test it with our uh, test set and find out how accurate our model is using the confusion matrix the heat map and use heat map for visualizing this and uh, i will show you in the code what exactly is the confusion matrix and how it can be used for finding the accuracy in our example we got we get an accuracy of about 0.94 which is pretty good or 94 percent which is pretty good all right so what is a confusion matrix this is an example of a confusion matrix 
and uh, this is used for identifying the accuracy of a, a classification model or like a logistic regression model. So the most important part in a computation matrix is that first of all this as you can see this is a matrix and the size of the matrix depends on how many outputs uh, we are expecting. So the, the most important part here is that the model will be most accurate when we have the maximum numbers in its diagonal, like in this case. That's why it has almost 93, 94% because the diagonal should have the maximum numbers and the others other than diagonals, the cells other than the diagonals should have very few numbers. So here that's what is happening. So there is a two here, there are there's a one here, but most of them are along the diagonal. This what does this mean? This means that the number that has been fed is zero and the number that has been detected is also zero. So the predicted value and the actual value are the same. So along the diagonals, that is true, which means that let's let's take this diagonal, right? If, if the maximum number is here, that means that uh, like here in this case, it is 34, which means that 34 of the images that have been fed or rather actually there are two misclassifications in there. So 36 images have been fed, which have number four and out of which 34 have been predicted correctly as number four and one has been predicted as number eight and another one has been predicted as number nine so these are two misclassifications okay so that is the meaning of saying that the maximum number should be in the diagonal so if you have all of them so for an ideal model which has let's say 100 percent accuracy everything will be only in the diagonal there will be no numbers other than zero in all other cells so that is like a hundred percent accurate model okay so that's a gist of how to use this matrix uh, how to use this uh, confusion matrix i know the name uh, is is a little funny sounding confusion matrix but actually it is not very confusing it's very straightforward so you are just plotting what has been predicted and what is the labeled information or what is the actual data that's also known as the ground truth sometimes okay these are some fancy terms that are used so predicted label and the actual label that's all it is okay yeah so we are showing a little bit more information here so 38 have been predicted and here you will see that all of them have been predicted correctly there have been 38 zeros and the, the predicted value and the actual value is, is exactly the same whereas in this case right it has uh, there are i think 37 plus 5 yeah 42 have been fed the images 42 images are of digit 3 and uh, the accuracy is only 37 of them have been accurately predicted three of them have been predicted as number seven and two of them have been predicted as number eight and so on and so forth okay all right so with that let's go into jupyter notebook and see how the code looks so this is the code in in jupyter notebook for logistic regression in this particular demo what we are going to do is train our model to recognize digits which are the images which have digits from uh, let's say 0 to 5 or 0 to 9 and um, and then we will see how well it is trained and whether it is able to predict these numbers correctly or not so let's get started so the first part is as usual we are importing some libraries that are required and uh, then the last line in this block is to load the digits so let's go ahead and run this code then here we will visualize the shape of these uh, digits so we can see here if we take a look this is how the shape is 1797 by 64 these are like 8 by 8 images so that's that's what is reflected in this uh, shape now from here onwards we are basically once again importing some of the libraries that are required like numpy and matplot and we will take a look at uh, some of the sample images that we have uh, loaded so th this one for example creates a figure uh, and then we go ahead and take a few sample images to see how they look so let me run this code and uh, so that it becomes easy to understand so these are about five images sample images that we are looking at zero one two three four so this is how the images this is how the data is okay and uh, based on this we will actually train 
our logistic regression model and then we will test it and see how well it is able to recognize. So the way it works is the pixel information. So as you can see here, this is an 8 by 8 pixel kind of a, a image and uh, the each pixel whether it is activated or not activated that is the information available for each pixel now based on the pattern of this activation and non-activation of the various pixels this will be identified as a zero for example right similarly as you can see so overall each of these numbers actually has a different pattern of the pixel activation and that's pretty much that our model needs to learn uh, for which a number what is the pattern of the activation of the pixels right so that is what we are going to train our model okay so the first thing we need to do is to split our data into training and test data set right so whenever we perform any training we split the data into training and test so that the training data set is used to train the system so we pass this probably multiple times uh, and then we test it with the test data set and the split is usually in the form of the and there are various ways in which you can split this data it is up to the individual preferences in our case here we are splitting in the form of 23 and 77 so when we say test size as 20.23 uh, that means 23 percent of that entire data is used for testing and the remaining 77 percent is used for training so there is a readily available function which is uh, called train test split so we don't have to write any special code for the splitting it will automatically split the data based on the proportion that we give here which is test size so we just give the test size automatically training size will be determined and uh, we pass the data that we want to split and the the results will be stored in x underscore train and y underscore train for the training data set and what is x underscore train this are these are the features right which is like the independent variable and y underscore train is the label right so in this case what happens is we have the input value which is or the features value which is in x underscore train and since this is a labeled data for each of them each of the observations we already have the label information saying whether this digit is a zero or a one or a two so that that's this is what will be used for comparison to find out whether the the system is able to recognize it correctly or there is an error for each observation it will compare with this right so this is the label so the same way x underscore train y underscore train is for the training data set x underscore test y underscore test is for the test data set okay so let me go ahead and execute this code as well and then we can go and check quickly what is the how many entries are there and in each of this so x underscore train the shape is 1383 uh, by 64 and y underscore train has 1383 because there is uh, nothing like the second part is not uh, required here and then x underscore test shape we see is 414 so actually there are 414 observations in test and 1383 observations in train so that's basically what these four lines of code are, are saying okay then we import the uh, logistic regression uh, library and uh, which is a part of scikit-learn so uh, we we don't have to implement the logistic regression process itself we just call these uh, the function and uh, let me go ahead and execute that so that uh, we have the logistic regression library imported now we create an instance of logistic regression right so logistic regr is a, is an instance of logistic regression and then we use that for training our model so let me first execute this code so these two lines so the first line basically creates an instance of logistic regression model and then the second line is where we are passing our data the training data set Right. this is our the, the predictors and uh, this is our target we are passing this data set to train our model all right so once we do this in this case the data is not large but by and large uh, the training is what takes usually a lot of time so we spend in machine learning activities in machine learning projects we spend a lot of time for the training part of it 
okay so here the data set is relatively small so it was pretty quick so all right so now our model has been trained using the training data set and uh, we want to see how accurate this is so what we'll do is we will test it out in probably phases. So let me first try out how well this is uh, working for uh, one image. Okay, I will just uh, try it out with one image, my the first entry in my test uh, data set and see whether it is uh, correctly predicting or not. So uh, and in order to test it, so for training purpose, we use the fit method. There is a method called fit, which is for training the model. And once the training is done, if you want to test for uh, a particular value new input, you use the predict method. Okay, so let's run the predict method and we pass this particular image and uh, we see that the shape is uh, or the prediction is 4. So let's try a few more. Let me see for the next 10. Uh, seems to be fine so let me just go ahead and test the entire data set okay that's basically what we will do so now we want to find out how accurately this has uh, performed so we use the score method to find what is the percentage of, of accuracy and we see here that it has performed up to 94 percent accurate okay so that's uh, on this part now what we can also do is we can um, also see this accuracy using what is known as a confusion matrix so let us go ahead and uh, try that as well uh, so that we can also visualize how well uh, this model has uh, done so let me execute this piece of code which will basically import some of the libraries that are required and um, we we basically create a confusion matrix an instance of con confusion matrix by running confusion matrix and passing these uh, values so we have so this confusion underscore matrix method takes two parameters one is the y underscore test and the other is uh, the prediction so what is the y underscore test these are the labeled values which we already know for the test data set and predictions are what the system has predicted for the test data set okay so this is known to us and this is what the system has uh, the model has uh, generated so we kind of create the confusion matrix and we will print it and uh, this is how the confusion matrix uh, looks as the name suggests it is a matrix and um, the key point out here is that the accuracy of the model is determined by how many numbers are there in the diagonal the more the numbers in the diagonal the better the accuracy is okay and first of all the total sum of all the numbers in this whole matrix is equal to the number of observations in the test data set that is the first thing right so if you add up all these numbers that will be equal to the number of uh, observations in the test data set and then out of that the maximum number of them should be in the diagonal that means the accuracy is pretty good if the the numbers in the diagonal are less and in all other places there are a lot of numbers uh, which means the accuracy is very low the diagonal indicates a correct prediction that so this means that the actual value is same as the predicted value here again actual value is same as the predicted value and so on right so the moment you see a number here that means the actual value is something and the predicted value is something else right similarly here the actual value is something and the predicted value is something else so that is basically uh, how we read the confusion matrix now how do we find the accuracy you can actually add up the total values in the diagonal so it, it's like 38 plus 44 plus 43 and so on and divide that by the total number of test observations that will give you the percentage accuracy using a confusion matrix now let us visualize this confusion matrix in a slightly more sophisticated way uh, using a heat map so we will create a heat map with some we'll add some colors as well it's uh, it's like a more visually uh, visually more appealing so that's the whole idea so if we let me run this piece of code and this is how the heat map uh, looks uh, and uh, as you can see here the diagonals again uh, are, are all the values are here most of the values so which means reasonably this seems to be reasonably accurate and uh, yeah basically the accuracy score is 94 percent this is calculated as i mentioned by adding all these numbers divided by the total test values or the total number of observations in test data set 
Okay, so this is the confusion matrix for logistic regression. All right, so now that we have seen the confusion matrix, let's take a quick sample and see how well uh, the system has uh, classified. And we will take uh, a few examples of the data. So if we see here, we, we picked up randomly a few of them. So this is uh, number four, which is the actual value and also the predicted value. Both are four. This is an image of zero. So the predicted value is also zero. Actual value is, of course, zero. Then this is the image of nine. So this has also been predicted correctly, 9 and actual value is 9. And this is the image of 1. And again, this has been predicted correctly as like the actual value. Okay, so this was a quick demo of logistic regression, how to use logistic regression to identify images. What is a decision tree? Let's go through a very simple example before we dig in deep. Decision tree is a tree-shaped diagram used to determine a course of action. Each branch of the tree represents a possible decision, occurrence, or reaction. Let's start with a simple question. How do I identify a random vegetable from a shopping bag? So we have this group of vegetables in here, and we can start off by asking a simple question, is it red? And if it's not, then it's going to be the purple fruit to the left, probably an eggplant. If it's true, it's going to be one of the red fruits. Is the diameter greater than two? If false, it's going to be a what looks to be a red chili. And if it's true, it's going to be a bell pepper from the capsicum family. So it's a capsicum. Problems that decision tree can solve. So let's look at the two different categories the decision tree can be used on. It can be used on the classification, the true, false, yes, no, and it can be used on regression, where we figure out what the next value is in a series of numbers or a group of data. In classification, the classification tree will determine a set of logical if-then conditions to classify problems. For example, discriminating between three types of flowers based on certain features. In regression, a regression tree is used when the target variable is numerical or continuous in nature. We fit the regression model to the target variable using each of the independent variables. Each split is made based on the sum of squared error. Before we dig deeper into the mechanics of the decision tree, let's take a look at the advantages of using a decision tree, and we'll also take a glimpse at the disadvantages. The first thing you'll notice is that it's simple to understand, interpret, and visualize. It really shines here because you can see exactly what's going on in a decision tree. Little effort is required for data preparation, so you don't have to do special scaling. There's a lot of things you don't have to worry about when using a decision tree. It can handle both numerical and categorical data, as we discovered earlier, and nonlinear parameters don't affect its performance. So even if the data doesn't fit an easy curved graph, you can still use it to create an effective decision or prediction. If we're going to look at the advantages of a decision tree, we also need to understand the disadvantages of a decision tree. The first disadvantage is overfitting. Overfitting occurs when the algorithm captures noise in the data. That means you're solving for one specific instance instead of a general solution for all the data. High variance. The model can get unstable due to small variation in data. Low bias tree. A highly complicated decision tree tends to have a low bias, which makes it difficult for the model to work with new data. Decision tree, important terms. Before we dive in further, we need to look at some basic terms. We need to have some definitions to go with our decision tree and the different parts we're going to be using. We'll start with entropy. Entropy is a measure of randomness or unpredictability in the data set. For example, we have a group of animals. In this picture, there's four different kinds of animals. And this data set is considered to have a high entropy. You really can't pick out what kind of animal it is based on looking at just the four animals as a big clump of, of uh, entities. So as we start splitting it into subgroups, we come up with our second definition, which is information gain. Information gain. It is a measure of decrease in entropy after the data set is split. So in this case, based on the color yellow, we've split one group of animals on one side as true and those who aren't yellow as false. As we continue down the yellow side, we split based on the height, true or false equals 10. And on the other side, height is less than 10, true or false. And as you see, as we split it, the entropy continues to be less and less and less. And so our information gain is simply the entropy E1 from the top and how it's changed to E2 in the bottom. And we'll look at the uh, deeper math, although you really don't need to know 
a huge amount of math when you actually do the programming in Python because it'll do it for you. But we'll look on the actual math at how they compute entropy. Finally, we went over the different parts of our tree and they call the leaf node. Leaf node carries the classification or the decision. So it's the final end at the bottom. The decision node has two or more branches. This is where we're breaking the group up into different parts. And finally, you have the root node. The topmost decision node is known as the root node. How does a decision tree work? Wonder what kind of animals I'll get in the jungle today? Maybe you're the hunter with a gun, or if you're more into photography, you're a photographer with a camera. So let's look at this group of animals, and let's try to classify different types of animals based on their features using a decision tree. So the problem statement is to classify the different types of animals based on their features using a decision tree. The data set is looking quite messy, and the entropy is high in this case. So let's look at a training set, or a training data set, and we're looking at color, we're looking at height, and then we have our different animals. We have our elephants, our giraffes, our monkeys, and our tigers. And they're of different colors and shapes. Let's see what that looks like and how do we split the data. We have to frame the conditions that split the data in such a way that the information gain is the highest. Note, gain is the measure of decrease in entropy after splitting. So the formula for entropy is the sum, that's what this symbol looks like, that looks like kind of like a uh, E, funky E, of K, where I equals one to K. K would represent the number of animals, the different animals in there, where value or P value of I would be the percentage of that animal times the log base two of the same, the percentage of that animal. Let's try to calculate the entropy for the current data set and take a look at what that looks like. And don't be afraid of the math. You don't really have to memorize this math. Just be aware that it's there and this is what's going on in the background. And so we have three giraffes, two tigers, one monkey, two elephants, a total of eight animals gathered. And if we plug that into the formula, we get an entropy that equals three over eight. So we have three giraffes, a total of eight, times the log. Usually they use base two on the log. So log base two of three over eight, plus, in this case, let's say it's the elephants, two over eight, two elephants over a total of eight, times log base two, two over eight, plus one monkey over a total of eight, log base two, one over eight, and plus two over eight of the tigers, log base two over eight. And if we plug that into our computer or our calculator, I obviously can't do logs in my head, we get an entropy equal to 0.571. The program will actually calculate the entropy of the data set similarly after every split to calculate the gain. Now we're not gonna go through each set one at a time to see what those numbers are. We just want you to be aware that this is a formula or the mathematics behind it. Gain can be calculated by finding the difference of the subsequent entropy values after a split. Now we will try to choose a condition that gives us the highest gain. We will do that by splitting the data using each condition and checking that the gain we get out of them. The condition that gives us the highest gain will be used to make the first split. Can you guess what that first split will be just by looking at this image? As a human, it's probably pretty easy to split it. Let's see if you're right. If you guessed the color yellow, you're correct. Let's say the condition that gives us the maximum gain is yellow. So we will split the data based on the color yellow. If it's true, that group of animals goes to the left. If it's false, it goes to the right. The entropy after the splitting has de decreased considerably. However, we still need some splitting at both the branches to attain an entropy value equal to zero. So we decide to split both the nodes using height as a condition. Since every branch now contains single label type, we can say that entropy in this case has reached the least value. And here you see we have the giraffes, the tigers, the monkey, and the elephants all separated into their own groups. This tree can now predict all the classes of animals present in the data set with 100% accuracy. That was easy. Use case, loan repayment prediction. Let's get into my favorite part and open up some Python and see what the programming code and the scripting looks like. In here, we're gonna to wanna to do a prediction. And we start with this individual here who's requesting to find out how good his customers are gonna be, whether they're gonna repay their loan or not for his bank. And from that, we wanna generate a problem statement to predict if a customer will repay loan amount or not, and then we're gonna be using the decision tree algorithm in Python. Let's see what that looks like, and let's dive into the code. In our first few steps of implementation, we're gonna start by importing the necessary packages that we need from Python, and we're gonna load up our data and take a look at what the data looks like. So the first thing I need is I need something to edit my Python and run it in. So let's flip on over, and here I'm using the Anaconda Jupyter Notebook.
Now you can use any Python IDE you like to run it in, but I find the Jupyter Notebook's really nice for doing things on the fly. And let's go ahead and just paste that code in the beginning. And before we start, let's talk a little bit about what we're bringing in. And then we're going to do a couple things in here. We have to make a couple changes as we go through this first part of the import. The first thing we bring in is numpy as np. That's very standard when we're dealing with uh, mathematics, especially with uh, very complicated machine learning tools. You almost always see the numpy come in for your num your numbers. It's called number Python. It has your mathematics in there. In this case, we actually could take it out, but generally you'll need it for most of your different things you work with. And then we're going to use pandas as PD. That's also a standard. The pandas is a data frame setup, and you can liken this to uh, taking your basic data and storing it in a way that looks like an Excel spreadsheet. So as we come back to this, when you see NP or PD, those are very standard uses, you'll know that that's the pandas. And I'll show you a little bit more when we explore the data in just a minute. Then we're going to need to split the data. So I'm going to bring in our train, test, and split. And this is coming from the sklearn package cross-validation. In just a minute, we're going to change that. And we'll go over that too. And then there's also the sk.tree import decision tree classifier. That's the actual tool we're using. Remember I told you don't be afraid of the mathematics. It's going to be done for you. Well, the decision tree classifier has all that mathematics in there for you, so you don't have to figure it back out again. And then we have sklearn.metrics for accuracy score. We need to score our, our setup. That's the whole reason we're splitting it between the training and testing data. And finally, we still need the sklearn import tree. And that's just the basic tree function that's needed for the decision tree classifier. And finally, we're going to load our data down here. And I'm going to run this, and we're going to get two things on here. One, we're going to get an error, and two, we're going to get a warning. Let's see what that looks like. So the first thing we had is we have an error. Why is this error here? Well, it's looking at this and it says, I need to read a file. And when this was written, the person who wrote it, this is their path where they stored the file. So let's go ahead and fix that. And I'm going to put in here my file path. I'm just going to call it full file name. And you'll see it's on my C drive, and there's this very lengthy setup on here where I stored the data2.csv file. Don't worry too much about the full path, because on your computer it'll be different. The data.2csv file was generated by SimpliLearn. If you want a copy of that, you can comment down below and request it here in the YouTube. And then if I'm going to give it a name, full file name, I'm going to go ahead and change it here to full file name. So let's go ahead and run it now and see what happens. And we get a warning. When you're coding, understanding these different warnings and these different errors that come up is probably the hardest lesson to learn. So let's just go ahead and take a look at this and use this as a uh, opportunity to understand what's going on here. If you read the warning, it says the cross-validation is depreciated. So it's a warning on it's being removed. And it's going to be moved in favor of the model selection. So if we go up here, we have sklearn.crossvalidation. And if you research this and go to the sklearn site, you'll find out that you can actually just swap it right in there with model selection. And so when I come in here and I run it again, that removes a warning. What they've done is they've had two different developers develop it in two different branches. And then they decided to keep one of those and eventually get rid of the other one. That's all that is, and very easy and quick to fix. Before we go any further, I went ahead and opened up the data from this file. Remember the, the data file we just loaded on here, the data underscore 2.csv? Let's talk a little bit more about that and see what that looks like both as a text file because it's a comma separated variable file and in a spreadsheet. This is what it looks like as a basic text file. You can see at the top they've created a header and it's got one, two, three, four, five columns and each column has data in it. And let me flip this over because we're also going to look at this uh, in an actual spreadsheet so you can see what that looks like. And here I've opened it up in the open office calc which is pretty much the same as um, Excel and zoomed in and you can see we've got our columns and our rows of data. A little easier to read in here. We have a result, yes, yes, no. We have initial payment, last payment, credit score, house number. If we scroll way down, we'll see that this occupies 1,001 lines of code or lines of data, with uh, the first one being a column and then 1,000 lines of data. 
Now, as a programmer, if you're looking at a small amount of data, I usually start by pulling it up in different sources so I can see what I'm working with. But in larger data, you won't have that option. It'll just be um, too, too large. So you need to either bring in a small amount that you can look at it like we're doing right now, or we can start looking at it through the Python code. So let's go ahead and move on and take the next couple steps to explore the data using Python. Let's go ahead and see what it looks like in Python to print the length and the shape of the data. So let's start by printing the length of the database. We can use a simple lin function from Python. And when I run this, you'll see that it's a thousand long. And that's what we expected. There's a thousand lines of data in there if you subtract the uh, column head. And this is one of the nice things when we did the uh, balanced data from the panda read CSV, you'll see that the header is row zero, so it automatically removes the row and then shows the data separate. It does a good job sorting that data out for us. And then we can use a different function, and let's take a look at that. And uh, again, we're going to utilize the tools in Panda. And since the balance underscore data was loaded as a Panda data frame, we can do a shape on it. And let's go ahead and run the shape and see what that looks like. What's nice about this shape is not only does it give me the length of the data, we have a thousand lines, it also tells me there's five columns. So when we were looking at the data, we had five columns of data. And then let's take one more step to explore the data using Python. And now that we've taken a look at the length and the shape, let's go ahead and use the uh, pandas module for head, another beautiful thing in the data set that we can utilize. So let's put that on our sheet here, and we have print data set and balance data dot head. And this is a pandas print statement of its own. So it has its own print feature in there. And then we went ahead and gave a label for our print job here of data set, just a simple print statement. And when we run that, and let's just take a closer look at that. Let me zoom in here. There we go. Pandas does such a wonderful job of making this a very clean readable data set. So you can look at the data, you can look at the column headers, you can have it, uh, when you put it as the head, it prints the first five lines of the data. And we always start with zero. So we have five lines, we have zero, one, two, three, four, instead of one, two, three, four, five. That's a standard scripting and programming set, is you want to start with the zero position. And that is what the data head does. It pulls the first five rows of data, puts it in a nice format that you can look at and view. Very powerful tool to view the data. So instead of having to flip and open up an Excel spreadsheet or open Office Calc or trying to look at a Word doc where it's all scrunched together and hard to read, you can now get a nice open view of what you're working with. We're working with a shape of a thousand long, five wide, so we have five columns, and we do the full data head, you can actually see what this data looks like. The initial payment, last payment, credit scores, house number. So let's take this, now that we've explored the data, and let's start digging into the decision tree. So in our next step, we're going to train and build our data tree. And to do that, we need to first separate the data out. We're going to separate it into two groups so that we have something to actually train the data with and then we have some data on the side to test it to see how good our model is. Remember with any of the machine learning you always want to have some kind of test set to, to weigh it against so you know how good your model is when you distribute it. Let's go ahead and break this code down and look at it in pieces. So first we have our X and Y. Where do X and Y come from? Well X is going to be our data and Y is going to be the answer or the target. You can look at it source and target. In this case, we're using X and Y to denote the data in and the data that we're actually trying to guess what the answer is going to be. And so to separate it, we can simply put in X equals the balance of the data dot values. The first brackets means that we're going to select all the lines in the database. So it's all the data. And the second one says we're only going to look at columns one through five. Remember, we always start with zero. Zero is a yes or no, and that's whether the loan went default or not. So we want to start with one. If we go back up here, that's the initial payment, and it goes all the way through the house number. Well, if we want to look at uh, one through five, we can do the same thing for y, which is the answers, and we're going to set that just equal to the zero row. So it's just the zero row, and then it's all rows going in there. So now we've divided this into two different data sets, one of them with the data going in and one with the answers. 
Next, we need to split the data. And here you'll see that we have it split into four different parts. The first one is your X training, your X test, your Y train, your Y test. Simply put, we have X going in where we're going to train it, and we have to know the answer to train it with. And then we have X test where we're going to test that data. And we have to know in the end what the Y was supposed to be. And that's where this train test split comes in that we loaded earlier in the modules. This does it all for us. And you can see they set the test size equal to 0.3, so that's roughly 30% will be used in the test. And then we use a random state, so it's completely random which rows it takes out of there. And then finally, we get to actually build our decision tree. And they've called it here CLF underscore entropy. That's the actual decision tree, or decision tree classifier. And in here, they've added a couple variables, which we'll explore in just a minute. And then finally, we need to fit the data to that. So we take our CLF entropy that we created, and we fit the X train. And since we know the answers for X train or the Y train, we go ahead and put those in. And let's go ahead and run this. And what most of these sklearn modules do is when you set up the variable, in this case, when we set the CLF entropy equal decision tree classifier, it automatically prints out what's in that decision tree. There's a lot of variables you can play with in here. And it's quite beyond the scope of this tutorial to go through all of these and how they work. But we're working on entropy. That's one of the options. We've added that it's completely a random state of 100, so 100%. And we have a max depth of 3. Now the max depth, if you remember above when we were doing the different graphs of animals, means it's only going to go down three layers before it stops. And then we have minimal samples of leaves is five. So it's going to have at least five leaves at the end. So I'll have at least three splits. I'll have no more than three layers and at least five end leaves with the final result at the bottom. Now that we've created our decision tree classifier, not only created it, but trained it, Let's go ahead and apply it and see what that looks like. So let's go ahead and make a prediction and see what that looks like. We're going to paste our predict code in here. And before we run it, let's just take a quick look at what it's doing here. We have a variable y predict that we're going to do. And we're going to use our variable clf entropy that we created. And then you'll see dot predict. And it's very common in the sklearn modules that their different tools have the predict when you're actually running a prediction. In this case, we're going to put our X test data in here. Now, if you delivered this for use, an actual commercial use, and distributed it, this would be the new loans you're putting in here to guess whether the person's going to be uh, pay them back or not. In this case, though, we need to test out the data and just see how good our sample is, how good of our tree does at predicting the loan payments. And finally, since Anaconda Jupyter Notebook is, works as a command line for Python, we can simply put the Y predict E in to print it. I could just as easily have put the print and put brackets around Y predict E in to print it out. We'll go ahead and do that. It doesn't matter which way you do it. And you'll see right here that it runs a prediction. This is roughly 300 in here. Remember, it's 30% of 1,000, so you should have about 300 answers in here. And this tells you which each one of those lines of our uh, test went in there, and this is what our Y predict came out. So let's move on to the next step. Where we're going to take this data and try to figure out just how good a model we have. So here we go. Since sklearn does all the heavy lifting for you and all the math, we have a simple line of code to let us know what the accuracy is. And let's go ahead and go through that and see what that means and what that looks like. Let's go ahead and paste this in. And let me zoom in a little bit. There we go. So you have a nice full picture. And we'll see here we're just going to do a print accuracy is. And then we do the accuracy score. And this was something we imported um, earlier, if you remember at the very beginning. Let me just scroll up there real quick so you can see where that's coming from. That's coming from here down here from sklearn.metrics import accuracy score. And you could probably run a script, make your own script to do this very easily. How accurate is it? How many out of 300 do we get right? And so we put in our Y test. That's the one we ran the predict on. And then we put in our Y predict EN. That's the answers we got. And we're just going to multiply that by 100 because this is just going to give us an answer as a decimal. And we want to see it as a percentage. And let's run that and see what it looks like. And if you see here, we got an accuracy of 93.66667. 
So when we look at the number of loans and we look at how good our model fit, we can tell people it has about a 93.6 fitting to it. So just a quick recap on that. We now have accuracy set up on here. And so we have created a model that uses the decision tree algorithm to predict whether a customer will repay the loan or not. The accuracy of the model is about 94.6%. The bank can now use this model to decide whether it should approve the loan request from a particular customer or not. And so this information is really powerful. We may not be able to, as individuals, understand all these numbers because they have thousands of numbers that come in. But you can see that this is a smart decision for the bank to use a tool like this to help them to predict how good their uh, profit's going to be off of the loan balances and how many are going to default or not. So why random forest? It's always important to understand why we use this tool over the other ones. What are the benefits here? And so with the random forest, the first one is there's no overfitting. If you use of multiple trees, reduce the risk of overfitting. Training time is less. Overfitting means that we have fit the data so close to what we have as our sample that we pick up on all the weird parts. And instead of predicting the overall data, you're predicting the weird stuff, which you don't want. High accuracy runs efficiently on large database. For large data, it produces highly accurate predictions. In today's world of uh, big data, this is really important. And this is probably where it really shines. This is where Y Random Forest really comes in. It estimates missing data. Data in today's world is very messy. So when you have a random forest, it can maintain the accuracy when a large proportion of the data is missing. What that means is if you have data that comes in from uh, five or six different areas, and maybe they took one set of statistics in one area, and they took a slightly different set of statistics in the other, so they have some of the same shared data, but one is missing like the uh, number of children in the house if you're doing something over demographics, and the other one is missing the size of the house. It will look at both of those separately and build two different trees, and then it can do a very good job of guessing which one fits better even though it's missing that data. Let us dig deep into the theory of exactly how it works. And let's look at what is random forest. Random forest, or random decision forest, is a method that operates by constructing multiple decision trees. The decision of the majority of the trees is chosen by the random forest as the final decision. And let's, uh, we have some nice graphics here. We have a decision tree, and they actually use a real tree to denote the decision tree, which I love. And given a random, some kind of picture of a fruit, this decision tree decides that the output is it's an apple. And we have a decision tree two, where we have that picture of the fruit goes in, and this one decides that it's a lemon. And the decision three tree gets another image, and it decides it's an apple. And then this all comes together in what they call the random forest. And this random forest then looks at it and says, okay, I got two votes for apple, one vote for lemon. The majority is apples, so the final decision is apples. To understand how the random forest works, we first need to dig a little deeper and take a look at the random forest and the actual decision tree and how it builds that decision tree. In looking closer at how the individual decision trees work, we'll go ahead and continue to use the fruit example, since we're talking about trees and forests. A decision tree is a tree-shaped diagram used to determine a course of action. Each branch of the tree represents a possible decision, occurrence, or reaction. So in here we have a bowl of fruit, and if you look at that, it looks like um, they switch from lemons to oranges. So we have oranges, cherries, and apples. And the first decision of the decision tree might be is a diameter greater than or equal to three. And if it says false, it knows that they're cherries because everything else is bigger than that. So all the cherries fall into that decision. So we have all that data we're training. We can look at that. We know that that's what's going to come up. Is the color orange? Well, it goes, hmm, orange or red? Well, if it's true, then it comes out as the orange. And if it's false, that leaves apples. So in this example, it sorts out the fruit in the bowl or the images of the fruit. A decision tree, these are very important terms to know because these are very central to understanding the decision tree when working with them. The first is entropy. Everything on the decision tree and how it makes a decision is based on entropy. Entropy is a measure of randomness or unpredictability in the data set. Uh, then they also have information gain, the leaf node, the decision node, and the root node. We'll cover these other four terms as we go down the tree. But let's start with entropy. So starting with entropy, we have here um, a high amount of randomness. 
What that means is that whatever is coming out of this decision, if it was going to guess based on this data, it wouldn't be able to tell you whether it's a lemon or an apple. It would just say it's a fruit. Uh, so the first thing we want to do is we want to split this apart. And we take the initial data set. We're going to set, create a data set one and a data set two. We just split it in two. And if you look at these new data sets after splitting them, the entropy of each of those sets is much less. So for the first one, whatever comes in there, it's going to sort that data and it's going to say, okay, if this data goes this direction, it's probably an apple. And if it goes into the other direction, it's probably a lemon. So that brings us up to information gain. It is the measure of decrease in the entropy after the data set is split. What that means in here is that we've gone from one set, which has a very high entropy, to two lower sets of entropy. And we've added in the values of E1 for the first one and E2 for the second two, which are much lower. And so that information gain is increased greatly in this example. And so you can find that the information gain simply equals uh, decision E1 minus E2. As we're going down our list of uh, definitions, we'll look at the leaf node. And the leaf node carries the classification or the decision. So we look down here to the leaf node. We finally get to our set one or our set two. When it comes down there and it says, okay, this object's gone into set one, if it's gone into set one, it's going to be split by some means and we'll either end up with apples on the leaf node or a lemon on the leaf node and on the right it'll either be an apple or lemons. Those leaf nodes or those final decisions or classifications, uh, that's the definition of leaf node in here. If we're going to have a final leaf where we make the decision, we should have a name for the nodes above it and they call those decision nodes. A decision node, decision node has two or more branches. And you can see here where we have the uh, five apples and one lemon, and in the other case, the five lemons and one apple, they have to make a choice of which tree it goes down based on some kind of measurement or information given to the tree. And that brings us to our last definition. The root node, the topmost decision node, is known as the root node. And this is where you have all of your data and you have your first decision it has to make or the first split in information. So far, we've looked at a very general image um, with the fruit being split. Let's look and see exactly what that means to split the data and how do we make those decisions on there. Uh, let's go in there and find out how does a decision tree work. So let's try to understand this and let's use a simple example. And we'll stay with the fruit. We have a bowl of fruit. And so let's create a problem statement. And the problem is we want to classify the different types of fruits in the bowl based on different features. The data set in the bowl is looking quite messy and the entropy is high in this case. So if this bowl was our decision maker, it wouldn't know what choice to make. It has so many choices. Which one do you pick? Apple, grapes, or lemons? And so we look in here, we're going to start with a, dra a training set. So this is our data that we're training our data with. And we have a number of options here. We have the color, and under the color we have red, yellow, purple, uh, we have a diameter, uh, 331, 331, and we have a label, apple, lemon, grapes, apple, lemon, grapes. And how do we split the data? We have to frame the conditions to split the data in such a way that the information gain is the highest. And it's very key to note that we're looking for the best gain. We don't want to just start sorting out the smallest piece in there. We want to split it the biggest way we can. And so we measure this decrease in entropy, that's what they call it, entropy, there's our entropy, after splitting. And now we'll try to choose a condition that gives us the highest gain. We will do that by splitting the data using each condition and checking the gain that we get out of them. The conditions that give us the highest gain will be used to make the first split. So let's take a look at these different conditions. We have color, we have diameter, and if we look underneath that, we have a couple different values. We have diameter equals three, color equals yellow, red, diameter equals one. And when we look at that, You'll see over here we have one, two, three, four threes. That's a pretty hard selection. So let's say the condition gives us a maximum gain of three. So we have the most pieces fall into that range. So our first split from our decision node is we split the data based on the diameter. Is it greater than or equal to three? If it's not, that's false, it goes into the grape bowl. And if it's true, it goes into a bowl full of lemon and apples. 
the entropy after splitting has decreased considerably. So now we can make two decisions. If you look at they're very uh, much less chaos going on there. This node has already attained an entropy value of zero, as you can see. There's only one kind of label left for this branch. So no further splitting is required for this node. However, this node on the right is still requires a split to decrease the entropy further. So we split the right node further based on color. If you look at this, if I split it on color, that pretty much cuts it right down the middle. That's the only thing we have left in our choices of color and diameter too. And if the color is yellow, it's going to go to the right bowl. And if it's false, it's going to go to the left bowl. So the entropy in this case is now zero. So now we have three bowls with zero entropy. There's only one type of data in each one of those bowls. So we can predict a lemon with 100% accuracy. And we can predict the apple also with 100% accuracy along with our grapes up there. In this example, last week my son and I visited a fruit shop. Dad, is that an apple or a strawberry? So the question comes up, what fruit did I just pick up from the fruit stand? After a couple of seconds, you can figure out that it was a strawberry. So let's take this model a step further and let's, uh, why not build a model which can predict an unknown data? And in this, we're going to be looking at some sweet strawberries or crispy apples. We wanted to be able to label those two and decide what the fruit is. And we do that by having data already put in. So we already have a bunch of strawberries. We know our strawberries and they're already labeled as such. We already have a bunch of apples. We know our apples and are labeled as such. Then once we train our model, that model then can be given the new data. And the new data is this image. In this case, you can see a question mark on it. And it comes through and goes, it's a strawberry. In this case, we're using the support vector machine model. SVM is a supervised learning method that looks at data and sorts it into one of two categories. And in this case, we're sorting the strawberry into the strawberry side. At this point, you should be asking the question, how does the prediction work? Before we dig into an example with numbers, let's apply this to our fruit scenario. We have our support vector machine. We've taken it and we've taken labeled sample of data, strawberries and apples, and we draw on a line down the middle between the two groups. This split now allows us to take new data, in this case an apple and a strawberry, and place them in the appropriate group based on which side of the line they fall in. And that way we can predict the unknown. As colorful and tasty as the fruit example is, let's take a look at another example with some numbers involved. And we can take a closer look at how the math works. In this example, we're going to be classifying men and women. And we're going to start with a set of people with a different height and a different weight. And to make this work, we'll have to have a sample data set of female where you have their height and weight, 174, 65, 174, 88, and so on. And we'll need a sample data set of the male. They have a height, 179, 90, 180 to 80, and so on. Let's go ahead and put this on a graph so we have a nice visual. So you can see here we have two groups based on the height versus the weight. And on the left side, we're going to have the women. On the right side, we're going to have the men. Now, if we're going to create a classifier, let's add a new data point and figure out if it's male or female. So before we can do that, we need to split our data first. We can split our data by choosing any of these lines. In this case, we draw in two lines through the data in the middle that separates the men from the women. But to predict the gender of a new data point, we should split the data in the best possible way. And we say the best possible way because this line has a maximum space that separates the two classes. Here you can see there's a clear split between the two different classes. And in this one, there's not so much a clear split. This doesn't have the maximum space that separates the two. That is why this line best splits the data. We don't want to just do this by eyeballing it. And before we go further, we need to add some technical terms to this. We can also say that the distance between the points in the line should be as far as possible. In technical terms, we can say the distance between the support vector and the hyperplane should be as far as possible. And this is where the support vectors are the extreme points in the data set. And if you look at this data set, they have circled two points, which seem to be right on the outskirts of the women and one on the outskirts of the men. And hyperplane has a maximum distance to the support vectors of any class. Now you'll see the line down the middle, and we call this the hyperplane because when you're dealing with multiple dimensions, it's really not just a line, but a plane of intersections. And you can see here where the support vector have been drawn in dashed lines. 
The math behind this is very simple. We take d plus, the shortest distance to the closest positive point, which would be on the men's side, and d minus is the shortest distance to the closest negative point, which is on the women's side. The sum of d plus and d minus is called the distance margin, or the distance between the two support vectors that are shown in the dashed lines. And then, by finding the largest distance margin, we can get the optimal hyperplane. Once we've created an optimal hyperplane, we can easily see which side the new data fits in. And based on the hyperplane, we can say the new data point belongs to the male gender. Hopefully that's clear how that works on a visual level. As a data scientist, you should also be asking what happens if the hyperplane is not optimal. If we select a hyperplane having low margin, then there is a high chance of misclassification. This particular SVM model, the one we discussed so far, is also called or referred to as the LSVM. So far, so clear, but a question should be coming up. We have our sample data set, but instead of looking like this, what if it looked like this, where we have two sets of data, but one of them occurs in the middle of another set? You can see here where we have the blue and the yellow, and then blue again on the other side of our data line. In this data set, we can't use a hyperplane. So when you see data like this, it's necessary to move away from a 1D view of the data to a two-dimensional view of the data. And for the transformation, we use what's called a kernel function. The kernel function will take the 1D input and transfer it to a two-dimensional output. As you can see in this picture here, the 1D, when transferred to a two-dimensional, makes it very easy to draw a line between the two data sets. What if we make it even more complicated? How do we perform an SVM for this type of data set? Here you can see we have a two-dimensional data set where the data is in the middle surrounded by the green data on the outside. In this case, we're going to segregate the two classes. We have our sample data set, and if you draw a line through, it's obviously not an optimal hyperplane in there. So to do that, we need to transfer the 2D to a 3D array. And when you translate it into a three-dimensional array using the kernel, you can see where you can place a hyperplane right through it and easily split the data. Before we start looking at a programming example and dive into the script, let's look at the advantage of the support vector machine. We'll start with high-dimensional input space, or sometimes referred to as the curse of dimensionality. We looked at earlier one dimension, two dimension, three dimension. When you get to a thousand dimensions, a lot of problems start occurring with most algorithms that have to be adjusted for. The SVM automatically does that in high dimensional space. One of the high dimensional space, one high dimensional space that we work on is sparse document vectors. This is where we tokenize the words in documents so we can run our machine learning algorithms over them. I've seen ones get as high as 2.4 million different tokens. That's a lot of vectors to look at. And finally, we have regularization parameter. The regularization parameter, or lambda, is a parameter that helps figure out whether we're going to have a bias or overfitting of the data, whether it's going to be overfitted to a very specific instance or it's going to be biased to a high or low value. With the SVM, it naturally avoids the overfitting and bias problems that we see in many other algorithms. These three advantages of the support vector machine make it a very powerful tool to add to your repertoire of machine learning tools. Now, we did promise you a use case study. We're actually going to dive into some Python programming. And so we're going to go into a problem statement and start off with the zoo. So in the zoo example, we have um, family members going to the zoo. and We have the young child going, Dad, is that a group of crocodiles or alligators? Well, that's hard to differentiate. And zoos are a great place to start looking at science and understanding how things work, Especially as a young child. And so we can see the parents sitting here thinking, well, what is the difference between a crocodile and an alligator? Well, one, crocodiles are larger in size. Alligators are smaller in size. Snout width, the crocodiles have a narrow snout, and alligators have a wider snout. And of course, in the modern day and age, the father sitting here is thinking, how can I turn this into a lesson for my son? And he goes, let a support vector machine segregate the two groups. I don't know if my dad ever told me that, but that would be funny. Now, in this example, we're not going to use actual measurements and data. We're just using that for imagery. And that's very common in a lot of machine learning algorithms and setting them up. But let's roll up our sleeves and we'll talk about that more in just a moment as we break into our Python script. So here we arrive in our actual coding. And I'm going to move this into a Python editor in just a moment. But let's talk a little bit about what we're going to cover. First, we're going to cover in the code the setup, how to actually create our SVM. 
And you're going to find that there's only two lines of code that actually create it, and the rest of it is done so quick and fast that it's all here in the first page. And we'll show you what that looks like as far as our data, because we're going to create some data. I talked about creating data just a minute ago. And so we'll get into the creating data here, and you'll see this nice correction of our two blobs, and we'll go through that in just a second. And then the second part is we're going to take this and we're going to bump it up a notch. We're going to show you what it looks like behind the scenes. But let's start with actually creating our setup. I like to use the Anaconda Jupyter Notebook because it's very easy to use but you can use any of your favorite Python editors or setups and go in there. But let's go ahead and switch over there and see what that looks like. So here we are in the Anaconda Python Notebook or Anaconda Jupyter Notebook with Python. We're using Python 3. I believe this is 3.5 but it should be work in any of your 3x versions and uh, you'd have to look at the SK Learn and make sure if you're using a 2x version or an earlier version. Now let's go ahead and put our code in there and one of the things I like about the Jupyter Notebook is I can go up to view and I'm going to go ahead and toggle the line numbers on to make it a little bit easier to talk about. And we can even increase the size because this is edited in, in this case, I'm using Google Chrome Explorer, and that's how it opens up for the editor. Although anyone, any, like I said, any editor will work. Now, the first step is going to be our imports. And we're going to import four different parts. The first two I want you to look at are line one and line two are numpy as np and matplotlibrary.pyplot as plt. Now, these are very standardized imports when you're doing work. The first one is the numbers Python. We need that because part of the platform we're using uses that for the NumPy array. And I'll talk about that in a minute so you can understand why we want to use a NumPy array versus the standard Python array. And normally, it's pretty standard setup to use NP for NumPy. The matplot library is how we're going to view our data. So this has, uh, you do need the NP for the SK Learn module, but the matplot library is purely for our use for visualization. And so you really don't need that for the SVM, but we're going to put it there so you have a nice visual aid and we can show you what it looks like. That's really important at the end when you finish everything, so you have a nice display for everybody to look at. And then finally, we're going to, I'm going to jump one ahead to line number four. That's the sklearn.datasets.samples generator import make blobs. And I told you that we were going to make up data. And this is a tool that's in the SK Learn to make up data. I personally don't want to go to the zoo, get in trouble for jumping over the fence, and probably get eaten by the crocodiles or alligators as I work on measuring their snouts and width and length. Instead, we're just going to make up some data. And that's what that make blobs is. It's a wonderful tool if you're ready to test your, your uh, setup and you're not sure about what data you're going to put in there. You can create this blob and it makes it real easy to use. And finally, we have our actual SVM, the SK Learn Import SVM on line 3. So that covers all our imports. We're going to create, remember I used the make blobs to create data. And we're going to create a capital X and a lowercase y equals make blobs in samples equals 40. So we're going to make 40 lines of data. It's going to have two centers with a random state equals 20. So each, each, each group is going to have 20 different pieces of data in it. And the way that looks is that we'll have under X um, an XY plane. So I'll have two numbers under X and Y will be 0 or 1. That's the two different centers. So we have uh, yes or no, in this case, alligator or crocodile. That's what that represents. And then I told you that the actual SK Learner, the SVM, is in two lines of code. And we see it right here with CLF equals SVM dot SVC kernel equals linear. And I set SQL to 1. Although in this example, since we are not uh, regularizing the data, because we want it to be very clear and easy to see, I went ahead, you can set it to 1,000 a lot of times when you're not doing that. But for this thing, linear, because it's a very simple linear example, we only have the two dimensions, and it'll be a nice linear hyperplane. It'll be a nice linear line instead of a full plane. So we're not dealing with a huge amount of data. And then all we have to do is do clf.fit x comma y. And that's it. CLF has been created. And then we're going to go ahead and display it. And I'm going to talk about this display here in just a second. But let me go ahead and run this code. And this is what we've done is we've created two blobs. You'll see the blue on the side and then kind of an orangish uh, on the other side. That's our two sets of data. They represent, one represents crocodiles and one represents alligators. And then we have our measurements. In this case we have like the uh, width and length of the snout. And I did say I was going to come up here and talk just a little bit about our plot. And you'll see PLT. That's what we imported. We're going to do a scatter plot. That means we're just putting dots on there. And then look at this notation. I have the capital X and then in brackets, I have a colon, comma, zero. That's from NumPy. If you did that in a regular array, you'll get an error in a Python array. 
you have to have that in a numpy array. It turns out that our make blobs returns a numpy array. And this notation is great because what it means is the first part is the colon. It means we're going to do all the rows. That's all the data in our blob we created under capital X. And then the second part has a comma zero. We're only going to take the first value. And then if you notice, we do the same thing, but we're going to take the second value. Remember, we always start with zero and then one. So we have column zero and column one. And you can look at this as our x, y plots. The first one is the x plot, and the second one is the y plot. So the first one is on the bottom, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. And then the second one, x of the 1, is the 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 going up the left-hand side. s equals 30 is just the size of the dots. So we can see them instead of real tiny dots. And then cmap equals plt.cm.paired. And you'll also see the c equals y. That's the color. We're using two colors, 0, 1, and that's why we get the nice blue and uh, the two different colors for the alligator and the crocodile. Now you can see here that we did this, the actual uh, fit was done in two lines of code. A lot of times there'll be a third line where we regularize the data. We set it between like minus 1 and 1, and we reshape it. But for this, it's not necessary, and it's also kind of nice because you can actually see what's going on. And then if we wanted to, we wanted to actually run a prediction. Let's take a look and see what that looks like. And to predict some new data, and we'll show this again as we get towards the end of digging in deep, you can simply assign your new data. In this case, I am giving it a uh, width and length 3, 4, and a width and length 5, 6. And note that I put the data as a set of brackets, and then I have the brackets inside. And the reason I do that is because when we're looking at data, it's designed to process a large amount of data coming in. We don't want to just process one line at a time. And so in this case, I'm processing two lines. And then I'm just going to print, and you'll see clf.predict new data. So the clf and the dot .predict part is going to give us an answer. And let's see what that looks like. And you'll see 0, 1. So predicted the first one, the 3, 4, is going to be on the one side, and the 5, 6 is going to be on the other side. So one came out as an alligator, and one came out as a crocodile. Now that's a pretty short explanation for the setup. But really, we want to dig in and see what's going on behind the scenes. And let's see what that looks like. So... The next step is to dig in deep and find out what's going on behind the scenes. And also put that in a nice pretty graph. We're going to spend more work on this than we did actually generating the original model. And you'll see here that we go through a few steps. And I'm, I'll move this over to our editor in just a second. We come in, we create our original data. It's exactly identical to the first part. And I'll explain why we redid that and show you how not to redo that. And then we're going to go in there and add in those lines. We're going to see what those lines look like and how to set those up. And finally, we're going to plot all that on here and show it. And you'll get a nice graph with the what we saw earlier when we were going through the theory behind this, where it shows the support vectors and the hyperplane. And those are done where you can see the support vectors as the dashed lines and the solid line, which is the hyperplane. Let's get that into our uh, Jupyter Notebook. Before I scroll down to a new line, I want you to notice line 13 it has plot show. And we're going to talk about that here in just a second. But let's scroll down to a new line down here. And I'm going to paste that code in. And you'll see that the plot show has moved down below. Let's scroll up a little bit. And if you look at the top here of our new section, 1, 2, 3, and 4 is the same code we had before. And let's go back up here and take a look at that. We're going to fit the values on our SVM. And then we're going to plot scatter it. And then we're going to do a plot show. So you should be asking, why are we redoing the same code? Well, when you do the plot show, that blanks out what's in the plot. So once I've done this plot show, I have to reload that data. Now we could do this simply by removing it up here, rerunning it, and then coming down here. And then we wouldn't have to rerun these first four lines of code. Now in this, it doesn't matter too much. And you'll see the plot show is down here and then removed right there on line 5. I'll go ahead and just delete that out of there because we don't want to blank out our screen. We want to move on to the next setup. So we can go ahead and just skip the first four lines because we did that before. And let's take a look at the AX equals PLT.GCA. Now right now, we're actually spending a lot of time just graphing. That's all we're doing here. Okay, so this is how we display a nice graph with our results and our data. 
AX is very standard note used variable when you're talking about PLT, and it's just setting it to that axis, the last axis in the PLT. It can get very confusing if you're working with many different layers of data on the same graph, and this makes it very easy to reference the AX. So this reference is looking at the PLT that we created and we already mapped out our two blobs on. And then we want to know the limits. So we want to know how big the graph is. We can find out the x limit and the y limit simply with the get x limit and get y limit commands, which is part of our matplot library. And then we're going to create a grid. And you'll see down here we have, we've set the variable xx equal to np.linespace x limit 0, x limit 1, comma 30. And we've done the same thing for the y space. And then we're going to go in here and we create a mesh grid. And this is a numpy command. So we're back to our numbers Python. Let's go through what these numpy commands mean with the line space and the mesh grid. We've taken xx, small s, xx equals np line space, and we have our x limit 0 and our x limit 1, and we're going to create 30 points on it. And we're going to do the same thing for the y-axis. Now, this has nothing to do with our evaluation. It's uh, All we're doing is we're creating a grid of data. And so we're creating a set of points between 0 and the x limit. We're creating 30 points, and the same thing with the y. And then the mesh grid loops those all together, so it forms a nice grid. So if we were going to do this, say, between the limit 0 and 10 and do 10 points, we would have a 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4 to 10, and so on. You can just imagine a point at each corner, one of those boxes. And the mesh grid combines them all, so we take the yy and the xx we created and creates the full grid. And we've set that grid into the yy coordinates and the xx coordinates. Now remember, we're working with Numby and Python. We like to separate those. We like to have, instead of it being x comma 1, you know, x comma y, and then uh, x2 comma y2, and in the next set of data, it would be a, a column of x's and a column of y's. And that's what we have here, is we have a column of y's, and we put it as a capital YY, and a column of x's, capital XX, with all those different points being listed. And finally, we get down to the numpy v stack. Just as we created those in the mesh grid, we're now going to put them all into one array, x, y array. Now that we've created the stack of data points, we're going to do something interesting here. We're going to create a value z, and the z equals the CLF. That's our, uh, that's our support vector machine we created, and we've already trained. And we have a dot decision function, and we're going to put the x, y in there. So here we have all this data. We're going to put that x, y in there, that data, and we're going to reshape it. And you'll see that we have the xx dot shape in here. This literally takes the xx, resets it up, connected to the y, and the z value lets us know whether it is the left-hand side. It's going to generate three different values, the z value does. And it'll tell us whether that data is a support vector to the left, the hyperplane in the middle, or the support vector to the right. So it generates three different values for each of those points. And those points have been reshaped so that they're right on a line, on those three different lines. So we've set all of our data up. We've labeled it to three different areas, and we've reshaped it. And we've just taken 30 points in each direction. If you do the math, you have 30 times 30, so that's 900 points of data. And we separated it between the three lines and reshaped it to fit those three lines. We can then go back to our matplot library, where we've created the AX, and we're going to create a contour. And you'll see here we have contour, capital XX, capital YY. These have been reshaped to fit those lines. Z is the labels. So now we have the three different points with the labels in there, and we can set the colors equals K. And I told you we had three different labels, but we have uh, three levels of data. The alpha is just makes it kind of see-through, so it's only uh, 0.5 of the value in there. So when we graph it, the data will show up from behind it, wherever the lines go. And finally, the line styles. This is where we set the two support vectors to be dash dash lines, and then a single one is just a straight line. That's what all of that setup does. And then finally, we take our ax.scatter. We're going to go ahead and plot the support vectors, but we've programmed it in there so that they look nice, like the dash dash line and the dash line on that grid. And you can see here, when we do the CLF dot support vectors, we are looking at column 0 and column 1. And then again, we have the S equals 100, so we're going to make them larger. And the line width equals 1, face colors equals none. Let's take a look and see what that looks like when we show it. And you can see when we get down to our end result, it creates a really nice graph 
we have our two support vectors in dashed lines, and they have the near data. So you can see those two points, or in this case, the four points where those lines nicely cleave the data. And then you have your hyperplane down the middle, which is as far from the two different points as possible, creating the maximum distance. So you can see that we have our nice output for the size of the body and the width of the snout. And we've easily separated the two groups of crocodile and alligator. Congratulations. You've done it. We've made it. Of course, these are pretend data for our crocodiles and alligators, but this hands-on example will help you to encounter any support vector machine projects in the future, and you can see how easy they are to set up and look at in depth. We're going to cover the K nearest neighbors, a lot referred to as KNN, and KNN is really a fundamental place to start in the machine learning. It's a basis of a lot of other things, and just the logic behind it is easy to understand and incorporated in other forms of machine learning. So today, what's in it for you? Why do we need KNN? What is KNN? How do we choose the factor K? When do we use KNN? How does KNN algorithm work? And then we'll dive in to my favorite part, the use case. Predict whether a person will have diabetes or not. That is a very common and popular used data set as far as testing out models and learning how to use the different models in machine learning. By now, we all know machine learning models make predictions by learning from the past data available. So we have our input values, our machine learning model builds on those inputs of what we already know, and then we use that to create a predicted output. Is that a dog? Little kid looking over there and watching the black cat cross their path. No dear, you can differentiate between a cat and a dog based on their characteristics. Cats. Cats have sharp claws, uses to climb, smaller length of ears, meows and purrs, doesn't love to play around. Dogs have dull claws, bigger length of ears, barks, loves to run around. You usually don't see a cat running around people, although I do have a cat that does that, where dogs do. And we can look at these, we can say, uh, we can evaluate the sharpness of the claws, how sharp are their claws, and we can evaluate the length of the ears, and we can usually sort out cats from dogs based on even those two characteristics. Now tell me if it is a cat or a dog. An odd question, usually little kids know cats and dogs by now. <laughs> Unless they live in a place where there's not many cats or dogs. So if we look at the sharpness of the claws, the length of the ears, and we can see that the cat has smaller ears and sharper claws than the other animals. Its features are more like cats. It must be a cat. Sharp claws, length of ears, and it goes in the cat group. Because KNN is based on feature similarity, we can do classification using KNN classifier. So we have our input value, the picture of the black cat. It goes into our trained model, and it predicts that this is a cat coming out. So what is KNN? What is the KNN algorithm? K nearest neighbors is what that stands for. It's one of the simplest supervised machine learning algorithms mostly used for classification. So we want to know, is this a dog or is not a dog? Is it a cat or not a cat? It classifies a data point based on how its neighbors are classified. KNN stores all available cases and classifies new cases based on a similarity measure. And here we've gone from cats and dogs right into wine, another favorite of mine. KNN stores all available cases and classifies new cases based on a similarity measure. And here you see we have a measurement of sulfur dioxide versus the chloride level, and then the different wines they've tested and where they fall on that graph based on how much sulfur dioxide and how much chloride. K and KNN is a perimeter that refers to the number of nearest neighbors to include in the majority of the voting process. And so if we had a new glass of wine there, red or white, we we want to know what the neighbors are. In this case, we're going to put uh, k equals 5. We'll talk about k in just a minute. A data point is classified by the majority of votes from its five nearest neighbors. Here, the unknown point would be classified as red since four out of five neighbors are red. So how do we choose k? How do we know k equals 5? I mean, that was the value we put in there, so we're going to talk about it. How do we choose the factor k? K and n algorithm is based on feature similarity. Choosing the right value of k is a process called parameter tuning 
and is important for better accuracy. So at k equals 3, we can classify, we have a question mark in the middle as either a, as a square or not. Is it a square or is it, in this case, a triangle? And so if we set k equals to 3, we're going to look at the three nearest neighbors. We're going to say this is a square. And if we put k equals to 7, we classify as a triangle, depending on what the other data is around it. And you can see as the k changes, depending on where that point is, that drastically changes your answer. And uh, we jump here where we go, how do we choose the factor of k? You'll find this in all machine learning. Choosing these factors, that's the face you get. It's like, oh my gosh, did I choose the right k? Did I set it right, my values in whatever machine learning tool you're looking at, so that you don't have a huge bias in one direction or the other? And in terms of knn, the number of k, if you choose it too low, the bias is based on, it's just too noisy. It's, it's right next to a couple things, and it's going to pick those things, and you might get a skewed answer. And if your k is too big, then it's going to take forever to process. So you're going to run into processing issues and resource issues. So what we do, the most common use, and there's other options for choosing k, is to use the square root of n. So n is a total number of values you have, and you take the square root of it. In most cases, you also, if it's an even number, so if you're using, uh, like in this case, squares and triangles, if it's even, you want to make your k value odd. That helps it select better. So in other words, you're not going to have a balance between two different factors that are equal. So usually you take the square root of n, and if it's even, you add one to it or subtract one from it, and that's where you get the k value from. That is the most common use, and it's pretty solid. It works very well. When do we use KNN? We can use KNN when data is labeled. So you need a label on it. We know we have a group of pictures with dogs, dogs, cats, cats. Data is noise free. And so you can see here, when we have a class and we have like underweight, 140, 23, Hello Kitty, normal, that's pretty confusing. We have a, a high variety of data coming in, so it's very noisy. And that would cause an issue. Data set is small, so we're usually working with smaller data sets where I mean, you might get into a gig of data if it's really clean, doesn't have a lot of noise. Because KNN is a lazy learner, i.e. it doesn't learn a discriminative function from the training set. So it's very lazy, so if you have very complicated data and you have a large amount of it, you're not going to use the KNN. But it's really great to get a place to start. Even with large data, you can sort out a small sample and get an idea of what that looks like using the KNN. And also just using for smaller data sets, KNN works really good. How does the KNN algorithm work? Consider a data set having two variables, height in centimeters and weight in kilograms. And each point is classified as normal or underweight. So we can see right here we have two variables, you know, true-false. They're either normal or they're not. They're underweight. On the basis of the given data, we have to classify the below set as normal or underweight using KNN. So if we have new data coming in that says 57 kilograms and 177 centimeters, is that going to be normal or underweight? To find the nearest neighbors, we'll calculate the Euclidean distance. According to the Euclidean distance formula, the distance between two points in the plane with the coordinates x, y, and a, b is given by distance d equals the square root of x minus a squared plus y minus b squared. And you can remember that from the two edges of a triangle. We're computing the third edge since we know the x side and the y side. Let's calculate it to understand clearly. So we have our unknown point, and we placed it there in red. And we have our other points where the data is scattered around. The distance d1 is the square root of 170 minus 167 squared plus 57 minus 51 squared, which is about 6.7. And distance 2 is about 13. And distance 3 is about 13.4. Similarly, we will calculate the Euclidean distance of unknown data point from all the points in the data set. And because we're dealing with small amount of data, that's not that hard to do. And it's actually pretty quick for a computer. And it's not a really complicated math. So you can just see how close is the data based on the Euclidean distance. Hence, we have calculated the Euclidean distance of unknown data point from all the points as shown, where x1 and y1 equal 57 and 170, whose class we have to classify. So now we're looking at that, we're saying, well, here's the Euclidean distance. Who's going to be their closest neighbors? Now let's calculate the nearest neighbor at k equals 3. And we can see the three closest neighbors puts them at normal. And that's pretty self-evident. When you look at this graph, it's pretty easy to say, okay, what? You know, we're just voting. Normal, 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 three votes for normal. This is going to be a normal weight. So majority of neighbors are pointing towards normal. Hence, as per KNN algorithm, the class of 57170 should be normal.
So a recap of KNN. Positive integer K is specified along with a new sample. We select the K entries in our database which are closest to the new sample. We find the most common classification of these entries. This is the classification we give to the new sample. So as you can see, it's pretty straightforward. We're just looking for the closest things that match what we got. So let's take a look and see what that looks like in a use case in Python. So let's dive into the predict diabetes use case. So use case, predict diabetes. The objective, predict whether a person will be diagnosed with diabetes or not. We have a data set of 768 people who were or were not diagnosed with diabetes. And let's go ahead and open that file and just take a look at that data. And this is in a simple spreadsheet format. The data itself is comma separated, very common set of data, and it's also a very common way to get the data. And you can see here we have columns A through I. That's what one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, eight columns with a particular attribute, and then the ninth column, which is the outcome, is whether they have diabetes. As a data scientist, the first thing you should be looking at is insulin. Well, you know, if someone has insulin, they have diabetes because that's why they're taking it. And that could cause issue in some of the machine learning packages. But for a very basic setup, this works fine for uh, doing the KNN. And the next thing you notice is it, it didn't take very much to open it up. Um, I can scroll down to the bottom of the data. There's 768. It's pretty much a small data set. You know, at 769, I can easily fit this into my RAM on my computer. I can look at it. I can manipulate it. And it's not going to really tax just a regular desktop computer. You don't even need an enterprise version to run a lot of this. So let's start with importing all the tools we need. And before that, of course, we need to discuss what IDE I'm using. Certainly you can use any uh, particular editor for Python. But I like to use, for doing uh, very basic visual stuff, the Anaconda, which is great for doing demos, with the Jupyter Notebook. And just a quick view of the Anaconda Navigator, which is the new release out there, which is really nice. You can see under Home, I can choose my application. We're going to be using Python 3.6. I have a couple different uh, versions on this particular machine. If I go under Environments, I can create a unique environment for each one, which is nice. And there's even a little button there where I can install different packages. So if I click on that button and open the terminal, I can then use a simple pip install to install different packages I'm working with. Let's go ahead and go back under Home, and we're going to launch our notebook. And I've already, you know, kind of like uh, the old cooking shows, I've already prepared a lot of my stuff so we don't have to wait for it to launch because it takes a few minutes for it to open up a uh, browser window. In this case, I'm gonna, it's going to open up Chrome because that's my default that I use. And since the script is pre-done, you'll see I have a number of windows open up at the top, the one we're working in. And uh, since we're working on the KNN predict whether a person will have diabetes or not, let's go ahead and put that title in there. And I'm also going to go up here and click on cell. Actually, we want to go ahead and first insert a cell below. And then I'm going to go back up to the top cell. And I'm going to change the cell type to markdown. That means this is not going to run as Python. It's a markdown language. So if I run this first one, it comes up in nice big letters, which is kind of nice. Remind us what we're working on. And by now, you should be familiar with doing all of our imports. We're going to import the pandas as pd, import numpy as np. Pandas is the uh, pandas data frame, and NumPy is a number array. Very powerful tools to use in here. So we have our imports. So we've brought in our pandas, our NumPy, our two general Python tools. And then you can see over here we have our train test split. By now you should be familiar with splitting the data. We want to split part of it for training our thing and then training our particular model. And then we want to go ahead and test the remaining data to see how good it is. Pre-processing, a standard scalar preprocessor, so we don't have a bias of really large numbers. Remember in the data we had like number pregnancies isn't going to get very large where the amount of insulin they take can get up to 256. So 256 versus 6. That will skew results, so we want to go ahead and change that so that they're all uniform between uh, minus 1 and 1. And then the actual tool. This is the K neighbors classifier we're going to use. And finally, the last three are three tools to test, all about testing our model. How good is it? Let me just put down test on there. And we have our confusion matrix, our F1 score, and our accuracy. So we have our two general Python modules we're importing, and then we have our six modules specific from the sklearn setup. And then we do need to go ahead and run this so that these are actually imported. There we go. And then move on to the next step. And so in this set, we're going to go ahead and load the database. We're going to use pandas. Remember, pandas is PD. 
and we'll take a look at the data in Python. We looked at it in a simple spreadsheet, but usually I like to also pull it up so that we can see what we're doing. So here's our data set equals pd.readcsv. That's a pandas command. And the diabetes folder I just put in the same folder where my IPython script is. If you put it in a different folder, you'd need the full length on there. We can also do a quick length of uh, the data set. That is a simple Python command, len for length. We might even, let's go ahead and print that. We'll go print. And if you do it on its own line, length.dataset in the Jupyter Notebook, it'll automatically print it. But when you're in most of your different setups, you want to do the print in front of there. And then we want to take a look at the actual data set. And since we're in pandas, we can simply do data set head. And again, let's go ahead and add the print in there. If you put a bunch of these in a row, you know, the data set one head, data set two head, it only prints out the last one. So I usually always like to keep the print statement in there. But because most projects only use one data frame, Pandas data frame, doing it this way doesn't really matter. The other way works just fine. And you can see when we hit the run button, we have the 768 lines, which we knew. And we have our pregnancies. It's automatically given a label on the left. Remember, the head only shows the first five lines. So we have zero through four. And just a quick look at the data, you can see it matches what we looked at before. We have pregnancy, glucose, blood pressure, all the way to age and then the outcome on the end. And we're going to do a couple things in this next step. We're going to create a list of columns where we can't have zero. There's no such thing as zero skin thickness or zero blood pe pressure, zero glucose. Uh, any of those you'd be dead. So not a really good factor if they don't if they have a zero in there because they didn't have the data. And we'll take a look at that because we're going to start replacing that information with a couple of different things. And let's see what that looks like. So first we create a nice list. As you can see, we have the values we talked about glucose, blood pressure, skin thickness. Uh, and this is a nice way when you're working with columns is to list the columns you need to do some kind of transformation on. A very common thing to do. And then for this particular setup, we certainly could use the, there's some Panda tools that will do a lot of this where we can replace the NA. But we're going to go ahead and do it as a data set column equals data set column dot replace. This is, this is still pandas. You can do a direct. There's also one that's, that you look for your NAN. A lot of different options in here. But the NAN, NumPy NAN is what that stands for, is, is non, doesn't exist. So the first thing we're doing here is we're replacing the zero with a NumPy none. There's no data there. That's what that says. That's what this is saying right here. So put the zero in and we're going to replace zeros with no data. So if it's a zero, that means the person's, well, hopefully not dead. Hopefully they just didn't get the data. The next thing we want to do is we're going to create the mean, which is the in integer from the data set from the column dot mean where we skip NAs. We can do that. That is a pandas command there, the skip NA. So we're going to figure out the mean of that data set. And then we're going to take that data set column and we're going to replace all the NPNAN with the means. Why did we do that? And we could have actually just uh, taken this step and gone right down here and just replaced zero and skip anything where, except you could actually, there's a way to skip zeros and then just replace all the zeros. But in this case, we want to go ahead and do it this way. So you could see that we're switching this to a non-existent value. Then we're going to create the mean. Well, this is the average person. So if we don't know what it is, if they did not get the data and the data is missing, one of the tricks is you replace it with the average. What is the most common data for that? This way, you can still use the rest of those values to do your computation, and it kind of just brings that particular value, those missing values, out of the equation. Let's go ahead and take this, and we'll go ahead and run it. It doesn't actually do anything, so we're still preparing our data. If you want to see what that looks like, we don't have anything in the first few lines, so it's not going to show up. But we certainly could look at a row. Let's do that. Let's go into our data set. Let's print a data set. And let's pick, in this case, let's just do glucose. And if I run this, this is going to print all the different glucose levels going down. And we thankfully don't see anything in here that looks like missing data, at least on the ones it shows. You can see it skipped a bunch in the middle. Because that's what it does. If you have too many lines in Jupyter Notebook, it'll skip a few and, and go on to the next in a data set. Let me go ahead and remove this. And we'll just zero out that. And of course, before we do any processing, before proceeding any further, we need to split the data set into our train and testing data. That way we have something to train it with and something to test it on. And you're going to notice we did a little something here with the uh, pandas database code. There we go, my drawing tool. We've added in this right here. 
of the data set. And what this says is that the first one in pandas, this is from the PD pandas, it's going to say within the data set, we want to look at the I location and it is all rows. That's what that says. So we're going to keep all the rows, but we're only looking at zero, column zero to eight. Remember column nine, here it is right up here, we printed it in here, is outcome. Well, that's not part of the training data, that's part of the answer. Yes, yeah, column nine, but it's listed as eight, number eight. So zero to eight is nine columns. So uh, eight is the value. And when you see it in here, zero, this is actually zero to seven. It doesn't include the last one. And then we go down here to Y, which is our answer, and we want just the last one, just column eight. And you can do it this way with this particular notation. And then if you remember, we imported the train test split. That's part of the SK Learn right there. And we simply put in our X and our Y. We're going to do random state equals zero. You don't have to necessarily seed it. That's a seed number. I think the default is one when you seed it. I'd have to look that up. And then the test size. Test size is 0.2. That simply means we're going to take 20% of the data and put it aside so that we can test it later. That's all that is. And again, we're going to run it. Not very exciting. So far, we haven't had any printout other than to look at the data. But that is a lot of this is prepping this data. Once you prep it, the actual lines of code are quick and easy. And we're almost there with the actual running of our KNN. We need to go ahead and do a scale the data. If you remember correctly, we're fitting the data in a standard scalar, which means instead of the data being from you know 5 to 303 in one column, and the next column is 1 to 6, we're going to set that all so that all the data is between minus 1 and 1. That's what that standard scalar does. Keeps it standardized. And we only want to fit the scalar with the training set but we want to make sure the testing set is the X test going in is also transformed. So it's processing it the same. So here we go with our standard scalar. We're going to call it SC underscore X for the scalar. And we're going to import the standard scalar into this variable. And then our X train equals SC underscore X dot fit transform. So we're creating the scalar on the X train variable. And then our X test, we're also going to transform it. So We've trained and transformed the X train, and then the X test isn't part of that training. It isn't part of, the, of training the transformer. It just gets transformed. That's all it does. And again, we're going to go ahead and run this. And if you look at this, we've now gone through these steps, all three of them. We've taken care of replacing our zeros for key columns that shouldn't be zero. And we've replaced that with the means of those columns. That way that they fit right in with our data models. We've come down here and we split the data. So now we have our test data and our training data. And then we've taken and we've scaled the data. So all of our data going in. Now, no, we don't, tra we don't train the Y part, the Y train and Y test. That never has to be trained. It's only the data going in. That's what we want to train in there. Then define the model using KNeighbors classifier and fit the train data in the model. So we do all that data prep. And you can see down here, we're only going to have a couple lines of code where we're actually building our model and training it. That's one of the cool things about Python and how far we've come. It's such an exciting time to be in machine learning because there's so many automated tools. Let's see, before we do this, let's do a quick length of, and let's do Y. We want, yeah, let's just do length of Y. And we get 768. And if we import math, we do math dot square root. Let's do Y train. There we go. It's actually supposed to be X train. Before we do this, let's go ahead and do import math and do math square root length of Y test. And when I run that, we get 12.409. I wanted to see, show you where this number comes from we're about to use. 12 is an even number. So if you know, if you're ever voting on things, remember the neighbors all vote, don't want to have an even number of neighbors voting. So we want to do something odd. And let's just take one away and we'll make it 11. Let me delete this out of here. That's one of the reasons I love Jupyter Notebook because you can flip around and do all kinds of things on the fly. So we'll go ahead and put in our classifier. We're creating our classifier now. And it's going to be the K neighbors classifier. N neighbors equal 11. Remember we did 12 minus 1 for 11. So we have an odd number of neighbors. P equals 2, because we're looking for, is it are they diabetic or not? And we're using the Euclidean metric. There are other means of measuring the distance. You could do like square, square means value. There's all kinds of ways to measure this. But the Euclidean is the most common one, and it works quite well. It's important to evaluate the model. Let's use the confusion matrix to do that. And we're going to use the confusion matrix, wonderful tool. And then we'll jump into the F1 score. 
And finally, accuracy score, which is probably the most commonly used quoted number when you go into a meeting or something like that. So let's go ahead and paste that in there, and we'll set the CM equal to confusion matrix. Y test, Y predict. So those are the two values we're going to put in there. And let me go ahead and run that and print it out. And the way you interpret this is you have the Y predicted, which would be your title up here. You could do, uh, let's just do P-R-E-D. Predicted across the top and actual going down. Actual. <laughs> it's always hard to, to write in here. Actual. That means that this column here down the middle, that's the important column. And it means that our prediction said 94 and prediction in the actual agreed on 94 and 32. This number here, the 13 and the 15, those are what was wrong. So you could have like three different, if you're looking at this across three different variables instead of just two, you'd end up with the third row down here and the column going down the middle. So in the first case we have the, the and I believe the zero is the 94 people who don't have diabetes. The prediction said that 13 of those people did have diabetes and were at high risk. And the 32 that had diabetes, it had correct. But our prediction said another 15. Out of that 15, it classified as incorrect. So you can see where that classification comes in and how that works on the confusion matrix. And then we're going to go ahead and print the F1 score. Let me just run that. And you see we get a 0.69 in our F1 score. The F1 takes into account both sides of the balance of false positives where if we go ahead and just do the accuracy account, and that's what most people think of, is it looks at just how many we got right out of how many we got wrong. So a lot of people, when you're a data scientist, and you're talking to other data scientists, they're going to ask you what the F1 score or the F score is. If you're talking to the general public or the uh, decision makers in the business, they're going to ask what the accuracy is. And the accuracy is always better than the F1 score. But the F1 score is more telling. It lets us know that there's more false positives than we would like on here. But 82%, not too bad for a quick flash look at people's different statistics and running an SK Learn and running the KNN, the K nearest neighbor on it. So we have created a model using KNN, which can predict whether a person will have diabetes or not or at the very least, whether they should go get a checkup and have their glucose checked regularly or not. The print accuracy score, we got the 0.818, was pretty close to what we got, and we can pretty much round that off and just say we have an accuracy of 80%. It tells us it is a pretty fair fit in the model. What is k-means clustering? K-means clustering is an unsupervised learning algorithm. In this case, you don't have labeled data, unlike in supervised learning. So you have a set of data, and you want to group them and as the name suggests you want to put them into clusters which means objects that are similar in nature similar in characteristics need to be put together so that's what k means clustering is all about the term k is basically is a number so we need to tell the system how many clusters we need to perform so if k is equal to 2, there will be 2 clusters. If k is equal to 3, it's 3 clusters, and so on and so forth. That's what the k stands for. And of course, there is a way of finding out what is the best or optimum value of k for a given data. We will look at that. So that is k means cluster. So let's take an example. k means clustering is used in many, many scenarios. But let's take an example of cricket, the game of cricket. Let's say you received data of a lot of players from maybe all over the country or all over the world and this data has information about the runs scored by the people or the, by the player and the wickets taken by the player and based on this information we need to cluster this data into two clusters batsmen and bowlers so this is an interesting example let's see how we can perform this so we have the data which consists of primarily two characteristics which is the runs and the wickets. So the bowlers basically take wickets and the batsmen score runs. There will be of course a few bowlers who can score some runs and similarly there will be some batsmen who will who would have taken a few wickets. But with this information we want to cluster those players into batsmen and bowlers. So how does this work? Let's say this is how the data is. So there are information, there is information on the y-axis, 
about the run scored and on the x-axis about the wickets taken by the players so if we do a quick plot this is how it would look and um, when we do the clustering we need to have the clusters like shown in the third diagram out here so we need to have a cluster which consists of people who have scored high runs which is basically the batsman and then we need a cluster with people who have taken a lot of wickets which is typically the bowlers there may be a certain amount of overlap but we will not talk about it right now so with k means clustering we will have here that means k is equal to 2 and we will have two clusters which is batsmen and bowlers so how does this work the way it works is the first step in k-means clustering is the allocation of two centroids randomly so two points are assigned as so-called centroids so in this case we want two clusters which means k is equal to two so two points have been randomly assigned as centroids keep in mind these points can be anywhere there are random points they are not initially they are not really the centroids centroid means it's a central point of a given data set but in this case when it starts off it's not really the centroid okay so these points though in our presentation here we have shown them one point closer to these data points and another closer to these data points they can be assigned randomly anywhere okay so that's the first step the next step is to determine the distance of each of the data points from each of the randomly assigned centroids so for example we take this point and find the distance from this centroid and the distance from this centroid this point is taken and the distance is found from this centroid and this center and so on and so forth so for every point the distance is measured from both the centroids and then whichever distance is less that point is assigned to that centroid so for example in this case visually it is very obvious that all these data points are assigned to this centroid and all these data points are assigned to this centroid and that's what is represented here in blue color and in this yellow color the next step is to actually determine the central point or the actual centroid for these two clusters so we have this one initial cluster this one initial cluster but as you can see these points are not really the centroid centroid means it should be the central position of this data set central position of this data set so that is what needs to be determined as the next step so the central point or the actual centroid is determined and the original randomly allocated centroid is repositioned to the actual centroid of this new clusters and this process is actually repeated now what might happen is some of these points may get reallocated in our example that is not happening probably but it may so happen that the distance is found between each of these data points once again with these centroids and if there is if it is required some points may be reallocated we will see that in a later example but for now we will keep it simple so this process is continued till the centroid repositioning stops and that is our final cluster so this is our so after iteration we come to this position this situation where the centroid doesn't need any more repositioning and that means our algorithm has converged convergence has occurred and we have the cluster two clusters we have the clusters with a centroid so this process is repeated the process of calculating the distance and repositioning the centroid is repeated till the repositioning stops which means that the algorithm has converged and we have the final cluster with the data points and the centroids so this is what you're going to learn from this session we will talk about the types of clustering what is k-means clustering application of k-means clustering k-means clustering is done using distance measure so we will talk about the common distance measures and then we will talk about how k-means clustering works and go into the details of k-means clustering algorithm and then we will end with a demo and a use case for k-means clustering so let's begin first of all what are the types of clustering there are primarily two categories of clustering hierarchical clustering and then partitional clustering 
and each of these categories are further subdivided into agglomerative and divisive clustering and k-means and fuzzy c-means clustering. Let's take a quick look at what each of these types of clustering are. In hierarchical clustering, the clusters have a tree-like structure and hierarchical clustering is further divided into agglomerative and divisive. Agglomerative clustering is a bottom-up approach. We begin with each element as a separate cluster and merge them into successively larger clusters. So for example, we have A, B, C, D, E, F. We start by combining B and C form one cluster, D, E and E form one more. Then we combine D, E, and F, one more bigger cluster, and then add B, C to that, and then finally A to it. Compared to that, divisive clustering or divisive clustering is a top-down approach. We begin with the whole set and proceed to divide it into successively smaller clusters. So we have A, B, C, D, E, F. We first take that as a single cluster and then break it down into A, B, C, D, E, and F. Then we have partitional clustering split into two subtypes, k-means clustering and fuzzy c-means. In k-means clustering, the objects are divided into the number of clusters mentioned by the number k. That's where the k comes from. So if we say k is equal to 2, the objects are divided into two clusters, c1 and c2. And the way it is done is the features or characteristics are compared and all objects having similar characteristics are clubbed together. So that's how k-means clustering is done. We will see it in more detail as we move forward. And fuzzy c-means is very similar to k-means in the sense that it clubs objects that have similar characteristics together. But while in k-means clustering, two objects cannot belong to, or any object, a single object cannot belong to two different clusters, in c-means objects can belong to more than one cluster. So that is the primary difference between k-means and fuzzy c-means. So what are some of the applications of k-means clustering? K-means clustering is used in a variety of examples or variety of business cases in real life, starting from academic performance, diagnostic systems, search engines, and wireless sensor networks, and many more. So let us take a little deeper look at each of these examples. Academic performance, so based on the scores of the students, students are categorized into A, B, C, and so on. Clustering forms a backbone of search engines. When a search is performed, the search results need to be grouped together. The search engines very often use clustering to do this. And similarly, in case of wireless sensor networks, the clustering algorithm plays the role of finding the cluster heads, which collects all the data in its respective cluster. So clustering, especially k-means clustering, uses distance measure so let's take a look at what is distance measure. So while these are the different types of clustering, in this video we will focus on k-means clustering. So distance measure tells how similar some objects are. So the similarity is measured using what is known as distance measure. And what are the various types of distance measures? There is Euclidean distance, there is Manhattan distance, then we have squared Euclidean distance measure and cosine distance measure. These are some of the distance measures supported by k-means clustering. Let's take a look at each of these. What is Euclidean distance measure? This is nothing but the distance between two points. So we have learned in high school how to find the distance between two points. This is a little sophisticated formula for that, but we know a simpler one is square root of y2 minus y1 whole square plus x2 minus x1 whole square. So this is an extension of that formula. So that is the Euclidean distance between two points. What is the squared Euclidean distance measure? It's nothing but the square of the Euclidean distance as the name suggests. So instead of taking the square root, we leave the square as it is. And then we have Manhattan distance measure. In case of Manhattan distance, it is the sum of the distances across the x-axis and the y-axis. And note that we are taking the absolute value so that the negative values don't come into play. So that is the Manhattan distance measure. Then we have cosine distance measure. In this case, we take the angle between the two vectors formed by joining the points from the origin. 
So that is the cosine distance measure. Okay, so that was a quick overview about the various distance measures that are supported by k-means. Now let's go and check how exactly k-means clustering works. Okay, so this is how k-means clustering works. This is like a flowchart of the whole process. There is a starting point and then we specify the number of clusters that we want. Now there are a couple of ways of doing this. We can do by trial and error. So we specify a certain number, maybe k is equal to 3 or 4 or 5 to start with. And then as we progress, we keep changing until we get the best clusters. Or there is a technique called elbow technique whereby we can determine the value of k. What should be the best value of k? How many clusters should be formed? So once we have the value of k, we specify that. And then the system will assign that many centroids so it picks randomly that to start with randomly that many points that are considered to be the centroids of these clusters and then it measures the distance of each of the data points from these centroids and assigns those points to the corresponding centroid from which the distance is minimum so each data point will be assigned to the centroid which is closest to it and thereby we have k number of initial clusters. However, this is not the final clusters. The next step it does is for the new groups, for the clusters that have been formed, it calculates the mean position, thereby calculates the new centroid position. The position of the centroid moves compared to the randomly allocated one. So it's an iterative process. Once again, the distance of each point is measured from this new centroid point and if required the data points are reallocated to the new centroids and the mean position or the new centroid is calculated once again. If the centroid moves then the iteration continues which means the convergence has not happened, the clustering has not converged. So as long as there is a movement of the centroid this iteration keeps happening but once the centroid stops moving which means that the cluster has converged or the clustering process has converged that will be the end result so now we have the final position of the centroid and the data points are allocated accordingly to the closest centroid i know it's a little difficult to understand from this simple flowchart so let's do a little bit of visualization and see if we can explain it better let's take an example if we have a data set for a grocery shop so let's say we have a data set for a grocery shop and now we want to find out how many clusters this has to be spread across so how do we find the optimum number of clusters there is a technique called the elbow method so when these clusters are formed there is a parameter called within sum of squares and the lower this value is the better the cluster is. That means all these points are very close to each other. So we use this within sum of squares as a measure to find the optimum number of clusters that can be formed for a given data set. So we create clusters or we let the system create clusters of a variety of numbers, maybe of, of 10, 10 clusters. And for each value of K, the within SS is measured and the value of K which has the least amount of within SS or WSS that is taken as the optimum value of K. So this is the diagrammatic representation. So we have on the Y axis the within sum of squares or WSS and on the X axis we have the number of clusters. So as you can imagine if you have k is equal to 1, which means all the data points are in a single cluster, the within SS value will be very high because they are probably scattered all over. The moment you split it into 2, there will be a drastic fall in the within SS value. And that's what is represented here. But then as the value of k increases, the decrease, the rate of decrease will not be so high. It will continue to decrease, but probably the rate of decrease will not be high. So that gives us an idea. So from here, we get an idea, for example, the optimum value of K should be 
either two or three or at the most four but beyond that increasing the number of clusters is not dramatically changing the value in wss because that pretty much gets stabilized okay now that we have got the value of k and let's assume that these are our delivery points the next step is basically to assign two centroids randomly so let's say c1 and c2 are the centroids assigned randomly now the distance of each location from the centroid is measured and each point is assigned to the centroid which is closest to it so for example these points are very obvious that these are closest to c1 whereas this point is far away from c2 so these points will be assigned which are close to c1 will be assigned to c1 and these points or locations which are close to c2 will be assigned to c2 and then so this is the how the initial grouping is done this is part of c1 and this is part of c2 then the next step is to calculate the actual centroid of this data because remember c1 and c2 are not the centroids they've been randomly assigned points and only thing that has been done was the data points which are closest to them have been assigned to them but now in this step the actual centroid will be calculated which may be for each of these data sets somewhere in the middle so that's like the mean point that will be calculated and the centroid will actually be positioned or repositioned there same with c2 so the new centroid for this group is c2 in this new position and c1 is in this new position once again the distance of each of the data points is calculated from these centroids now remember it's not necessary that the distance still remains the or each of these data points still remain in the same group by recalculating the distance it may be possible that some points get reallocated like so you see this so this point earlier was closer to c2 because c2 was here but after recalculating repositioning it is observed that this is closer to c1 than c2 so this is the new grouping so some points will be reassigned and again the centroid will be calculated and if the centroid doesn't change so that is a repetitive process iterative process and if the centroid doesn't change once the centroid stops changing that means the algorithm has converged and this is our final cluster with this as the centroid c1 and c2 as the centroids these data points as a part of each cluster so i hope this helps in understanding the whole process iterative process of k means clustering so let's take a look at the k means clustering algorithm let's say we have x1 x2 x3 n number of points as our inputs and we want to split this into k clusters or we want to create k clusters so the first step is to randomly pick k points and call them centroids they are not real centroids because centroid is supposed to be a center point but they are just called centroids and we calculate the distance of each and every input point from each of the centroids so the distance of x1 from c1 from c2 c3 each of the distances we calculate and then find out which distance is the lowest and assign x1 to that particular random centroid repeat that process for x2 calculate its distance from each of the centroids c1 c2 c3 up to ck and find which is the lowest distance and assign x2 to that particular centroid same with x3 and so on so that is the first round of assignment that is done now we have k groups because there are we have assigned the value of uh, k so there are k centroids and uh, so there are k groups all these inputs have been split into k groups however remember we picked the centroids randomly so they are not real centroids so now what we have to do we have to calculate the actual centroids for each of these groups which is like the mean position which means that the position of the randomly selected centroids will now change and they will be the main positions of these newly formed k groups and once that is done we once again repeat this process of k 
calculating the distance, right? So this is what we are doing as a part of step four. We repeat step two and three. So we again calculate the distance of x1 from the centroid c1, c2, c3, and then c, which is the lowest value and assign x1 to that. Calculate the distance of x2 from c1, c2, c3, or whatever, up to ck and find whichever is the lowest distance and assign x2 to that centroid and so on. In this process, there may be some reassignment. x1 was probably assigned to cluster c2 and after doing this calculation, maybe now x1 is assigned to c1. So that kind of reallocation may happen. So we repeat the steps 2 and 3 till the position of the centroids don't change or stop changing. And that's when we have convergence. So let's take a detailed look at, at each of these steps. So we randomly pick k cluster centers. We call them centroids because they are not initially, they are not really the centroids. So we let us name them c1, c2 up to ck. And then step two, we assign each data point to the closest center. So what we do, we calculate the distance of each x value from each c value. So the distance between x1, c1, distance between x1, c2, x1, c3. And then we find which is the lowest value, right? That's the minimum value we find and assign x1 to that particular centroid. Then we go next to x2. Find the distance of x2 from c1, x2 from c2, x2 from c3 and so on up to ck and then assign it to the point or to the centroid which has the lowest value and so on. So that is step number two. In step number three, we now find the actual centroid for each group. So what has happened? As a part of step number two, we now have all the points, all the data points grouped into k groups because we, we wanted to create k clusters, right? So we have k groups. Each one may be having a certain number of input values. And they need not be equally distributed, by the way. Based on the distance, we will have k groups. But remember, the initial values of the C1, C2 were not really the centroids of these groups, right? We assigned them randomly. So now in step three, we actually calculate the centroid of each group, which means the original point which we thought was the centroid will shift to the new position, which is the actual centroid for each of these groups, okay? And we again calculate the distance. So we go back to step two, which is what? We calculate again the distance of each of these points from the newly positioned centroids. And if required, we reassign these points to the new centroids. So as I said earlier, there may be a reallocation. So we now have a new set or a new group. We still have K groups but the number of items and the actual assignment may be different from what was in step two here, okay? So that might change. Then we perform step three once again to find the new centroid of this new group. So we have again a new set of clusters, new centroids and new assignments. We repeat this step two again, once again we find and then it is possible that after iterating through three or four or five times, the centroid will stop moving in the sense that when you calculate the new value of the centroid, that will be same as the original value or there will be very marginal change. So that is when we say convergence has occurred and that is our final cluster. That's the formation of the final cluster. All right, so let's see a couple of demos of uh, k-means clustering. We will actually see some live demos in uh, Python notebook using Python notebook. But before that, let's find out what's the problem that we are trying to solve. The problem statement is, let's say Walmart wants to open a chain of stores across the state of Florida and uh, it wants to find the optimal store locations. Now, the issue here is if they open too many stores close to each other, obviously the, they will not make profit. But if, they, if the stores are too far apart, then they will not have enough sales. So how do they optimize this? Now, 
for an organization like Walmart, which is an e-commerce giant, they already have the addresses of their customers in their database. So they can actually use this information or this data and use k-means clustering to find the optimal location. Now before we go into the Python notebook and show you the live code, I wanted to take you through very quickly a summary of the code in the slides and then we will go into the Python notebook. So in this block we are basically importing all the required libraries like NumPy, Matplotlib and so on and we are loading the data that is available in the form of let's say the addresses for simplicity's sake we will just take them as some data points. Then the next thing we do is quickly do a scatter plot to see how they are related to each other with respect to each other. So in the scatter plot we see that there are a few distinct groups already being formed. So you can actually get an idea about how the cluster would look and how many clusters, what is the optimal number of clusters. And then starts the actual k-means clustering process. So we will assign each of these points to the centroids and then check whether they are the optimal distance which is the shortest distance and assign each of the points data points to the centroids and then go through this iterative process till the whole process converges and finally we get an output like this so we have four distinct clusters and um, which is if we can say that this is how the population is probably distributed across florida state and uh, the centroids are like the location where the store should be it's the optimum location where the store should be so that's the way we determine the best locations for the store and that's how we can help walmart find the best locations for their stores in florida so now let's take this into python notebook let's see how this looks when we are running running the code live all right, so this is the code for k-means clustering in Jupyter Notebook. We have a few examples here which we will demonstrate how k-means clustering is used and even there is a small implementation of k-means clustering as well. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so this block is basically importing the various libraries that are required like matplotlib and numpy and so on and so forth which would be used as a part of the code then we are going and creating blobs which are similar to clusters now this is a very neat feature which is available in scikit-learn make blobs is a nice feature which creates clusters of data sets so that's a wonderful functionality that is readily available for us to create some test data kind of thing okay so that's exactly what we are doing here we are using make blobs and we can specify how many clusters we want so centers we are mentioning here so it will go ahead and so we just mentioned four so it will go ahead and create some test data for us and this is how it looks as you can see visually also we can figure out that there are four distinct classes or clusters in this data set and that is what make blobs actually provides now from here onwards we will basically run the standard k-means functionality that is readily available so we really don't have to implement k-means itself the k-means functionality or the, or the function is readily available you just need to feed the data and it will create the clusters so th this is the code for that we import k-means and then we create an instance of k-means and we specify the value of k this n underscore clusters is the value of k remember k means in k means k is basically the number of clusters that you want to create and it is a integer value so this is where we are specifying that so we have k is equal to 4 and so that instance is created we take that instance and as with any other machine learning functionality fit is what we use the function or the method rather fit is what we use to train the model here there is no real training uh, kind of thing but that's the call okay so we are calling fit and what we are doing here we are just passing the data so x has these values the data that has been created right 
So that is what we are passing here. And uh, this will go ahead and create the clusters. And uh, then we are using, after doing a uh, fit, we run the predict, which uh, basically assigns for each of these observations, which cluster it belongs to. All right, so it will name the clusters. Maybe this is cluster one, this is two, three, and so on, or I will actually start from zero, cluster zero, one, two, and three, maybe. And then for each of the uh, observations, it will assign based on which cluster it belongs to, it will assign a value. So that is stored in y underscore k means when we call predict, that is what it does. And we can take a quick look at these uh, y underscore k means or the cluster numbers that have been assigned for each observation. So this is the cluster number assigned for observation one maybe, this is for observation two, observation three and so on. So they, we have how many about I think 300 samples, right? So all the 300 samples, there are 300 values here. Each of them, the cluster number is given and the cluster number goes from zero to three. So there are four clusters. So the numbers go from zero, one, two, three. So that's what is seen here. Okay, now, so this was a quick example of generating some dummy data and then clustering that. Okay, and this can be applied if you have proper data, you can just load it up into X, for example, here, and then run the K. -means. So this is the central part of the K means clustering program example. So you basically create an instance and you mention how many clusters you want by specifying this parameter and underscore clusters. And that is also the value of k and then pass the data to get the values. Now, the next section of this code is the implementation of a k-means. Now, this is kind of a rough implementation of the k-means algorithm. So, we will just walk you through. I will walk you through the code uh, at each step what it is doing. And then we will see a couple of more examples of how k-means clustering uh, can be used in maybe some real life examples, real life use cases. All right. So in this case here, what we are doing is basically implementing the K means clustering. And there is a function or a library it calculates for a given two pairs of points. It will calculate the, the distance between them and see which one is the closest and so on. So this is like, this is pretty much like what K means does, right? So it calculates the distance of each point or each data set from predefined centroid and then based on whichever is the lowest this particular data point is assigned to that centroid so that is basically available as a standard function and we will be using that here so as explained in the slides the first step that is done in case of k-means clustering is to randomly assign some centroids so as a first step we randomly allocate a couple of centroids which we call here we are calling as centers and then we put this in a loop and we take it through an iterative process for each of the data points we first find out using this function pairwise distance argument for each of the points we find out which one which center or which uh, randomly selected centroid is the closest and accordingly we assign that data or the data point to that particular centroid or cluster. And once that is done for all the data points, we calculate the new centroid by finding out the mean position with the, the center position, right? So we calculate the new centroid. And then we check if the new centroid is the coordinates or the position is the same as the previous centroid, the positions we will compare. And if it is the same, that means the process has converged. So remember, we do this process till the centroids or the centroid doesn't move anymore, right? So the centroid gets relocated each time this reallocation is done. So the moment it doesn't change anymore, the position of the centroid doesn't change anymore, 
we know that convergence has occurred. So till then, so you see here, this is like an infinite loop. While true is an infinite loop. It only breaks when the centers are the same. The new center and the old center positions are the same. And once that is uh, done, uh, we return the centers and the labels. Now, of course, as explained, this is not a very sophisticated and advanced implementation, very basic implementation, because one of the flaws in this is that sometimes what happens is the centroid, the position will keep moving, but in uh, the change will be very minor. So in that case, also with, that is actually convergence. Right? So, for example, the change is 0 0.0001. We can consider that as convergence. Otherwise, what will happen is this will either take forever or it will be never ending. So, that's a small flaw here. So, that is something additional checks may have to be added here. But again, as mentioned, this is not the most sophisticated uh, implementation. Uh, this is like a kind of a rough implementation of the k-means clustering. Okay. So, if we execute this code, this is what we get as the output. So this is the definition of this particular function. And then we call that find underscore clusters and we pass our data x and the number of clusters, which is four. And if we run that and plot it, this is the output that we get. So this is, of course, each cluster is represented by a different color. So we have a cluster in green color, yellow color, and so on and so forth. And these big points here, these are the centroids. This is the final position of the centroids. And as you can see visually also, this appears like a kind of a center of all these points here, right? Similarly, this is like the center of all these points here and so on. So this is the example or this is an example of an implementation of k-means clustering and uh, next we will move on to see a couple of examples of how k-means clustering is used in maybe some real life uh, scenarios or use cases. In the next example or demo, we are going to see how we can use k-means clustering to perform color compression. We will take a couple of images, so there will be two examples and uh, we will try to use k-means clustering to compress the colors. This is a common situation in image processing when you have an image with millions of uh, colors but then you cannot render it on some devices which may not have enough memory. Uh, so that is the scenario where, where something like this can be used. So before again we go into the Python notebook, let's take a look at quickly the, the code. As usual, we import the libraries and then we import the image and uh, then we will flatten it. So the reshaping is basically we have the image information is stored in the form of pixels. And uh, if the image is like, for example, 427 by 640 and it has three colors. So that's the overall dimension of the of the initial image. We just reshape it and um, then feed this to our algorithm and this will then create clusters of uh, only 16 clusters so this this colors there are millions of colors and now we need to bring it down to 16 colors so we use k is equal to 16 and um, this is how when we visualize this is how it looks there are these are all about 16 million possible colors the input color space has 16 million possible colors and we just sub compress it to uh, 16 colors so this is how it would look when we compress it to 16 colors and this is how the original image looks and after compression to 16 colors this is how the new image looks as you can see there is not a lot of information that has been lost though the image quality is definitely reduced a little bit so this is an example which we are going to now see in Python notebook. Let's go into the Python notebook. And once again, as always, we will import some libraries and load this image called uh, flower.jpg. Okay, so let, we'll load that and this is how it looks. This is the original image which has, I think, 16 million colors. And uh, this is the shape of this image, which is basically what is the uh, shape is nothing but the overall size, right? So this is 427 pixel by 640 pixel. And then there are three layers, which is this three basically is for RGB, which is red, green, blue. So color image will have that, right? 
right so that is the shape of this now what we need to do is data let's take a look at how data is looking so let me just create a new cell and show you what is in data basically we have captured this information so data is what let me just show you here all right so let's take a look at china uh, what are the values in uh, china and uh, if we see here this is how the data is stored this is nothing but the pixel values okay so this is like a matrix and each one has about for, for this 427 by 640 pixels all right so this is how it looks now the issue here is these values are large the numbers are large so we need to normalize them to between 0 and 1 right so that's why we will basically create one more variable which is data which will contain the values between 0 and 1 and the way to do that is divide by 255 so we divide china by 255 and we get the new values in data so let's just run this uh, piece of code and so this is the shape so we now have also yeah what we have done is we changed using reshape we converted into the three dimensional into a two dimensional data set and let us also take a look at how let me just insert uh, probably a cell here and take a look at how data is looking all right so this is how data is looking and now you see this is the values are between 0 and 1 right so if you earlier noticed in case of china the values were large numbers now everything is between 0 and 1 this is one of the things we need to do all right so after that the next thing that we need to do is to visualize this and uh, we can take random set of maybe 10000 points and uh, plot it and check and see how this looks so let us just plot this and uh, so this is how the original the color the pixel distribution is these are two plots one is red against green and another is red against blue and this is the original distribution of the color so then what we will do is we will use k-means clustering to create just 16 clusters for the various colors and then apply that to the image now what will happen is since the data is large because there are millions of colors using regular k-means may be a little time consuming so there is another version of k-means which is called mini batch k-means so we will use that which is which processes in the overall concept remains the same but this basically processes it in smaller batches that's the only thing okay so the results will pretty much be the same so let's go ahead and execute this piece of code and also visualize this so that we can see that there are these this is how the 16 colors uh, would look uh, so this is red against green and this is uh, red against blue there is uh, quite a bit of similarity between this original color schema and the new one right so it doesn't look very very completely different or anything like that now we apply this the newly created uh, colors to the image and uh, we can take a look uh, how this is uh, looking now we can compare both the images so this is our original image and this is our new image so as you can see there is not a lot of information that has been lost uh, it pretty much looks like the original image yes we can see that for example here there is a little bit uh, it appears a little dullish compared to this one right because uh, we kind of took off some of the finer details of the color but overall the high level information has been maintained at the same time the main advantage is that now this can be this is an image which can be rendered on a device which may not be that very sophisticated now let's take one more example with a different image in the second example we will take an image of the summer palace in china and we repeat the same process this is a high definition color image with millions of colors and also uh, three-dimensional uh, now we will reduce that to 16 colors using k-means clustering and um, we do the same process like before we reshape it and then we cluster the colors to 16 and then we render the image once again and we will see that the color the quality of the image is slightly deteriorates as you can see here this has much finer details in this which are probably missing here but then that's the compromise because there are some devices which may not be able to handle 
this kind of a high density images. So let's run this code in Python notebook. All right, so let's apply the same technique for another picture, which is uh, even more intricate and has probably much complicated uh, color schema. So this is the image. Now, once again, uh, we can take a look at the shape, which is 427 by 640 by three. And this is the new data would look somewhat like this compared to the flower image. So we have some new values here and we will also bring this as you can see the numbers are much big so we will uh, much bigger so we will now have to uh, scale them down to values between 0 and 1 and that is done by dividing by 255 so let's go ahead and uh, do that and reshape it okay so we get a two-dimensional matrix and uh, we will then as a next step we will go ahead and visualize this how it looks the, the 16 colors and this is basically how it would look 16 million colors and now we can create the clusters out of this the 16 k-means clusters we will create so this is how the distribution of the pixels would look with 16 colors and then we go ahead and uh, apply this and visualize how it is looking for with the with the new just the 16 color so once again as you can see this looks much richer in color but at the same time and this probably doesn't have as we can see it doesn't look as rich as this one but nevertheless the information is not lost the shape and all that stuff and this can be also rendered on a slightly a device which is probably not that sophisticated okay so that's pretty much it so we have seen two examples of how color compression can be done uh, using k-means clustering and we have also seen in the previous examples uh, of how to implement k-means the code to roughly how to implement uh, k-means uh, clustering and we use some sample data using uh, blob to just execute the k-means clustering we're going to cover mathematics for machine learning so today's agenda is going to cover data and its types. And then we're going to dive into linear algebra and its concepts. Calculus, statistics for machine learning, probability for machine learning, hands-on demos. And of course, throwing in there in the middle is going to be your matrices and a few other things to go along with all this. Data and its types. Data denotes the individual pieces of factual information collected from various sources. It is stored, processed, and later used for analysis. And so we see here uh, just a huge grouping of information, a lot of text stuff, money, dollar signs, numbers. Uh, and then you have your performing analytics to drive insights. And hopefully you have a nice share, your shareholders gather it at the meeting and you're able to explain it in something they can understand. So we talk about data, types of data. We have, in our types of data, we have a qualitative categorical. When you think nominal or ordinal. And then you have your quantitative or numerical, which is discrete or continuous. And let's look a little closer at those data types. Vocabulary, always people's favorite, is the vocabulary words. Okay, not mine. Uh, but let's di dive into this, what we mean by nominal. Nominal, they are used to label various... Uh, label our variables without providing any measurable value. Uh, country, gender, race, hair, color, etc. It's something that you either mark true or false. This is a label. It's on or off. Either they have a red hat on or they do not. Uh, so a lot of times when you're thinking nominal data labels, uh, think of it as a true-false kind of setup. And we look at ordinal. This is categorical data with a set order or a scale to it. Uh, and you can think of salary range as a great one, uh, movie ratings, etc. You can see here the salary range if you have 10,000 to 20,000, number of employees earning that rate is 150, 20,000 to 30,000, 100, and so forth. Some of the terms you'll hear is bucket. Uh, this is where you have 10 different buckets and you want to separate it into something that makes sense into those 10 buckets. And so when we start talking about ordinal, a lot of times when you get down to the brass bones, again, we're talking true-false. Uh, so if you're a member of the 10 to 20K range, uh, so forth. Those would each be uh, either part of that group or you're not. But now we're talking about buckets, and we want to count how many people are in that bucket. 
quantitative numerical data uh, falls into two classes, discrete or continuous. And so data with a final set of values which can be categorized, class strength, questions, answered correctly, and runs hit and cricket. A lot of times when you see this, you can think integer, uh, and a very restricted integer, i.e., you can only have 100 questions um, on a test, so you can, it's very discrete. I only have 100 different values that it can attain. So think, usually you're talking about integers, but within a very small range. They don't have an open end or anything like that. Uh, so discrete is very solid, simple to count, set number. Continuous, on the other hand, uh, continuous data can take any numerical value within a range. So water pressure, weight of a person, etc. Usually we start thinking about float values where they can get phenomenally small in their in what they're worth. And there's a whole series of values that falls right between discrete and continuous. Um, you can think of the stock market. You have dollar amounts. It's still discrete, but it starts to get complicated enough when you have like, you know, jump in the stock market from $525.33 to $580.67. There's a lot of point values in there. It'd still be called discrete, but you start looking at it as almost continuous because it does have such a variance in it. Now, uh, we talk about no, we did, we went over nominal and ordinal, uh, almost true false charts, and we looked at quantitative and numerical data, which we're starting to get into numbers. Discrete, you can usually, a lot of times discrete will be put into, it could be put into true false, but usually it's not. Uh, so we want to address this stuff, and the first thing we want to look at is the very basic, which is your algebra. So we're going to take a look at linear algebra. You can remember back when your Euclidean geometry, uh, we have a line. Well, let's go through this. We have a linear algebra is the domain of mathematics concerning linear equations and their representations in vector spaces and through matrices. I told you we're going to talk about matrices. Uh, so a linear equation is simply... Um, uh, 2x plus 4y minus 3z equals 10. Very linear. 10x plus 12.4y equals z. And now you can actually solve these two equations by combining them. Uh, and that's where we're talking about a linear equation. In the vectors, we have a plus b equals c. Now we're starting to look at a direction. And these values usually think of an x, y, z plot. Um, so each one is a direction. And the actual distance of like a triangle, AB, is C. And then your matrix can describe all kinds of things. Um, I find matrices uh, confuse a lot of people, not because they're particularly difficult, but because of the magnitude and the different things they're used for. And a matrix is a, a chart or a, um, you know, think of a spreadsheet, but you have your rows and your columns. And you'll see here we have A times B equals C. Very important to know your counts. Uh, so depending on how the math is being done, what you're using it for, making sure you have the same rows and number of columns or a single number, there's all kinds of things that play in that that can make matrices confusing. Uh, but really it has a lot more to do with what domain you're working in. Uh, are you adding in multiple polynomials where you have like... Uh, uh, AX squared plus BY plus, you know, you start to see that it can be very confusing versus a very straightforward matrix. And let's just go a little deeper into these because these are such primary. This is what we're here to talk about is these different math, uh, mathematical computations that come up. So when we're looking at linear equations. Let's dig deeper into that one. An equation having a maximum order of one is called a linear equation. Uh, so it's linear because when you look at this, we have uh, ax plus b equals c, which is a one variable. We have uh, two variable, ax plus by equals c, ax plus by plus z, cz equals d, and so forth. But all of these are to the power of one. You don't see x squared. You don't see x cubed. So when we're talking about linear equations, that's what we're talking about. And their addition... If you have already dived into, say, neural networks, you should recognize this AX plus BY plus CZ um, setup plus the intercept, uh, which is basically your, your neural network, each node, adding up all the different inputs. And we can drill down into that. Most common formula is your Y equals MX plus C. So you have your uh, Y equals the M, which is your slope, your X value plus C 
which is your um, y-intercept. They kind of labeled it wrong here. Uh, <laughs> threw me for a loop. But the, the c would be your y-intercept. So when you set x equal to 0, y equals c. And that's that's your y-intercept right there. Uh, and that's they, they just had a reversed value of y when x equals 0 it equals the y-intercept, which is c. And your slope gradient line, which is your m. So you get your y equals 2x plus 3. And there's lots of easy ways to compute this. This, why, this is why we always start with the most basic one when we're solving one of these problems. And then, of course, the uh, uh, one of the most important takeaways is the slope gradient of the line. Uh, so the slope is very important, that m value. Uh, in this case, we went ahead and solved this. If you have y equals 2x plus 3, you can see how it has a nice line graph here on the right. So, matrices. A matrix refers to a rectangular representation of an array of numbers arranged in columns and rows. So we're talking uh, m rows by n columns. Here, a11 is, denotes the element of the first row in the first column. Similarly, a12, and it's really pronounced a11 in this particular setup. So it's uh, row 1, column 1. a12 is a uh, row 1, column 2. Uh, first row and second column, and so on. And there's a lot of ways to denote this. I've seen these as like a capital letter A, smaller case A for the top row. Or, I mean, you can see where it, they can go all kinds of different directions as far as the value. You just take a moment to realize there needs to be some designation as far as what row it's in and what column it's in. And we have our uh, basic operations. We have addition. So when you think about addition, you have uh, uh, two matrices of two by two, and you just add each individual number in that matrix, and then when you get to the bottom, you have, uh, in this case, the solution is 12, 10 plus 2 is 12, 5 plus 3 is 8, and so on. And the same thing with subtraction. Now again, you're counting matrices, you want to check your um, dimensions of the matrix. The shape, you'll see shape come up a lot in programming, so when we're talking about dimensions, we're talking about the shape. If the two shapes are equal, this is what happens when you add them together or subtract them. And we have multiplication. When you look at the multiplication, you end up with a very uh, a slightly different setup going. Now, <laughs> if we look at our last one, we're, uh, uh, we're like, why? This always gets to me when we get to matrices, because they don't really say why you multiply matrices. Um, you know, my first thought is 1 times 2, 4 times 3. But if you look at this, we get 1 times 2 plus 4 times 3, 1 times 3 plus 4 times 5, uh, 6 times 2 plus 3 times 3, 6 times 3 plus 3 times 5. If you're looking at these matrices, uh, think of this more as an equation. And so we have, uh, if you remember, when we went back up here for our multiple line equations, let's just go back up a couple slides where we were looking at uh, two variable. So this is a two variable equation, ax plus by equals c. Um, and this is a way to make it very quick to solve these variables, and that's why you have the matrix, and that's why you do the multiplication the way they do. And this is the dot product of uh, 1 times 2 plus 4 times 3. 1 times 3 plus 4 times 5. Uh, 6 times 2 plus 3 times 3. 6 times 3 plus 3 times 5, and it gives us a nice little um, 14, 23, 21, and 33 over here, which then can be used and reduced down to a simple um, formula as far as solving the variables as you have enough inputs. Uh, and then in matrix operations, when you're dealing with a lot of matrices, uh, now keep in mind, multiplying matrices is different than finding the product of two matrices, okay? So when we're talking about multiplication, we're talking about solving uh, for equations, when you're finding the product, you are just finding 1 times 2. Keep that in mind, because that does come up. I've had that come up a number of times where I am altering data, and I get confused as to what I'm doing with it. Uh, transpose. Flipping the matrix over its diagonal. Comes up all the time, where you have you still have 12, but instead of it being uh, 12, 8, it's now 12, 14, 8, 21. You're just flipping the columns and the rows. Uh, and then, of course, you can do an inverse. Um, changing the signs of the values across this main diagonal. And you can see here we have the inverse a to the minus 1, and it ends up with, uh, instead of 12, 8, 14, 12, it's now minus 22, minus 12. Vectors. Uh, vector just means we have a value 
and a direction. And we have down four numbers here on our vector. Uh, in mathematics, a one-dimensional matrix is called a vector. Uh, so if you have your x plot and you have a single value, that value is along the x-axis and it's a single dimension. If you have two dimensions, you can think about putting them on a graph. You might have x and you might have y, and each value denotes a direction. And then, of course, the actual distance is going to be the hypothesis of that triangle. Uh, and you can do that with three dimensionals, x, y, and z. Uh, and you can do it all the way to nth dimensions. So when they talk about the k-means uh, for categorizing and how close data is together, they will compute that based on the Pythagorean theorem. So you would take uh, the square of each value, add them all together, and find the square root, and that gives you a distance as far as where that point is, where that vector exists, or an actual point value. And then you can compare that point value to another one. And it makes a very easy comparison versus comparing uh, 50 or 60 different numbers. And that brings us up to i-gene vectors and i-gene values. Uh, i-gene vectors, the vectors that don't change their span wall transformation, and i-gene values, the scalar values that are associated to the vectors. Conceptually, you can think of the vector as your picture. You have a picture, it's uh, uh, two dimensions, x and y. And so when you do those two dimensions and those two values, or whatever that value is, um, that is that point. But the values change when you skew it. And so if we take and we have a vector A, and that's a set value, uh, B is um, your is your, you have A and B, which is your i-gene vector. 2 is the i-gene value. So we're altering all the values by 2. That means we're, uh, maybe we're stretching it out one direction, making it tall uh, if you're doing picture editing. Um, that, that's one of the places this comes in. But you can see when you're transforming uh, your different information, how you transform it is then your i-gene value. And you can see here a uh, vector after line transi transition, uh, we have 3a, a is the i-gene vector, 3 is the i-gene value. So a doesn't change, that's whatever we started with, that's your original picture, and 3 uh, is skewing it one direction, and maybe uh, b is being skewed another direction. And so you have a nice tilted picture because you've altered it by, those, by the i-gene values. So let's go ahead and pull up a demo on linear algebra. And to do this, I'm going to go through my trusted anaconda into my Jupyter Notebook. And we'll create a new uh, notebook called Linear Algebra. Since we are working in Python, uh, we're going to use our NumPy. I always import that as NP, our NumPy array. Probably the most popular um, module for doing matrices and things in. Given that this is part of a series, I'm not going to go too much into NumPy. Uh, we are going to go ahead and create two different variables, A for a numpy array 10, 15, and B, 29. We'll go ahead and run this, and you can see there's our two arrays, 10, 15, 29. And I went in and added a space there in between, so it's easier to read. And since it's the last line, we don't have to put the print statement on it unless you want, we can simply, but we can simply do A plus B. So when I run this, uh, we have 10, 15, 29, and we get 30, 24, which is what you expect. 10 plus 20, 15 plus 9. You could almost look at this addition as being um, just adding up the columns on here coming down. And if we wanted to do it a different way, we could also do a dot t plus b dot t. Remember that t flips them. And so if we do that, we now get them, uh, we now have 30, 24 going the other way. We could also do something kind of fun. There's a lot of different ways to do this. Uh, as far as a plus b, I can also do a plus b dot t. And you're going to see that that will come out the same, the 30, 24, whether I transpose a and b or transpose them both at the end. And likewise, we can very easily subtract two vectors. I can go a minus b. And we run that, and we get minus 10, 6. Now remember, this is the last line in this particular section, so I don't have to put the print around it. Um, and just like we did before, we can transpose either the individual or we can transpose the main setup, and then we get a minus 10, 6 going the other way. 
Now, we didn't mention this in our notes, but you can also do a scalar multiplication. Let me just put down the scalar so you can remember that. Uh, and what we're talking about here is I have uh, this array here, u, and if I go a times u, uh, we'll take the value 2, we'll multiply it by every value in here. So 2 times 30 is 60, 2 times 15, and just like we did before, um, this happens a lot because when you're doing matrices, you do need to flip them. You get 60, 30 coming this way. So in NumPy, uh, we have what they call dot product. And uh, with this, this is in a two-dimensional vectors. It is the equivalent of two matrix multiplication. And remember, we were talking about matrix multiplication, uh, where it is the, well, let's walk through it. We'll go ahead and start by defining two um, numpy arrays. We'll have uh, 10, 20, 25, 6, or our u and our v. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and do, if we take the values, uh, and if you remember correctly, an array like this would be 10 times 25 plus 20 times 6. We'll go ahead and uh, print that. There we go. And then we'll go ahead and do the uh, np dot dot of u comma v. And we'll find when we do this, we go ahead and run this, uh, we're going to get uh, 370, 370. So this is a strain multiplication where they use it to solve uh, linear algebra uh, when you have multiple numbers going across. And so this could be very complicated. We could have a whole string of different variables going in here. But for this, we get a nice uh, value for our dot multiplication. And we did um, addition earlier, which is just your basic addition. Uh, and of course, the matrix, you can get very complicated on these. Or uh, in this case, we'll go ahead and do, um, let's create two complex matrices. This one is a matrix of um, you know, 12, 10, 4, 6, 4, 31. We'll just print out A so you can see what that looks like. Here's print A. We print A out, you can see that we have a um, two by three layer matrix for A. And we can also put together, always kind of fun when you're playing with print values, uh, we could do something like this. We could go in here. There we go. Uh, we could print A, we have it end with uh, equals A, run. And this kind of gives it a nice look. Uh, here's your matrix. That's all this is. Comma n means it just tags it on the end. That's all, all that is doing on there. And then we can simply add in what is a plus b. And you should already guess, because this is the same as what we did before. There's no difference. Uh, when we do a simple vector addition, we have 12 plus 2 is 14. 10 plus 8 is 18, and so on. And just like we did the uh, matrix addition, we can also do a minus b and do our matrix subtraction. And we look at this, uh, we have, what, 12 minus 2 is 10, 10 minus 8, uh, where are we? <laughs> oh, there we go. 8 minus, uh, confusing what I'm looking at. I should have reprinted out the original numbers. Uh, but we can see here 12 minus 2 is, of course, 10. 10 minus 8 is 2. Uh, 4 minus 46 is minus 42, and so forth. So same as the subtraction as before, we just call it matrix subtraction. It's identical. Now, if you remember up here, we had a scalar addition. We're adding just one number to a matrix. You can also do scalar multiplication. Uh, and so simply, if you have a single value A and you have B, which is your array, we can also do A times B. When we run that, uh, you can see here we have 2 times 4 is 8. Uh, 5 times 4 is 20, and so forth. You're just multiplying the 4 across each one of these values. And this is an interesting one that comes up. A little bit of a brain teaser is uh, matrix and vector multiplication. And so when we're looking at this, uh, we are just do a regular array. It doesn't necessarily have to be a numpy array. We have A, which has our... Um, an array of arrays and B, which is a single array. And so we can from here 
do the dot a b and this is going to return two values and the first value is that it's, it's, you could say it's like uh, um, we're doing the this array b array first with a and then with the second one and so it splits it up so you have a matrix of vector multiplication and you can mix and match when you get into really complicated uh, back-end stuff, this becomes more common because you're now, you've got layers upon layers of data, and so you, you'll end up with a matrix and a set of uh, vector matrices that you want to multiply. Now, keep in mind that if you're doing data science, a lot of times you're not looking at this. This is what's going on behind the scenes. So if you're in um, the scikit looking at sklearn where you're doing linear regression models, this is some of the math that's hidden behind the scenes that's going on. Other times, you might find yourself having to do part of this and manipulate the data around so it fits right, and then you go back in and you run it through the scikit. And if we can do um, up here where we did a uh, matrix and vector multiplication, we can also do matrix to matrix multiplication. And if we run this where we have the two matrices, uh, you can see we have a very complicated array that, of course, comes out on there for our dot. And just to reiterate it, we have our transpose a matrix, which is your dot T. And so if we create a matrix A and then we do uh, transpose it, you can see how it flips it from 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 to 5, 15, 25, 10, 20, 30 uh, rows and columns. And certainly with the math, uh, this comes up a lot. Um, it also comes up a lot with XY plotting. When you put it into PyPlot, you have one format where they're looking at pairs of numbers and then they want all of X's and all Y's. So, you know, the transpose is an important tool both for your math and for plotting and all kinds of things. Another tool that we didn't discuss uh, is your identity matrix. Uh, and this one is more definition. Uh, the identity matrix, um, we have here one where we just did uh, two. So it comes down as 1, 0, 0, 1, uh, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. It creates a diagonal of 1. And what that is, is when you're doing your identities, you could be comparing all your different features to the different features and how they correlate. And of course, when you have uh, feature 1 compared to feature 1 to itself, it is always 1, uh, where usually it's between 0 and 1, depending on how well it correlates. So when we're talking about identity matrix, that's what we're talking about right here, is that the, you create this preset matrix, and then you might adjust these numbers depending on what you're working with and what the domain is. And then another thing we can do uh, to kind of wrap this up, we'll hit you with the most complicated uh, um, piece of this puzzle here, is an inverse um, A matrix. And let's just go ahead and put the, um, oh, it's a lengthy description. <laughs> Let's go ahead and put the description. This is straight out of the uh, the website for um, NumPy. Uh, so given a square matrix A, here's our square matrix A, which is 2, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 2, 1. Keep in mind, 3 by 3, it's square. It's got to be equal. It's going to return the matrix A inverse satisfying dot A, um, A inverse. So here's our matrix multiplication. Um, and then, it, of course, it equals the dot, uh, yeah, A inverse of A um, with an identity shape of uh, A dot shape 0. This is just reshaping the identity. Whew, that's a little complicated there. Uh, so we're going to have our, here's our array. Uh, we'll go ahead and run this. And you can see what we end up with is we end up with uh, an array 0 0.5, minus 0 0.5, and so forth with our 211 going down to 1010121. Zero, zero, one, zero, one, one. Um, getting into a little deep on the math, understanding when you need this is probably really is, is what's really important when you're doing data science versus uh, handwriting this out and looking up the math and handwriting all the pieces out. You do need to know about the linear algorithm inverse of A. Uh, so if it comes up, you can easily pull it up or at least remember where to look it up. We took a look at the algebra side of it. Let's go ahead and take a look at the calculus side of uh, what's going on here with the machine learning. So calculus, oh my goodness, and differential equations. You got to throw that in there because that's all part of the bag of tricks, especially when you're doing large neural networks, but it also comes up in many other areas. 
The good news is most of it's already done for you in the back end. Uh, so when it comes up, you really do need to understand from the data science, not data analytics. Data analytics means you're digging deep into actually solving these math equations. Uh, and a neural network is just a giant differential equation. Uh, so when we talk about calculus, uh, we're going to go ahead and understand it by talking about cars versus time and speed. Uh, so it helps to calculate the spontaneous rate of change. Uh, so suppose we plot a graph of the speed of a car with respect to time. So as you can see here, going down the highway, probably merged into the highway from an on-ramp. So I had to accelerate, so my speed went way up. Uh, stuck in traffic, merged into the traffic. Traffic opens up, and I accelerate again up to the speed limit. And uh, maybe it peters off up there. So you can look at this as... as um, the speed versus time. I'm getting faster and faster because I'm continually accelerating. And if I hit the brakes, it'd go the other way. So the rate of change of speed with respect of time is nothing but acceleration. How fast are we accelerating? The acceleration is the area between the start point of X and the end point of delta X. Uh, so we can calculate a simple, if you had uh, X and delta X, we could put a line there. And that slope of the line is our acceleration. Now, that's pretty easy when you're doing linear algebra, but I don't want to know it just for that line in those two points. I want to know it across the whole of what I'm working with. That's where we get into calculus. So when we talk about the distance between x and delta x, it has to be the smallest possible near to zero in order to approximate the acceleration. Uh, so the idea is that instead of, I mean, if you ever did took a basic calculus class, they would draw bars down here and you would divide this area up. Um, let's go back up a screen. You divide this area of this time period up into maybe 10 sections and you'd use that and you could calculate the acceleration between each one of those 10 sections kind of thing. Uh, and then we just keep making that space smaller and smaller until delta x is almost uh, infinitesimally small. And so we get a function of a uh, equals a limit as h goes to zero of a function of a plus h minus a function of a over h. And that is you're computing the slope of the line. We're just computing that slope under smaller and smaller and smaller samples. Uh, and that's what calculus is. Calculus is the integral. You can see down here we have our nice uh, integral sign. It looks like a giant S. And that's what that means, is that we've taken this down to as small as we can for that sampling. Uh, so we're talking about calculus. We're finding the area under the slope is the main process in the integration. Similar, small intervals are made of the smallest possible length of x plus delta x, where delta x approaches almost an infinitesimally small space. And then it helps to find the overall acceleration by summing up all the lengths together. Uh, so we're summing up all the accelerations from the beginning to the end. And so here's our integral. We sum of a of x times d of x equals a plus c. Uh, that is our basic calculus here. So when we talk about multivariate calculus, uh, multivariate calculus deals with functions that have multiple variables. And you can see here we start getting into some very complicated equations. Um, uh, change in W over change of time equals change of W over change of Z. The differential of Z to DX, the differential of X to DT, it gets pretty complicated. Uh, and it really translates into the multivariate integration using double integrals. And so you have the, the sum of the sum of F of X of Y of D of A equals the sum from C to D and A to B of F of X of Y DX DY equals uh, the sum of A to B, sum of C to D of F x o y d y d x understanding the very specifics of everything going on in here and actually doing the math is usually calculus one calculus two and differential equations uh, so you're talking about three full length courses to dig into and solve these math equations what we want to take from here is when we're talking about calculus uh, we're talking about summing of all these different slopes and so we're still solving a linear uh, expression. We're still solving y equals mx plus b, but we're doing this for infinitesimally small x's and then we want to sum them up. That's what this integral sign means. Uh, the sum of a of x, d of x equals a plus c. 
And when you see these very complicated uh, multivariate differentiation using the chain rule, uh, when we come in here and we have the change of W to the change of T equals the change of W dZ uh, and so forth. That's what's going on here. That's what these means. We're basically looking for the area under the curve, which really comes to how is the change changing? You know, speed's going up. How is that changing? And then you end up with a multiple layer. So if I have three layers of neural networks, how is the third layer changing based on the second layer changing, which is based on the first layer changing? And you get the picture here that now we have a very complicated uh, multivariate integration um, with integrals. The good news is we can solve this uh, mathematically, and that's what we do when you do neural networks and reverse propagation. Uh, so the nice thing is that you don't have to solve this on paper unless you're a data analysis and you're working on the back end of integrating these formulas and building the script to actually build them. So we talk about applications of calculus. Uh, it provides us the tools to build an accurate predictive model. Um, so it's really behind the scenes. We want to guess at what the change of the change of the change is. <laughs> That's a little goofy. I, I know. I just threw that out there. It's kind of a meta term. But if you can guess how things are going to change, then you can guess what the new numbers are. Multivariate calculus explains the change in our target variable in relation to the rate of change in the input variables. So there's our multiple variables going in there. If uh, one variable is changing, how does it affect the other variable? And then in gradient descent, Calculus is used to find the local and global maxima. And this is really big. Uh, we're gonna actually going to have a whole section here on gradient descent because it is really, I mean, I talked about neural networks and how you can see how the different layers go in there. But gradient descent is one of the most key things for trying to guess the best answer to something. So let's take a look at the code behind gradient descent. And uh, before we open up the code, let's just do real quick uh, gradient descent. Let's say we have a curve like this. And most common is that this is going to represent your error. Oops. <laughs> error. There we go. Error. Uh, hard to read there. And I want to make the error as low as possible. And so what I'm looking at it is I want to find this line here which is the minimum value. So we're looking for the minimum. And it does that by uh, sampling there. And then it, based on this, it guesses it might be someplace here. And it goes, hey, this is still going down. It goes here and then goes back over here and then goes a little bit closer. And it's just playing a high low until it gets to that spot, that bottom spot. And so we want to minimize the error in, uh, on the flip note, you could also want to be maximizing something. You want to get the best output of it. Uh, that's simply uh, minus the value. Uh, so if you're looking for where the peak is, this is the same as a negative for where the valley is. I'm looking for that valley. Uh, that's all that is, and this is a way of finding it. So the cool thing is um, all the heavy lifting's done. Um, I actually ended up putting together one of these a while back is uh, when I didn't know about Sidekick and I was just starting. Uh, boy, it's a long while back. And uh, is playing high-low. How do you play high-low, not get stuck in the valleys, uh, figure out these curves and things like that? Well, you do that and the back end is all the calculus and differential equations to calculate this out. The good news is you don't have to do those. Uh, so instead, we're going to put together the code. And let's go ahead and see what we can do with that. So, uh, guys in the back put together a nice little piece of code here, which is kind of fun. Uh, some things we're going to note, and this is, this is really important stuff, because when you start doing your data science and digging into your machine learning models, uh, you're going to find these things are stumbling blocks. Uh, the first one is current X. Where do we start at? Uh, keep in mind, your model that you're working with is very generic. So whatever you use to minimize it, the first question is, where do we start? Um, and we started at this because the algorithm starts at X equals 3. So we ar arbitrarily picked 5. Learning rate is uh, how many bars to skip going one way or the other. Uh, in fact, I'm going to separate that a little bit because these two are really important. Um, 
if we're dealing with something like this where we're talking about, um, uh, well, here's our, here's the function we're going to use, our um, gradient of our function, um, 2 times x plus 5, keep it simple. So that's the function we're going to work with. So if I'm de dealing with increments of 1,000, 0.1 is going to be a very long time. And if I'm dealing with increments of 0.001, uh, 0.1 is going to skip over my answer. So I won't get a very good answer. Um, and then we look at precision. This tells us when to stop the algorithm. So again, very specific to what you're working on. Uh, if you're working with money and you don't convert it into a float value, uh, you might be dealing with 0.01, which is a penny. That might be your precision you're working with. Um, and then, of course, the previous step size, max iterations, uh, we want something to cut out at a certain point. Usually that's built into a lot of minimization functions. And then here's our actual uh, formula we're going to be working with. And then we come in, we go, while previous step size is greater than precision and iters is less than max, and max iters, eh, <laughs> say that 10 times fast. Um, we're just saying if it's uh, if we're if we're still greater than our precision level, we still got to keep digging deeper, um, and then we also don't want to go past a thousand or whatever this is, a million or ten thousand uh, running. That's actually pretty high. Um, we almost never do max iterations more than like a hundred or two hundred. Rare occasions you might go up to four or five hundred if it's uh, depending on the problem you're working with. Uh, so we have our previous equals our current. That way we can track time wise. Uh, the current now equals the current minus the rate times the formula of our previous x. So now we've generated our new version. Uh, previous step size equals the absolute current previous. Uh, so we're looking for the change in x. Iters equals iterations plus 1. That's so we know to stop if we get too far. And then we're just going to print the local minimum occurs at x on here. And if we go ahead and run this, uh, you can see right here, it gets down to this point, and it says, hey, um, local minimum is minus 3.3222 for this particular series we created. Uh, and this is created off of our formula here, lambda x2 times x plus 5. Now, when I'm running this stuff, uh, you'll see this come up a lot in uh, with the SK Learn kit. And, and one of the nice reasons of breaking this down the way we did is I could go over those top pieces. Uh, those top pieces are everything when you start looking at these minimization toolkits in built-in code. And so from, um, we'll just do, it's actually docs.scipy.org, and we're looking at the scikit. There we go. Um, optimize, minimize. You can only minimize one value. You have the function that's going in. This function can be very complicated. Uh, so we used a very simple function up here. It could be, uh, there's all kinds of things that could be on there. And there's a number of methods to solve this as far as how they shrink down. Uh, and your x naught, there's your, there's your start value. So your function, your start value, um, there's all kinds of things that come in here that you can look at, which we're not going to. Um, optimization automatically creates, constraints, bounds. Some of this it does automatically, but you really, the big thing I want to point out here is you need to have a starting point. You want to start with something that you already know is mostly the answer. Uh, if you don't, then it's going to have a heck of a time trying to calculate it out. Or you can write your own little script that does this and, and does a high-low guessing and tries to find the max value. That brings us to statistics. What this is kind of all about is figuring things out. A lot of vocabulary and statistics. Uh, so statistics, well, I guess it's all relative. It's definitely not an Edel class. Uh, so a bunch of stuff going on in statistics. Statistics concerns with the collection, organization, analysis, interpretation, and presentation of data. That is a mouthful. Um, so we have from end to end, where, where does it come from? Is it valid? What does it mean? How do we organize it? Um, how do we analyze it? And then you got to take those analyses and interpret it into something that uh, people can use, kind of reduce it to understandable. Um, and nowadays you have to be able to present it. If you can't present it, then no one else is going to understand what the heck you did. So when we look at the terminologies, uh, 
there is a lot of terminologies depending on what domain you're working in. So clearly, if you're working in um, a domain that deals with viruses and T cells and, and how does, you know, where does it come from? And you're studying the different people, then you can have a population. If you are working with um, mechanical gear, um, you know, a little bit different. If you're looking for the wobbling statistics uh, to know when to replace a uh, rotor on a machine or something like that, uh, that can be a big deal. You know, we have these huge fans that turn in our sewage processing systems. And so those fans, they start to wobble and hum and do different things that the sensors pick up. At one point, do you replace them instead of waiting for it to break, in which case it costs a lot of money. Instead of replacing a bushing, you're replacing the whole fan unit. Uh, an interesting project that came up for our city a while back. Uh, so population. All objects are measurements whose properties are being observed. Uh, so that's your population, all the objects. It's easy to see it with people because we have our population in large. Um, but in the case of the sewer fans, we're talking about how the fan units. That's the population of fans that we're working with. You have a parameter, a matrix, uh, that is used to represent a population or characteristic. You have your sample, a subset of the population studied. You don't want to do them all because then you don't have a, if you come up with a conclusion for everyone, you don't have a way of testing it. So you take a sample. Uh, sometimes you don't have a choice. You can only take a sample of what's going on. You can't uh, study the whole population. And a variable, a metric of interest for each person or object in a population. Types of sampling. We have a probabilistic approach, uh, selecting samples from a larger population using a method based on the theory of probability. And we'll go into a little bit more deeper on these. We have random, systematic, stratified. And then you have a non-probabilistic approach, selecting samples based on the subjective judgment of the researcher rather than random selection. Uh, it has to do with convenience, trying to reach a quota, um, or snowball. Uh, and they're very biased. That's one of the reasons you'll see this big stamp on it that says biased. Uh, so you got to be very careful on that. So probabilistic sampling. Uh, when we talk about a random sampling, we select random sized samples from each group or category. So we, it's as random as you can get. Uh, when we talk about systematic sampling, we're selecting random sized samples from each group or category with a fixed periodic interval. Uh, so we kind of split it up. This would be like a time setup or our different categories. And you might ask your question, well, what is a category or a group? Uh, if you look at, I'm going to go back a window. Let's say we're studying um, economics of different of an area. Um, we know pretty much that based on their culture and where they came from, they might need to be separated. And so, uh, and when I say separated, I don't mean separated from their, their uh, place where they live. I mean, as far as the analysis, we want to look at the different groups and make sure they're all represented. So if we had like an 80% uh, of a group that is, uh, say, Hispanic and, or Indian, and also in that same area, we have 20%, 20 who are, uh, let's call our expatriates. They left America and they're nice and uh, your Caucasian group we might want to sample a group that is representative of both. Uh, so we're talking about stratified sampling, and we're talking about groups. Those are the groups we're talking about. And that brings us to stratified sampling, selecting approximately equal size samples from each group or category. Uh, this way we can actually separate the categories and give us an insight into the different cultures and how that might affect them in that area. Uh, so you can see these are very, very different kind of depends on what you're working with um, as far as your data and what you're studying. And so we can see here, uh, just to go a little bit more, we'd have selecting 25 employees from a company of 250 employees randomly. Don't care anything about them, what groups are in, which office they're in, nothing. Uh, and we might be selecting one employee from every 50 unique employees in a company of 250 employees. And then we have selecting one employee from every branch in the company office. So we have all the different branches. There's our group or our categories by the branch. And the category could depend on what you're studying. So it has a lot of variation on there. You see this kind of grouping and categorizing is also used to generate a lot of misinformation. Uh, so if you only study one group and you say, this is what it is, 
then everybody assumes that's what it is for everybody. And so you got to be very careful of that, and it's a very unethical thing to kind of do. So types of statistics. Uh, when we talk about statistics, we're going to talk about descriptive and inferential statistics. There are so many different terms in statistics to break it up. Uh, so, we, so we're talking about a particular setup. So we're talking about descriptive and inferential uh, statistics. You, the base of the word describe is pretty solid. You're describing the data. What does it look like? With inferential statistics, we're going to take that from the small population to a large population. So if you're working with a drug company, uh, you might look at the data and say, these people were helped by this drug. They did 80% uh, better as far as their health or 80% better survival rate than the people um, who did not have the drug. So we can infer that that drug will work in the greater populace and will help people. So that's where you get your inferential. Uh, so we are predicting how it's going to affect the greater population. So descriptive statistics. It is used to describe the basic features of data and form the basis of quantitative analysis of data. So we have a measure of central tendencies. We have your mean, median, and mode. And then we have a measure of spread, like your range, your interquartile range, your variance, and your standard deviation. And we're going to look at all these a little deeper here in a second. Uh, but one of them you can think of is um, how the data difference differences, you know, what's the max, min range, all that stuff is your spread. And anything that's just a single number is usually your central uh, tendencies, measure of central tendencies. So we talk about the mean, it is the average of the set of values considered. What is the average outcome of whatever's going on? And then your median separates the higher half and the lower half of data. Uh, so where's the center point of all your different data points? So your mean might have some a couple really big numbers that skew it uh, so that the average is much higher than if you took those outliers out, where the median would, by separating the high from the low, might give you a much lower number. You might look at it and say, oh, that's, that's odd. Why is the average so much higher than the median? Well, it's because you have some outliers. Or why is it so much lower? And then the mode is the most frequent appearing value. Uh, this is really interesting if you're studying economics and how people are doing. You might find that the most common um, income, like in the U.S., was uh, at one point 24,000 a year, where the average was closer to 80,000. And it's like, wow, what a difference. Well, there's some people who have a lot of money, and so that skews that way up. So the average person is not making that kind of money. And then you look at the median income, and you're like, well, the median income is a little bit closer to the average. Uh, so it does create a very interesting way of looking at the data. Again, these are all uh, central tendencies, single numbers you can look at for the whole spread of the data. And we look at the measure of central tendencies. The mean is the average marks of a student in a classroom. So here we have the mean, some of the marks of the students, total number of students. And as we talked about the median, uh, if we have 0 through 10, and we take half the numbers and put them on one side of the line, half the numbers on the other side of the line, uh, we end up with five in the middle. And then the mode. What mark was scored by most of the students in a test? In a simple case where most people scored like an 82% and got certain problems wrong, easy to figure out. Uh, not so easy when you have different areas where like you have like the... Um, Oh, let's go back to economy. A little bit more difficult to calculate if you have a large group that scores that makes 30,000 and a slightly bigger group that makes 26,000. So what do you put down for the mode? Uh, certainly there's a number of ways to calculate that and there's actually a different variations depending on what you're doing. So now we're looking at a measure of spread. Uh, range. What's the difference between the highest and the lowest value? First thing you want to look at, you know, it's uh, we had everybody in the test scored between 60 and 100 percent. Somebody got 100 percent, or maybe 60 to 90 percent. It was so hard that a lot of people could not get 100 percent. Um, you have your interquartile range. Quartiles divide a rank ordered data set into four equal parts. Very common thing to do as part of all the basic packages, whether you're working in uh, data frames with pandas, whether you're working in Scala, whether you're working in R. Um, you'll see this come up where they have range, your min, your max, and then it'll have your interquartile range. How does it look like in each quarter of data? 
Variance measures how far each number in the set is from the mean and therefore from every other number in the set. Uh, so you have like a, how much turbulence is going on in this data. And then the standard deviation. It is the measure of the variance or the dispersion of a set of values from the mean. And you'll usually see, uh, if I'm doing a graph, I might have the value graphed. Um, and then based on the, the error, I might gra graph the standard deviation in the error on the graph as a background. So you can see how far off it is. Uh, so standard deviation is used a lot. So measurement of spread. Uh, marks of a student out of 100. Uh, we have here from 50 to 63 or 50 to 90. Uh, so the range, maximum marks, minimum marks, we have 90 to 45, and the spread of that is 45, 90 minus 45. And then we have the interquartile range using the same marks over there. You can see here where the median is, and then there's the first quarter, the second quarter, and the third quarter based on splitting it apart by those values. And to understand the variance and standard deviation, we first need to find out the mean. Uh, so here's our, our, you know, calculating the average there. We end up at approximately 66 for the average. And then we look at that in the variance. Once we know the means, we can do equals the marks minus the mean squared. Why is it squared? Uh, because one, you want to make sure it's, you don't have like, if you, if you're putting all this stuff together, you end up with an error as far as one's negative, one's positive, one's a little higher, one's a little lower. Uh, so you always see the squared value and over the total observations. And so the standard deviation equals the square root of the variance, which is approximately 16. And if you were looking at um, a predictable model, you would be looking at the deviation based on the error. How much error does it have? Uh, and that's, again, really important to know. If, you're, if your prediction is predicting something, what's the chance of it being way off or just a little bit off? Now that we've looked at the... Um, tools as far as some of the basics for doing your statistics and what we're talking about. Let's go ahead and pull up a little demo and show you what that looks like in Python code uh, so you can get some little hands-on here. For that let's go in back into our Jupyter Notebook in Python. Now almost all of this you can do in NumPy. Last time we worked um, in NumPy. This time we're going to go ahead and use pandas and if you remember from uh, pandas on here uh, this is basically a data frame, rows, columns. Let's just go ahead and do a print df.head and run that. And you can see we have uh, the name Jane, Michael, William, Rosie, Hannah, Sal and their salaries on here. And of course, instead of having to do uh, all those hand calculations and add everything together and divide by the total, we can do something very simple on this, uh, like use the command uh, mean in pandas. And so if I go ahead and do this, print df, pick our column, salary, because we want to find the means of that colory. We want to find the means of that column. Uh, and we go ahead and print this out, and you can see that the uh, average income on here is 71,000. Uh, and let's just go ahead and do this. We'll go ahead and put in uh, means. And if we're going to do that, we also might want to find the median. And the median is uh, very similar, except it actually is just median. Uh, we're used to means and average. It's kind of interesting that those are they use the two different words. Uh, there can be, in some computations, slight differences. But for the most part, the means is the average. Uh, and then the median, oops, let's put a... Median here, DF salary, that way it displays a little better. We can see the median is 54,000. Um, so the halfway mark is significantly below the average. Why? Because we have somebody in here who makes 189,000. Darn you, Rosie, for throwing off our numbers. Uh, but that's something you'd want to notice. This is, this is, uh, the difference between these is huge. And so is what is the meaning behind that when you're studying a populace and looking at uh, the different data coming in. And, of course, we also want to find out, hey, what's the most uh, common income that people make in this little tiny sample. And so we'll go ahead and do the mode. And you can see here with the mode, uh, it's at 50,000. So this is, this is very telling that most people are making 50,000. The middle point is at 54,000. So half the people are making more than that. What that tells me is that if the most common income is way, is below the median, then 
there's a few, there's a, you know, there's a, a lot of high salaries going up, but there's some really low salaries in there. And so this trend, which is very common in statistic, you know, when you're analyzing the economy and different people's income, is pretty common. And the bigger difference between these is also very important when we're studying statistics. Uh, and when you hear someone just say, hey, the average income was, you might start asking questions at that point. Why aren't you talking about the median income? Why aren't you talking about the mode, the most common income? What are you hiding? Uh, and if you're doing these analyses, you should be looking at these saying, hey, why, why are these discrepancies? Why are these so different? And of course, with any uh, analysis, it's important to find out the minimum and the maximum. So we'll go ahead. It, it's just simply uh, um, dot min. will pull up your minimum and then dot max pulls up the maximum. Pretty straightforward on as far as um, translating it and knowing what your you know what the your lowest value and what your highest value is here, um, which you'll use to generate like a spread later on. And real quick on no, mode, uh, note that it puts mode zero. Like I said, there's a couple different ways you can compute the mode. Um, although you know, the standard one's pretty good. We can of course do the range which is your max minus your min. So now we have a range of 149,000 between the upper end and the lower end. And you might want to be looking up the individual values on all of these. But it turns out there is a describe feature in pandas. And so in pandas we can actually do df salary describe. And if we do this you can see we have that there's seven uh, setups. Here's our mean um, our standard deviation, which we didn't compute yet, which would just be a dot std. And you got to be a little careful because when it computes it, it, it looks for axes and things like that. Uh, we have our minimum value, and here's our quartiles. Uh, our maximum value, and then of course the name salary. Uh, so these are the, these are the basic statistics. You can pull them up and like just describe. This is a dictionary, so I could actually do something like, um, and here I could actually go uh, count and run and now it just prints the count uh, so because this is a dictionary you can pull any one of these values out of here it's kind of a quick and dirty way to pull all the different information and then split it up and depending on what you need now if i just walked in and gave you this information um, in a meeting at some point you would just kind of fall asleep <laughs> that's what i would do anyway um, so we want to go ahead and see about graphing it here. And we'll go ahead and put it into a histogram and plot that graph on it of the salaries. And let's just go ahead and put that in here. So we do our map plot inline. Remember, that's a Jupyter's notebook thing. Uh, a lot of the new version of the map plot library does it automatically. But just in case, I always put it in there. Uh, import map plot library pyplot is PLT. That's my plotting. And then we have our data frame. Uh, I, don't, I guess I really don't need to respell the data frame. Maybe we could just remind ourselves what's in it. So we'll go ahead and just uh, print df. That way we still have it. And then we have our salary df salary, salary.plot history title, salary distribution, color gray, uh, plot ax v line, salary the mean value. So we're going to take the mean value, um, color violet. Line style dash. This is just all making it pretty. Uh, what color, dash line, line width of two, that kind of thing. And the median. And let's go ahead and run this just so you can see what we're talking about. And so up here we are taking on our plot. Um, so here's the data. Here's our, our data frame printed out so you can see it with the salaries. And we're looking at the salary distribution. And just look at this, the way the salary is distributed. Um, you have our, uh, in this case we did, let's see, we had red for the median. We have violet for our average or mean. And you can just see how it really, I mean, here's our outlier. Here's our person who makes a lot of money. Here's the um, average and here's the median. Um, and so as you look at this, you can say, wow, um, based on the average, it really doesn't tell you much about what people are really taking home. All it does is tell you, how much money is in this, you know, what the average salary is. So some of the things you want to take away in addition to this is that it's very easy to plot um, an AX V line. These are these up and down lines for your markers. Um, 
And as you display the data, I mean, you can add all kinds of things to this and get really complicated. Keeping it simple is pretty straightforward. I look at this and I can see we have a major outlier out here. We can definitely do a histogram and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, picture's worth a thousand words. What you really want to make sure you take away is that we can do a basic describe, which pulls all this information out and we can print any of the individual information from the describe because uh, this is a dictionary. And so if we want to go ahead and look up um, the mean value, we can also do describe mean. So if you're doing a lot of statistics, uh, being able to... It doesn't have the print on there, so it's only going to print um, the last one, which happens to be the mean. Uh, you can very easily reference any one of these. And then you can also, if you're doing something a little bit more complicated and you don't need just the basics, you can come through and pull any one of the individual... Um, references from the from the pandas on here. So now we've had a chance to describe our data. Uh, let's get into inferential statistics. Inferential statistics allows you to make predictions or inferences from data. And you can see here we have a nice little picture of movie ratings and um, if we took this group of people and said hey how many people like the movie, dislike it, can't say, and then you ask just a random person who comes out of the movie who hasn't been in this study, uh, you can infer that 55% chance of saying liked, 35% chance of saying disliked, or a 10 or 11% chance of can't say. So that, that's real basics of what we're talking about, is you're going to infer that the next person is going to follow these statistics. Uh, so let's look at point estimation. Uh, it is a process of finding an approximate value for a population's parameter, like mean or average, from random samples of the population. Let's take an example of testing vaccines for COVID-19. Uh, vaccines and flu bugs, all that, it's a pretty big thing of how do you test these out and make sure they're going to work on the populace. A group of people are chosen from the population. Medical trials are performed. Results are generalized for the whole population. So here's our protected, here's our small group up here where we've selected them. We run medical trials on them and then the results work for the population. You know, nice diagram with the arrows going back and forth and the very scary COVID virus in the middle of one. And let's take a look at the applications of inferential statistics. Very central is what they call hypotheses testing. Uh, and the confidence interval, which go with that. And then as we get into probability, we get into our binomial theorem, our normal distribution, and central limit theorem. Hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing is used to measure the plausibility of a hypothesis, assumption, by using sample data. Now, when we talk about theorems, theory, hypothesis, uh, keep in mind that if you are in a philosophy class, theory is the same as hypothesis, where theorem is a scientific uh, statement that is something that has been proven, although it is always up for debate, because in science we always want to make sure things are up to debate. So a hypothesis is the same as a philosophical class calling a theory, where theory in science is not the same. Theory in science says this has been well proven. Gravity is a theory. Uh, so if you want to debate the theory of gravity, try jumping up and down. If you want to have a theory about why the economy is collapsing in your area, that is a philosophical debate. Very important. I've heard people mix those up, and it is a pet peeve of mine. When we talk about hypotheses testing, the steps involved in hypotheses testing is first we formulate a hypothesis. We figure out the right test to test our hypothesis. We execute the test, and we make a decision. And so when you're talking about a hypothesis, you're usually trying to disprove it. If you can't disprove it and it works for all the facts, then you might call that a theorem at some point. So in a use case, uh, let's consider an example. We have four students who are given a task to clean a room every day. <laughs> Sounds like working with my kids. They decided to distribute the job of cleaning the room among themselves. They did so by making four chits, which has their names on it, and the name that gets picked up has to do the cleaning for that day. Rob took the opportunity to make chits and wrote everyone's name on it. So here's our uh, four people, Nick, Rob, Imlia, Imlia, and Summer. Now Rick, Imlia, and Summer are asking us to decide whether Rob has done some mischief in preparing the chits, i.e. whether Rob has written his name on one of the chit. 
For that, we will find out the probability of Rob getting the cleaning job on first day, second day, third day, and so on till 12 days. The probability of Rob getting the job decreases every day, i.e., his turn never comes up, then definitely he has done some mischief while making the chits. So the probability of Rob not doing work on day one is uh, 3 out of 4. There's a 0.75 chance that he didn't do work. Uh, two days, 3 fourths times 3 fourths equals 0.56. Three days, you have three fourths, three fourths, three fourths, which equals 0.42. Uh, when you get to day 12, it's 0.032, which is less than 0.05. Remember this 0.05. Uh, that comes up a lot when we're talking about um, certain values, when we're looking at statistics. Rob is cheating as he wasn't chosen for 12 consecutive days. That's a very high probability when on day 12, he still hasn't gotten the job cleaning the room. So we come up to our important, important terminologies. We have null hypothesis, a general statement that states that there is no relationship between two measured phenomena or no association among the groups. Alternative hypothesis. Contrary to the null hypothesis, it states whenever something is happening, a new theory is preferred instead of an old one. And so the two hypotheses go hand in hand. Uh, so your null, this is always interesting in, in when talking about data science and the math behind it, it's about proving that the things have no correlation. Null hypothesis says these two have zero relation to each other. Where the alternative hypothesis says, hey, we found a relation, this is what it is. We have p-value. The p-value is a probability of finding the observed or more extreme results when the null hypothesis of a study question is true. And the t-value. It is simply the calculated difference represented in units of standard error. The greater the magnitude of t, the greater the evidence against the null hypothesis. And you can look at the t-value as being specific to the test you're doing, where the p-value is derived from your t-value and you're looking for what they call the 5% or the 0.05, showing that it has a high correlation. So digging in deeper, let's assume that a new drug is developed with the goal of lowering the blood pressure more than the existing drug. And this is a good one because uh, the null value here isn't that you don't have any drug. The null value here is that it's better than the existing drug. The new drug doesn't lower the blood pressure more than the existing drug. Now, if we get that, uh, that says our null hypothesis is correct, there is no correlation, and the new drug is not doing its job. The alternative hypothesis, the new drug does significantly lower the blood pressure more than the existing drug. Uh, yay, we got a new drug out there. And that's our alternative hypothesis, or the H1 or HA. And we look at the p-value, results from the evidence like medical trials showing positive results which will reject the null hypothesis. And again, they're looking for um, a 0.05 or 5%. And the t-value, comparing all the positive test results and finding means of different samples in order to test hypothesis. So this is specific to the test. How, uh, what percentage of increase did they have? And this leads us to the confidence intervals. Uh, a confidence interval is a range of values we are sure our true values of observations lie in. Let's say you asked a dog owner around you and asked them, how many cans of food do you buy for your, uh, per year for your dog? Through calculations, you got to know that the, on an average, around 95% of the people bought around 200 to 300 cans of food. Hence, we can say that we have a confidence interval of 2, 300, where 95% of our values lie in that data spread. Uh, and this, the graph really helps a lot, so you can start seeing what you're uh, looking at here, where you have the 95%, you have your peak, in this case it's a normal distribution, so you have the nice bell curve equal on both sides, it's not asymmetrical. And 95% of all the values lie within a very small range, and then you have your outliers, the 2.5% going each way. So we touched upon hypothesis, uh, and we're going to move into probability. Uh, so you have your hypothesis. Once you've generated your hypothesis, we want to know the probability of something occurring. Probability is a measure of the likelihood of an event to occur. Any event can be predicted with total certainty and can only be predicted as a likelihood of its occurrence. So any event cannot be predicted with total certainty. It can only be predicted as a likelihood of its occurrence. Uh, score prediction, how good you're going to do in uh, whatever uh, sport you're in, weather prediction, stock prediction... 
If you've studied physics and chaos theory, even the location of the chair you're sitting on has a probability that it might move three feet over. Granted, that probability is one in like, uh, uh, I think we calculated as under one in trillions upon trillions. So it's the better the probability, the more likely it's going to happen. There are some things that have such a low probability that we don't see them. So we talk about a random variable. A uh, random variable is a variable whose possible values are numerical outcomes of a random phenomena. So uh, we have the coin toss. How many heads will occur in the series of 20 coin flips? Probably, you know, the on average they're 10, but you really can't know because it's very random. How many times a red ball is picked from a bag of balls? If there's equal number of, of uh, red balls and blue balls and green balls in there. How many times is sum of digits on two dice uh, result are five each? Um, so, you know, there's how often are you going to roll two fives on your pair of dice? So in a use case, uh, let's consider the example of rolling two dice. We have a random variable outcome equals y. You can take values 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So we have a random variable and a combination of dice. And instead of looking at how many times um, both dice were roll five, let's go ahead and look at a uh, total sum of five. And you have, in, as far as your random variables, you can have a one, four equals five, four, one, two, three, three, two. So four of those rolls can be four. If you look at all the different options you have, four of those random rolls can be a five. And if we look at the total number, which happens to be 36 different options, uh, you can see that we have four out of 36 chance every time you roll the dice that you're going to roll a total of five. You're going to have an outcome of five. And uh, we'll look a little deeper as to what that means. Uh, but you could think of that at what point if someone never rolls a five or they always roll a five, can you say, hey, that person's probably cheating? Uh, we'll look a little closer at the math behind that. But let's just consider this is one of the cases is rolling two dice and gambling. There's also a binomial distribution. It is the probability of getting success or failure as an outcome in an experiment or trial that is repeated multiple times. And the key is, is by meaning two, binomial. Uh, so passing or failing an exam, winning or losing a game, and getting either head or tails. So if you ever see binomial distribution, it's based on a um, true-false kind of setup. You win or lose. Let's consider a uh, use case. And let's consider the game of football between two clubs, Barcelona and Dortmund. The teams will have to play a total of four matches, and we have to find out the chances of Barcelona winning the series. So we look at the total games, and we're looking at five different games or matches. Let's say that the winning chance for Barcelona is 75% or 0.75. That means that each game, they have a 75% chance that they're going to win that game. And losing chances are 25% or 0.25. Clearly 0.75 plus 0.25 equals 1. So that accounts for 100% of the game. Probability for getting K wins in N matches is calculated. And we, we're talking like, so if you have five games uh, and you want to know if I play, um, how many wins in those five games should I get? What's the percentage on those? And the probability for getting K wins in N matches is calculated by PX equals K equals NCK p to the k, q to the n minus k. Here, p is the probability of success, and q is the probability of failure. And so we can do total games of n equals 5, where k equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. p, which is the chance of winning, is 0.75. q, the chance of losing, equals 1 minus p, which equals 1 minus 0 0.075, which equals 0.25. The probability that Barcelona will lose all of the matches can then just plug in the numbers and we end up with a point zero 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 nine seven six five six two five. So a very small chance they're going to lose all their matches. And we can plug in uh, the value for two matches. Probability that Barcelona will win at least two matches is 0 0.0878. And of course we can go on to the probability that Barcelona will win three matches the 0.26, and of course, four matches, and so on. And it's always nice to take this information um, and let, let's find the accumulated discrete probabilities for each of the outcomes. Where Barcelona has won three or more matches, x equals three, x equals four, x equals five. And we end up with the p equals 0 0.264 plus 0 0.395 plus 237, which equals 0 0.89. 
in reality, the probability of Barcelona winning the series is much higher than 0.75. And it's always nice to uh, put out a nice graph so you can actually see the number of wins to the probability and how that pans out with our binomial case. Continuing in our important terminology, location. The location of the center of the graph depends on the mean value. And uh, this is some very important things. So much of the data we look at, and when you start looking at probabilities, almost always has a normalized look, like the graph in the middle. Uh, but you do have left skewed, where the data is skewed off to the left, and you have more stuff happening off to the left, and you have right skewed data. And so when this comes up and these probabilities come up where they're skewed, it's really important to take a closer look at that. Uh, mostly you end up with a normalized set of data, but you got to also be aware that sometimes it's a skewed data. And then the height. Height of the slope inversely depends upon the standard deviation. So you can see down here the standard deviation is really large. It kind of squishes it out. And if the standard deviation is small, then most of your data is going to hit right there in the middle. You're going to have a nice peak. Um, and so being aware of this, that you might have a probability that fits certain data, but it has a lot of outliers. So you're, if you have a really high standard deviation, um, if you're doing stock market analysis, this means your predictions are probably not going to make you much money. Uh, where if you have a very small deviation, you might be right on target and set to become a millionaire. Which leads us to the Z-score. Z-score tells you how far from the mean a data point is. It is measured in terms of standard deviations from the mean. Around 68% of the results are found between one standard deviation. Around 95% of the results are found between two standard deviations. And you read the symbols. Of course, they love to throw some Greek letters in there. We have uh, mu minus two sigma. Mu is just a quick way. It's that kind of funky U. It just means the mean. Uh, and then the sigma is the standard deviation, and that's the O with the little arrow off to the right, or the little waggly tail going up, the O with a, with a line on it. Uh, so mu minus 2 sigma is your 95% uh, of the results are found between two standard deviations. Central limit theorem, this goes back to the skew. If you remember, we were looking at the skew values on this previous slide have left skewed, normalized, and right skewed. When we're talking about it being skewed or not skewed, the distribution of the sample means will be approximately normally distributed, evenly distributed, not skewed, if you take large random samples from the population with the mean, mu, and the standard deviation, sigma, with replacement. And you can see here, um, uh, of course we have our uh, mu minus two sigma and the spread down here, the mean, the median, and the mode. And so when you're talking about very large populations, these numbers should come together and you shouldn't have a skewed value. If you do, that's a flag that something's wrong. That's why this is so important to be aware of what's going on with your data, where your samples are coming from, and uh, the math behind it. And if we're going to do all this, we got to jump into conditional probability. The conditional probability of an event A is a probability that the event will occur given the knowledge that an event B has already occurred. And you'll see this as Bayes' theorem, B-A-Y-E-S, Bayes. Uh, and this is red. I mean, you have these funky looking little P brackets, A, B. This is the probability of A being true while B is already true. And you have the probability of B being true when A is already true, so P, B of A. The probability of A being true divided by the probability of B being true. And we talk about Bayes' theorem, which occurred back in the 1800s when he discovered this. This is such an important formula. And it's really, it's not, if you actually do the math, you could just kind of do um, um, XY equals JK, and then you divide them out, and you're going to see the same math. But it works with probabilities, which makes it really nice. And so if you have a set, you might have uh, eight or nine different studies going on in different areas. Different people have done the studies. They brought them together. Um, if we look at today's uh, COVID virus, the virus spread, uh, certainly the studies done in China versus the studies the way they're done in the U.S., that data is different in each of those studies. But if you can find a place where it overlaps, where they're studying the same thing together, you can then compute the changes that you need to make in one study to make them equal. 
And this is also true if you have a study of uh, um, one group and you want to find out more about it. So this formula is very powerful, uh, and it really has to do with the data collection part of the math and data science and understanding where your data is coming from and how you're going to combine different studies in different groups. And we'll go ahead and go into a use case. Uh, let's find out the chance of a person getting lung disease due to smoking. Uh, and this is kind of interesting the way they word this. Um, let's say that according to medical report provided by the hospital, states that around 10% of all patients they treated suffered lung, lung disease. Uh, so we have kind of a generic medical report. They further found out uh, by a survey that 15% of the patients that visit them smoke. So we have 10% that are lung disease and 15% um, of the patients smoke. And finally, 5% of the people continued smoke even when they had lung disease. Uh, not the brightest choice, um, but you know it is an addiction, so it can be really difficult to kick. And so we can look at the probability of A. Uh, prior probability of 10% people having lung disease. And then probability B. Probability that a patient smokes is 15%. Uh, and the probability of B, um, if B, then A, the probability of a patient smokes even though they have lung disease is 5%. And probability of A is B, probability that the patient will have lung disease if they smoke. And then when you put the formulas together, uh, you get a nice solution here. You get uh, the probability of A of B, probability that the patient will have lung disease if they smoke. And you can just plug the numbers right in and we get a 3.33% uh, chance. Hence, there is a 3.33% chance that a person who smokes will get a lung disease. So we're going to pull up a little Python code. I'm always my favorite. Roll up the sleeves. Keep in mind, we're going to be doing this um, kind of like the back end way. So that you can see what's going on. And then later on, we're going to create, um, we'll get into another demo which shows you some of the tools that are already pre-built for this. Let's start by creating a, a set. So we're going to create a set with curly braces. This means that our set has um, only unique values. So you have a list, uh, you have your tuples which can never change, and then you have, um, in this case, the the set. So 4, 7, you can't create a 4, 7, comma 4. It'll delete the 4 out. So it's only unique values. And if you use dictionaries, quick reminder, this should look familiar because it is a dictionary. Uh, we have a value, and that value is assigned to, or that key is assigned to a value. Uh, so you can have a key value set up as a dictionary. So it's like a dictionary without the value. It's just the keys, and they all have to be unique. And if we run this, we have a uh, set of four, seven. We can also take a list, a regular um, setup, and I'm going to go ahead and just throw in another number in here, 4, and run it. Uh, and you can see here, if I take my list, 1, 2, 3, 4, 4, and I convert it to a set, and here it is, my set from list equals set, my list, the result is 1, 2, 3, 4. So it just deletes that last 4 right out of there. And with the sets, you can also go in there and um, print, here is my set, my set. Uh, three is in the set, and then if you do three in my set, that's going to be a logic function. Uh, and one in my set, six is not in the set, and so forth. If we run this, we get uh, three is in the set true, one is in the set false, because 357 is another one. Six is in the set, uh, six is not in the set, so not in my set. You can also use this with a list. We could have just used 357 and it would have um, the same response on there, is three in, usually you do if three is in, but three in my set is still works on a, just a regular list. And we'll go ahead and do a little iteration. We're gonna do kind of the dice one, remember um, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. And so we're going to bring in an iteration tool and import product as product. And uh, I'll show you what that means in just a second. So we have our two dice. We have dice A, and it's going to be a set of values. Um, you can only have one value for each one. That's why they put it in a set. And if you remember from range, it is up to 7. So this is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It will not include the 7. 
and the same thing for our dice B. And then we're going to do is we're going to create a list which is the product of A and B. So what's uh, A plus B. And if we go ahead and run this, uh, it'll print that out and you'll see um, in this case when they say product because it's an iteration tool, we're talking about creating a tuple of the two. So we've now created a tuple of all possible outcomes of the dice where dice A is 1, 2, 3, 1 to 6, and dice B is 1 to 6. And you can see 1 to 1, 1 to 2, 1 to 3, and so forth. And you remember we had a slide on this earlier where we talked about um, the different, all the different outcomes of a dice. We can play around with this a little bit. Uh, we can do in dice equals 2, dice faces 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, another way of doing what we did before, and then we can create an event space where we have a set, which is the product of the dice faces, repeat equals end dice. And we'll go ahead and just run this. And you can see here, it just, again, puts it through all the different possible variables we can have. And then if we wanted to take the same uh, set on here and print them all out like we had before, uh, we can just go through for outcome and event space, outcome and equals. So the event space is creating... Uh, sequence and as you can see here when we print it out it stacks them versus going through and putting them in a nice line and we'll go ahead and do something uh, let's go print since we have the end printing with a comma that just means uh, it's just going to it's not going to hit the return going down to the next line uh, and we'll go ahead and do the length of our event space uh, that'll be an important variable we're going to want to know in a minute and, of course, if I get carried away with my typing of length, uh, we'll print it twice and it'll give me an error. Uh, so we have 36 different possible variations here. And we might want to calculate something like, um, what about the multiple of 3? What if we want to have uh, the probability of the multiple of 3 in our setup? And so uh, we can put together the code for the outcome and event space of x, y equals outcome. If x plus y remainder 3, so we're going to divide by 3 and look at the remainder, and it equals 0, then it's a favorable outcome. And we're going to pop that outcome on the end there. And we'll turn it into a set. So the favorable outcome equals a set. Not necessary uh, because we know it's not going to be repeating itself, but just in case, we'll go ahead and do that. And if we want to print out the outcome, we can go ahead and see what that looks like. And you can see here, these are all uh, multiples of 3. Uh, 1 plus 2 is 3, 5 plus 4 is 9, which divided by 3 is 3, and so forth. And just like we looked up the length uh, of the one before, let's go ahead and print the length of our uh, F outcome. So we can see what that looks like. There we go. And, uh, of course, I did forget to add the print in the middle because we're looping through and putting an end on the on the setup on there. So we're going to put the print in there. And if I run this, you can see uh, um, we end up with 12. So we have 36 total options. Uh, we have 12 that are multiple that um, add up to a multiple of 3. And we can easily compute the probability of this uh, by simply taking the length of our favorable outcome over the length of the event space. And if we print it out, let me put that in there, probability, last line, so we can just type it in, we end up with a 0.3333 chance. And it's roughly a third. And we might want to make this look nice. So let's go ahead and put in another line there. The probability of getting the sum, which is a multiple of 3, is 0.3333. We can compute the same thing for 5 dice. And if we do this for 5 dice and go ahead and run it, uh, you can see we just have a huge amount of choices. Uh, so it just goes on and on down here. And we can look at the uh, length of the event space and we have over 7,776 choices. That's a lot of choices. 
And if we want to ask the question like we did above, uh, what is the sum where the sum is a multiple of five but not a multiple of three? We can go through all of these different options, and then uh, you can see here uh, d1, d2, d3, d4, d5 equals the outcome. And if uh, you add these all together and the division by 5 does not have a remainder of 0, but the remainder is also of a division by 3 is not equal to 0. So the multiple of 5 is equal to 0, but the multiple of 3 is not. We can just append that on here, and then we can look at that uh, favorable outcome. We'll go ahead and set that, and we'll just take a look at this. What's our length of our favorable outcome? It's always good to see what we're working with. And so we have 904 out of 776. And then, of course, we can just do a simple division to get the probability on here. What's the probability that we're going to roll a multiple of 5 when you add them together, but not a multiple of 3? And so we're just going to divide those two numbers. And you can see here we get uh, 0.116255 or 11.62%. And so you can really have a nice visual that this is not really complicated math right here on probabilities. Uh, it's just how many options do you have and how many of those are you possibly going to be able to um, come up with with the solution you're looking for. And this leads us to a confusion matrix. A confusion matrix is a table which is used to describe the performance of a classification model on a set of test data for which the true values are known. And so you'll see on the left we have the predicted and the actual. And we have a negative, uh, false negative, positive, true positive, um, and then we have false positive and true negative. And you can think of this as your predicted model. What does that mean? That means if you divided your data and you used two-thirds of it to create the model, you might then test it against an actual case for the last third to see how well it comes out. How many times was it uh, true positive versus uh, false positive? It gave a false positive response. And you can imagine in medical uh, situations, this is a pretty big deal. You don't want to give a false positive. So you might adjust your model ac accordingly so you don't have a false positive. Say with a COVID virus test, it'd be better to have a false negative and they go back and get retested than to have 30% false positives where then the test is pretty much invalid. So in a use case uh, like cancer prediction, let's consider an example where a cancer prediction model is put to the test for its accuracy and precision. Actual result of a person's medical report is compared with the prediction made by the machine learning model. And so you can see here, here's our actual predicted, uh, whether they have cancer or not. You know, cancer, a big one, you don't want to have a uh, false positive. I mean a false negative. In other words, you don't want to have it tell you that you don't have cancer when you do. So that would be something you'd really be looking for in this particular domain. You don't want a false negative. Uh, and this is again, you know, you've created a model, you have uh, hundreds of people or thousands of uh, pieces of data that come in. There's a real famous case study where they have the imagery and all the measurements they take, and there's about 36 different measurements they take. And then if you run the uh, a basic model, you want to know just how accurate it is. How many um, negative results do you have that are either telling people they have cancer that don't or telling people that don't have cancer that they do. And then we can take these numbers and we can feed them into our accuracy, our precision, and our recall. Uh, so accuracy, precision, and recall, accuracy metric to measure how accurately the results are predicted. And this is your um, total um, true, where you got the right results, you add them together, the true positive, the true negative, over all the results. So what percentage of them were accurate versus what were wrong. When we talk about precision, is a metric to measure how many of the correctly predicted cases are actually turned out to be positive. Uh, so we have a precision on true positive. Again, if you're talking about like uh, COVID t testing, with the viruses, uh, you really want this to be a, a high number. You want this true um, that to be the center point, where you might have the opposite if you're dealing with uh, cancer, where you want no false negatives. Uh, so this is your metric on here. Precision is your test positive, uh, true positive plus uh, false positive. 
and then your recall, how many of the actual positive cases we were able to predict quickly with our model. Uh, so test positive is the test positive plus the false negative on there. And we'll want to go ahead and do a demo on the naive Bayes classifier. Before I get too far into uh, naive Bayes classifier, because we're going to pull it from the SK Learn or the uh, Scikit, um, let's go ahead. Kind of an interesting page here for classifiers. When you go into the SK Learn kit, there's a lot of ways to do classification. And I'll just zoom up in here so you can see some of the titles. Uh, there's everything from the nearest neighbor, linear, uh, but we're going to be focusing on the naive bays over here. And this is just a, a sample data set that they put together, and you can see how some of these have a very different output. The naive bays, remember, is set up as probably the most simplified uh, calculator or um, set of predictions out there. And so what we've been talking about with the true-false and stuff like that, where there's a... Uh, and then a belief that there is a independent assumption between the features, where the features are very assumed to have some kind of connection, uh, then we can go ahead and use that for the prediction. And so that's what we're using as a naive Bayes classifier versus many of the other classifiers that are out there. For this, we're going to use uh, the social network ads. It's a little data set on here. And uh, let me go ahead and just open that up, the file. Uh, here we go. It has user ID, gender, age, estimated salary, uh, purchased. And so we have, you can see the user ID, male, 19, uh, estimated salary, 19,000, and purchased zero. Uh, so it's either going to make a purchase or not. So look at that last one, zero, one, we should be thinking of binomials. We should be thinking of a uh, simple naive Bayes classifier kind of setup. So if we close this out, we're going to go ahead and import our NumPy as NP. We're going to nice to have a, a good visual of our data, so we'll put in our matplot library. Here's our pandas, our data frame. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and import the data set. And the data set's going to be, we're going to read it from the social network ads.csv. Then we're going to print the head just so you can see it again, uh, even though I showed you it in the file. And x equals the data set i location. Uh, two, three values, and Y is going to be the four, uh, column four. Let me just run this so it's a little easier to go over that. Um, you can see right here we're going to be looking at uh, zero, one, two is age and estimated salary, so two, three. And that's what I location just means um, that we're looking at the number versus a regular location. Uh, regular location, you'd actually say age and estimated salary. And then column four is, did they make a purchase? They purchased something. Uh, so those are the three columns we're going to be looking at when we do this. And we've gone ahead and imported these and imported the data. So now our data set is all set with this information in it. And we'll need to go ahead and split the data up. Uh, so we need our, from the SK Learn model selection, we can import train test split. Uh, this does a nice job. We can set the random state so it randomly picks the data. And we're just going to take 25% uh, of it's going to go into the test, our X test and our Y test, and the 75% will go to X train and Y train. And that way, once we create our model, we can then have data to see just how accurate or how well it has performed with our um, prediction. The next step in pre-processing our data is to go ahead and do feature scaling. Now, a lot of this is start to look familiar. If you've done a number of the other modules and setup, you should start noticing that we bring in our data, we take a look at what we're working with, uh, we go ahead and split it up into training and testing. Uh, in this case, we're going to go ahead and scale it. Scale it means we're putting it between a value of minus one and one, uh, or someplace in the middle ground there. And this way, if you have any huge set, you don't have this huge, um, Setup. If we go back up to here where salary, uh, salary is 20,000 versus age 35. Well, there's a good chance with a lot of the back end math that 20,000 will skew the results and the estimated salary will have a higher impact than the age instead of balancing them out and letting the calculations weigh them properly. And finally, we get to actually create our um, naive Bayes model. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and import the Gaussian Naive Bayes. 
And the Gaussian is, is uh, the most basic one. That's what we're looking at now. It turns out, though, if you go to the SK um, Learn kit, uh, they have a number of different ones you can pull in there. There's uh, um, Bernoulli. I'm not, I've never used that one. Categorical. Um, Complement. And here's our Gaussian. Uh, so there's a number of different options you can look at. Gaussian, when you come to the naive bays, is the most commonly used. Uh, so when we're talking about the naive bays. That's usually what people are talking about when they, when they're pulling this in. And one of the nice things about the Gaussian, if you go to their website, um, to SK Learn, the naive bays Gaussian, there's a lot of cool features. One of them is you can do partial fit on here. Um, that means if you have a huge amount of data, you don't have to process it all at once. You, once you can batch it into the Gaussian, uh, NB model. And there's many other different things you can do with it as far as fitting the data and how you um, manipulate it. We're just doing the basics. So we're going to go ahead and create our classifier. We're going to equal the Gaussian NB. And then we're going to do a fit. We're going to fit our uh, training data and our training solution. So X train, Y train. And we'll go ahead and run this. Uh, it's going to tell us that it, it ran the code right there. And now we have our trained classifier model. So the next step is we need to go ahead and run a prediction. We're going to do our y predict equals the classifier dot predict x test. So here we fit the data and now we're going to go ahead and predict. And now we get to our confusion matrix. Uh, so from the SK learn matrix metrics you can import your confusion matrix. Just as saves you from doing all the simple math that does it all for you. And then we'll go ahead and create our confusion metrics with the Y test and the Y predict. So we have our actual and we have our predicted value. And you can see from here, this is the chart we looked at. Here's predicted. So true positive, false positive, false negative, true negative. And if we go ahead and run this, there we have it. 65, 3, 7, 25. And in this particular uh, prediction, we had 65 uh, were predicted the truth as far as a, a purchase. They're going to make a purchase. And we guessed three wrong. And then we had 25 we predicted would not purchase, and seven of them did. So there's our, our uh, confusion matrix. At this point, if you were uh, with your shareholders or a board meeting, um, you would start to hear some snoozing if they were looking at the numbers. And you say, hey, here's my confusion mat uh, matrix. So let's go ahead and visualize the results. And we're going to pull from the Matplot library colors, import listed color map. Um, and this is actually, uh, my machine's going to throw an error because this is being, um, because of the way the setup is. Uh, I have a newer version on here than when they uh, put together the demo. And we need our um, X set and our Y set, which is our X train and Y train. And then we'll create our X1, X2. And we'll put that into a grid, uh, and we set our X set uh, minimum stop and our X set max stop. And if you come all the way over here, we're going to step 0.01. This is going to give us a nice line, uh, is what that's doing. And then we're going to plot the contour, uh, plot the X limit, plot the Y limit, and put the scatter plot in there. Now let's go ahead and run this. Uh, to be honest, when I'm doing these graphs, there's so many different ways to do that. There's so many different ways to put this code together. To show you what we're doing, it's uh, a lot easier to pull up the graph and then go back up and explain it. So the first thing we want to note here when we're looking at the data is this is the training set. And so we have those who didn't make a purchase. We've drawn a nice area for that. That's, that's defined by the naive Bayes setup. And then we have those who did make a purchase, the green. And you can see that some of the green dots fall into the red area and some of the red dots fall into the green. So even our training set isn't going to be 100%. Uh, we couldn't do that. And so when we're looking at our different data coming down. Uh, we can kind of arrange our X1, X2 so we have a nice plot going on. And then we're going to create the um, contour. That's that nice line that's drawn down the middle on here with the red green. Um, that's where that's what this is doing right here with the reshape. And notice that we had to uh, do the dot t. If you remember from numpy, um, if you did the numpy module, um, you end up with pairs, you know, x uh, x1, x2, 
x1, x2, next row, and so forth, you have to flip it so it's all one row. You have all your x1s and all your x2s. Um, so this is what we're kind of looking for right here on this setup. Uh, and then the scatter plot is, of course, um, your scattered data across there. We're just going through all the points. That puts these nice little dots onto our setup on here. And we have our estimated salary and our age. And then, of course, the dots are, did they make a purchase or not? And just a quick note, this is kind of funny. You can see up here where it says X set, Y set equals uh, X train, Y train, which seems kind of a little weird to do. Um, this is because this is probably originally a definition. Uh, so it's its own module that could be called over and over again. And which is really a good way to do it because the next thing we're going to want to do is do the exact same thing where we're going to visualize the test set results. Uh, that way we can see what happened with our test group, our 25%. And you can see down here we have um, the test set. Uh, and it, if you look at the two graphs next to each other, this one obviously has 75% um, of the data. So it's going to show a lot more. And this is only 25% of the data. You can see that there's a number that are kind of on the edge as to whether they could guess by age and income they're going to make a purchase or not. Uh, but that said, it still is pretty clear. It's pretty good as far as how much the estimate is and how good it does. Now, graphs are really effective for showing people what's going on. But you also need to have the numbers. And so we're going to do from sklearn, we're going to import metrics. And then we're going to print our metrics classification port from the Y test and the Y predict. And you can see here we have precision. Uh, precision of zeros is 90. There's our recall, 0.96. We have an F1 score and a support. And we have our precision, the recall on getting it right. Uh, and then we can do our accuracy, the macro average, and the weighted average. Uh, so you can see that it, it pulls in pretty good as far as um, how accurate it is. You could say it's going to be about 90% is going to guess correctly um, that, it, that they're not going to purchase. And we had an 89% chance that they are going to purchase. Um, and then the other numbers as you get down have a little bit different meaning, but it's pretty straightforward on here. Here's our accuracy and here's our micro average and the weighted average and everything else you might need. And if you forgot the exact definition of accuracy, it is the true positive, true negative over all of the different setups. Precision is your true positive over all positives, true and false. And recall is a true positive over true positive plus false negative. And we can just real quick flip back there so you can see those numbers on here. Uh, here's our precision, here's our recall, and here's our accuracy on this. We're going to cover reinforcement learning today. And what's in it for you? We'll start with why reinforcement learning. We'll look at what is reinforcement learning. We'll see what the different kinds of learning strategies are that are being used today in computer models under supervised versus unsupervised versus reinforcement. We'll cover important terms specific to reinforcement learning. We'll talk about Markov's decision process and we'll take a look at a reinforcement learning example while we'll teach a tic-tac-toe how to play. Why reinforcement learning? Training a machine learning model requires a lot of data, which might not always be available to us. Further, the data provided might not be reliable. Learning from a small subset of actions will not help expand the vast realm of solutions that may work for a particular problem. You can see here we have the robot learning to walk. Um, very complicated setup when you're learning how to walk and you'll start asking questions like if I'm taking one step forward and left well, what happens if I pick up a 50 pound object how does that change how a robot would walk these things are very difficult to program because there's no actual information on it until the, it's actually tried out learning from a small subset of actions will not help expand the vast realm of solutions that may work for a particular problem and we'll see here it learned how to walk this is going to slow the growth that technology is capable of. Machines need to learn to perform actions by themselves and not just learn off humans. And you see the objective climb a mountain. A real interesting point here is that as human beings we can go into a very unknown environment and we can adjust for it and kind of explore and play with it. Most of the models, the non-reinforcement models in computer uh, machine learning, 
aren't able to do that very well. Uh, there's a couple of them that can be used or integrated. To see how it goes is what we're talking about with reinforcement learning. So what is reinforcement learning? Reinforcement learning is a sub-branch of machine learning that trains a model to return an optimum solution for a problem by taking a sequence of decisions by itself. Consider a robot learning to go from one place to another. The robot is given a scenario and must arrive at a solution by itself. The robot can take different paths to reach the destination. It will know the best path by the time taken on each path. It might even come up with a unique solution all by itself. And that's really important is we're looking for unique solutions. Uh, we want the best solution, but you can't find it unless you try it. So when we're looking at uh, our different systems, our different model. We have supervised versus unsupervised versus reinforcement learning. And with the supervised learning, that is probably the most controlled environment. Uh, we have a lot of different supervised learning models, whether it's linear regression, neural networks. Um, there's all kinds of things in between, decision trees. The data provided is labeled data with output values specified. And this is important because when we talk about supervised learning, you already know the answer for all this information. You already know the picture has a motorcycle in it, so you're supervised learning. You already know that um, the outcome for tomorrow, for you know, going back a week, you're looking at stock, you can already have like the graph of what the next day looks like, so you have an answer for it. And you have labeled data which is used, you have an external supervision, and solves problems by mapping labeled input to known output. So very controlled. Unsupervised learning, and unsupervised learning is really interesting because it's now taking part in many other models. They start with, an, you can actually insert an unsupervised learning model um, in almost either supervised or reinforcement learning as part of the system, which is really cool. Uh, data provided is unlabeled data. The outputs are not specified. Machine makes its own predictions. Used to solve association with clustering problems, unlabeled data is used, no supervision, solves problems by understanding patterns and discovering output. Uh, so you can look at this and you can think um, some of these things go with each other. They belong together. So it's looking for what connects in different ways. And there's a lot of different algorithms that look at this. Um, when you start getting into those, there's some really cool images that come up of what unsupervised learning is. How it can pick out, say, uh, the area of a donut. One model will see the area of the donut, and the other one will divide it into three sections based on its location versus what's next to it. So there's a lot of stuff that goes in with unsupervised learning. And then we're looking at reinforcement learning. Probably the biggest industry in today's market uh, in machine learning or growing market. It's very, in its very infant stage uh, as far as how it works and what it's going to be capable of. The machine learns from its environment using rewards and errors. Used to solve reward-based problems. No predefined data is used. No supervision. Follows trail and error problem solving approach. Uh, so again, we have a random, we, at first you start with a random, I try this, it works, and this is my reward, doesn't work very well maybe, or maybe it doesn't even get you where you're trying to get it to do, and you get your reward back, and then it looks at that and says, well, let's try something else, and it starts to play with these different things, finding the best route. So let's take a look at important terms in today's reinforcement model. And this has become pretty standardized over the last uh, few years, so these are really good to know. We have the agent. Uh, agent is the model that is being trained via reinforcement learning. So this is your actual uh, entity that has, however you're doing it, whether you're using a neural network or a, a Q table or whatever, combination thereof, this is the actual agent that you're using. This is the model. And you have your environment. Uh, the training situation that the model must op optimize to is called its environment. Uh, and you can see here, I guess we have a robot who's trying to get a uh, chest full of gyms or whatever, and that's the output. And then you have your action. This is all possible steps that can be taken by the model, and it picks one action. And you can see here that it's picked three different uh, routes to get to the chest of uh, diamonds and gems. We have a state, the current position condition returned by the model. And you could look at this uh, if you're playing like a video game, this is the screen you're looking at. Uh, so when you go back here, uh, the environment is a whole game board. So if you're playing one of those Mobius games, 
you might have the whole game board going on, uh, but then you have your current position. Where are you on that game board? What's around that? What's around you? Um, if you were talking about a robot, the environment might be moving around the yard, where it is in the yard and what it can see, what input it has in that location. That would be the current position condition returned by the model. And then the reward. Uh, to help the model move in the right direction, it is rewarded. Points are given to it to appraise some kind of action. So, yeah, you did good, or if, uh, didn't do as good, trying to maximize the reward and have the best reward possible. And then policy. Policy determines how an agent will behave at any time. It acts as a mapping between action and present state. This is part of the model. What, what, what is your action that you're, you're going to take? What's the policy you're using to have an output from your agent? One of the reasons they separate uh, policy as its own entity is that you usually have a prediction um, of a different options and then the policy well how am I going to pick the best based on those predictions I'm going to guess at different options and we'll actually weigh those options in and find the best option we think will work uh, so it's a little tricky but the policy thing is actually pretty cool how it works let's go ahead and take a look at a reinforcement learning example and just in looking at this we're going to take a look uh, consider what a dog um, that we want to train. Uh, so the dog would be like the agent. So you have your, your puppy or whatever. Uh, and then your environment is going to be the whole house or whatever it is where you're training them. And then you have an action. We want to teach the dog to fetch. So action equals fetching. Uh, and then we have a little biscuit so we can get the dog to perform various actions by offering incentives such as a dog biscuit as a reward. The dog will follow a policy to maximize this reward and hence will follow every command and might even learn new actions like begging by itself. Uh, so, you have you know, so we start off with fetching, it goes, oh, I get a biscuit for that. It tries something else and you get a handshake or begging or something like that. And it goes, oh, this is also reward based. And so it kind of explores things to find out what will bring it as biscuit. And that's very much like how a reinforced model goes is it, uh, looks for different rewards. How do I find, can I try different things and find a reward that works? The dog also will want to run around and play and explore its environment. Uh, this quality of model is called exploration. So there's a little randomness going on in exploration. It explores new parts of the house. Climbing on the sofa doesn't get a reward. In fact, it usually gets kicked off the sofa. <laughs> so Let's talk a little bit about Markov's decision process. Uh, Markov's decision process is a reinforcement learning policy used to map a current state to an action where the agent continuously interacts with the environment to produce new solutions and receive rewards. And you'll see here's all of our different uh, uh, vocabulary we just went over. We have a reward, our state, our agent, our environment, and our action. And so even though the environment kind of contains everything, um, that you, you really, when you're actually writing the program, your environment's going to put out a reward in state that goes into the agent. Uh, the agent then looks at this uh, state, or it looks at the reward usually um, first, and it says, okay, I got rewarded for whatever I just did, or I didn't get rewarded. And then it looks at the state, <clears throat> and then it comes back, and if you remember from policy, the policy comes in, um, and then we have a reward. The policy is that part that's connected at the bottom. And so it looks at that policy and it says, hey, what's a good action that will probably be similar to what I did, or um, uh, sometimes they're completely random, but what's a good action that's going to bring me a different reward? So taking the time to just understand these different pieces as they go is pretty important in most of the models today. Um, and so a lot of them actually have templates based on this you can pull in and start using um, pretty straightforward as far as once you start seeing how it works uh, you can see your environment sends it says hey this is the agent did this if you're a character in a game this happened and it shoots out a reward in a state the agent looks at the reward looks at the new state and then takes a little guess and says I'm gonna try this action and then that action goes back into the environment it affects the environment the environment then changes depending on what the action was and then it has a new state and a new reward that goes back to the agent. 
So in the diagram shown, we need to find the shortest path between node A and D. Each path has a reward associated with it, and the path with a maximum reward is what we want to choose. The nodes A, B, C, D denote the nodes to travel from node uh, A to B is an action. Reward is the cost of each path, and policy is each path taken. And you can see here, A can go uh, to B, or A can go to C right off the bat, or it can go right to D. And if you explored all three of these, uh, you would find that A going to D was a zero reward, um, A going to C and D would generate a different reward, or you could go A, C, B, D. There's a lot of options here. Um, and so when we start looking at this diagram, you start to realize that even though uh, today's reinforced learning models do really good at um, finding an answer, they end up trying almost all the different directions you see. And so they take up a lot of work uh, or a lot of processing time for reinforcement learning. They're right now in their infant stage and they're really good at solving simple problems. And we'll take a look at one of those in just a minute in a tic-tac-toe game. Uh, but you can see here, uh, once it's gone through these and it's explored, it's going to find the A, C, D is the best reward. It gets a full 30 points for it. So let's go ahead and take a look at a reinforcement learning demo. Uh, in this demo, we're going to use reinforcement learning to make a tic-tac-toe game. You will be playing this game against the machine learning model. And we'll go ahead, we're doing it in Python. So let's go ahead and go through, um, I always, uh, not always, I actually have a lot of Python tools. Let's go through um, Anaconda, which will open up a Jupyter Notebook. Seems like a lot of steps, but it's worth it to keep all my stuff separate. And it also has a nice display when you're in the Jupyter Notebook for doing Python. So here's our Anaconda Navigator. I open up the notebook, which is going to take me to a web page. And I've gone in here and created a new uh, Python folder. In this case, I've already done it and enabled it to change the name to Tic-Tac-Toe. Uh, and then for this example, uh, we're going to go ahead and import a couple things. We're going to um, import NumPy as NP. We'll go ahead and import Pickle. NumPy, of course, is our number array. And then uh, Pickle is just a nice way sometimes for storing uh, different information, uh, different states that we're going to go through on here. Uh, and so we're going to create a class called state. We're going to start with that. And there's a lot of uh, lines of code to this uh, class that we're going to put in here. Don't let that scare you too much. There's not as much here. Uh, it looks like there's going to be a lot here, but there really is just a lot of setup going on in, the, in our class state. And so we have up here, we're going to initialize it. Um, we have our board. Um, it's a tic-tac-toe board, so we're only dealing with nine spots on the board. Uh, we have player one, player two uh, is end. We're going to create a board hash. Uh, we'll look at that in just a minute. We're just going to store some information in there. Symbol of player equals one. Um, so there's a few things going on as far as the initialization. Uh, then something simple, we're just going to get the hash um, of the board. We're going to get the information from the board on there, which is uh, columns and rows. We want to know when a winner occurs. Uh, so if you get three in a row, that's what this whole section here is for. Um, let me go ahead and scroll up a little bit. And you can get a copy of this code if you send a note over to Simply Learn. We'll send you over um, this particular file, and you can play with it yourself and see how it's put together. I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on this uh, because this is just some real general Python coding. Uh, but you can see here we're just going through um, all the rows and you add them together and if it equals three, three in a row. Same thing with columns. Um, diagonal, so you got to check the diagonal. That's what all this stuff does here is it just goes through the different areas. Actually, let me go ahead and put... Um, and then it comes down here and we do our sum and it says true, uh, minus three, it just says did somebody win or is it a tie? So you got to add up all the numbers on there anyway just in case they're all filled up. And next we also need to know available positions. Um, these are ones that don't, no one's ever used before. This way when you try something or the computer tries something, uh, it's not going to give it an illegal move. That's what the available positions is doing. Uh, then we want to update our state. And so you have your position going in. We're just sending in the position that you just chose. And you'll see there's a little user interface we put in there. You can 
pick the uh, row and column in there. And again, I mean, this is a lot of code. Uh, so really, it's kind of a thing you'd want to go through and play with a little bit and just read through it, get a copy of it. Uh, great way to understand how this works. And here is a given reward. Um, so we're going to give a reward, result equals self winner. This is one of the hearts of what's going on here. Uh, is we have a, have a result self dot winner. So if there's a winner, then we have a result. If the result equals one, here's our feedback. Uh, if it doesn't equal one, then it gets a zero. So it only gets a reward in this particular case if it wins. And that's important to know because different uh, systems of reinforced learning do rewarding a lot differently depending on what you're trying to do. This is a very simple example with a 3x3 three three board. Imagine if you're playing a video game, uh, certainly you only have so many actions, but your environment is huge. You have a lot going on in the environment. And suddenly a reward system like this is going to be just... Um, it's going to have to change a little bit. It's going to have to have different rewards and different setup. And there's all kinds of advanced ways to do that as far as weighing, you add weights to it. And so they can add the weights up depending on where the reward comes in. So it might be that you actually get a reward. In this case, you get the reward at the end of the game. And I'm spending just a little bit of time on this because this is an important thing to note. But there's different ways to add up those rewards. It might have, like if you take a certain path, um, the first re reward is going to be weighed a little bit less than the last reward because the last reward is actually winning the game or scoring or whatever it is. So this reward system gets really complicated in some of the more advanced uh, setups. Um, in this case though, you can see right here that they give a, a, a 0.1 and a 0.5 reward um, just for getting a, picking the right value and something that's actually valid instead of picking an invalid value. So rewards, uh, again, that's like key. It's huge. How do you feed the rewards back in? Um, then we have a board reset. That's pretty straightforward. It just goes back and resets the board to the beginning because it's going to try out all these different things while it's learning. It's going to do it by uh, trial and error, so you have to keep resetting it. And then, of course, there's the play. We want to go ahead and play uh, rounds equals 100. Depends on what you want to do on here. Um, you can set this different you can obviously set that to higher level. But this is just going to go through, and you'll see in here, uh, that we have player one and player two. This is, this is the computer playing itself. Uh, one of the more powerful ways to learn to play a game, or even learn something that isn't a game, is to have two of these models that are basically trying to beat each other. And so they always, they keep finding, explore new things. This one works for this one. So this one tries new things. It beats this. We've seen this in um, chess, I think was a big one, where they had the two players in chess with reinforcement learning. Uh, it was one of the ways they trained one of the top um, computer chess playing algorithms. Uh, so this is just what this is. It's going to choose an action. It's going to try something. And the more it tries stuff, um, the more we're going to record the hash, we actually have a board hash where they self get the hash set up on here where it stores all the information. And then once you get to a win, one of them wins, it gets the reward. Uh, then we go back and reset and try again. And then kind of the fun part we actually get down here is uh, we're going to play with a human. So we'll get a chance to come in here and see what that looks like when you put your own information in. And then it just comes in here and does the same thing it did above. It gives it a reward for its things um, or sees if it wins or ties. Um, looks at available positions, all that fun of fun stuff. And then finally we want to show the board. Uh, so it's going to print the board out each time. Really, um, as an integration, is not that exciting. What's exciting uh, in here is, one, looking at this reward system. Whoops, play one more up. The reward system is really the heart of this. How do you reward the different uh, setup? And the other one is when it's playing, it's got to take an action. And so what it chooses for an action is also the heart of reinforcement learning. How do we choose that action? And those are really key to right now where reinforcement learning is um, in today's uh, technology is uh, figuring this out. 
How do we reward it? And how do we guess the next best action? So we have our uh, environment, and you can see the environment is we're going to be, or the state, uh, which is kind of like uh, what's going on. We're going to return the state depending on what happens. And we want to go ahead and create our agent, uh, in this case, our player. So each one is, let me go ahead and grab that. And so we look at a class player. Um, this is where a lot of the magic is really going on. Is what it, How is this player figuring out how to maneuver around the board? And then the board, of course, returns a state uh, that it can look at and a reward. Uh, so we want to take a look at this. We have uh, name, uh, self-state. This is class player. And when you say class player, we're not talking about a human player. We're talking about um, just a, uh, the computer players. And this is kind of interesting. So remember I told you, depending on what you're doing, there's going to be a decay gamma. Um, Explore rate. Uh, these are what I'm talking about is how do we train it. Um, as you try different moves, it gets to the end. The first move is important, but it's not as, as important as the last one. And so you could say that um, the last one has the heaviest weight. And then as you, as you get there, the first one, let's see, the first move gives you a five reward. The second gives you a two reward. And the third one gives you a ten reward because that's the final ending. You got it the 10 is going to count more than the first step. Uh, and here's our, uh, we're going to you know, get the board information coming in, and then choose an action. This was the second part that I was talking about that was so important. Uh, so once you have your training going on, we have to do a little randomness, and you can see right here is our NP random uh, uniform. So it's picking out a, a random number. Take a random action. This is going to just pick uh, which row and which column it is. Um, and so choosing the action, this one you can see we're just doing random states, um, choice, length of positions, action position. And then it skips in there and takes a look at the board uh, for P and positions. And you get, it's actually storing the different boards each time you go through. So it has a record of what it did so it can properly weigh the values. And this simply just appends a hash state. What's the last state? Pin it to the uh, uh, to our states on here. Here's our feedback reward. So the reward comes in, and it's going to take a look at this and say, is it none? Uh, what is the reward? And here is that formula. Remember I was telling you about up here um, that was important because it has decay gamma times the reward. This is where as it goes through each step, and this is really important, this is this is kind of the heart of this, of what I was talking about earlier. Uh, you have step one, and this might have a reward of two. You have step two, I should, probably should have done ABC. This has a step three, uh, step four, and so on, until you get to step in. And this might have a reward of 10. Uh, so re reward of 10, we're going to add that, but we're not adding, uh, let's say this one right here, uh, let's say this reward here right before 10 was, um, let's say it's also 10. That just makes the, the uh, math easy. So we had 10 and 10. Uh, we had 10, this is 10 and 10 in, whatever it is, but it's time it's 0.9. Uh, so instead of putting a full 10 here, we only do 9. That's uh, 0.9 times 10. And so this formula, um, as far as the decay times the reward minus the cell state value, uh, it basically adds in, it says here's one, or here's two, I'm sorry, I should have done this ABC, it would have been easier. Uh, so the first move goes in here and it puts two in here. Uh, then we have our self uh, set up on here. You can see how this gets pretty complicated in the math, but this is really the key, is how do we train our states? And we want the, the final state, the win, to get the most points. If you win, you get most points. Um, and the first step gets the least amount of points. So you're really training this almost in reverse. You're training, you're training it from the last place where you have, like it says, okay, this is now where I wear, need to sum up my rewards. And I want to sum them up going in reverse, and I want to find the answer in reverse. Kind of an interesting uh, uh, play on the mind when you're trying to figure this stuff out. And, of course, we want to go ahead and reset the board down here, uh, save the policy, load policy. 
these are the different things that are going in between the agent and the state to figure out what's going on. Let's go ahead and load that up. And then finally, we want to go ahead and create a human player. And the human player is going to be a little different uh, in that uh, you choose an action, row and column. Here's your action. Uh, if action is if action in positions, meaning positions that are available, uh, you return the action. If not, it just keeps asking you until you get the action that actually works. And then we're going to go ahead and append to the hash state, which uh, we don't need to worry about because it returns the action up here. And feed forward. Uh, again, this is because it's a human. Uh, at the end of the game, bat propagate and update state values. This part isn't being done because it's not programming uh, the model. Uh, the model is getting its own rewards. So we've gone ahead and loaded this in here. Uh, so here's all our pieces. And the first thing we want to do is set up uh, P1 player 1, uh, P2 player 2. And then we're going to send our players to our state. So now it has P1, P2. And it's going to play, and it's going to play 50,000 rounds. Now, we can probably do a lot less than this, and it's not going to get the full results. In fact, you know what? Uh, let's go ahead and just do five, um, just to play with it, because I want to show you something here. Oops. Somewhere in there I forgot to load something. There we go. I must have stopped, forgot to run this. Run. Oops, forgot a reference there for the board, rows and columns, 3 by 3. Um, there is actually in the state, it references that. We can just tack it on on the end. It was supposed to be at the beginning. Uh, so now I've only set this up with, um, let's see, where are we going here? I've only set this up to train five times. And the reason I did that is we're going to come in and actually play it and then I'm going to change that and we can see how it differs on there. There we go. And then you make it through a run and we're going to go ahead and save the policy. Um, so now we have our player one and our player two policy. Uh, the way we set it up it has two separate policies loaded up in there. And then we're going to come in here and we're going to do uh, player one is going to be the computer experience rate zero load policy one human player human and we're going to go ahead and play this. Now remember I only went through it um, uh, just one round of training in fact minimal training and so it puts an X there and I'm going to go ahead and do row 0 column 1. And you can see this is very uh, basic on here and so I put in my 0 and then I'm going to go 0 block it 0 0 and you can see right here it let me win. Uh, just like that, I was able to win. Zero, two, and woo, human wins. So I only trained it five times. We're going to run this again, and this time, uh, instead of five, let's do 5,000 or 50,000. I think that's what the guys in the back had. And this takes a while to train it. This is where reinforcement learning really falls apart. Look how simple this game is. We're talking about a three by three set of columns. And so for me to train it on this, um, I could do a queue table which would take which would go much quicker. Um, you could build a quick queue table with almost all the different options on there and uh, you would probably get a, the same result much quicker. We're just using this as an example. So when we look at reinforcement learning, you need to be very careful what you apply it to. It sounds like a good deal until you do like a large neural network where you're doing, um, you set the neural network to a learning increment of one. So every time it goes through, it learns. And then you do your actions. So you pick from the learning uh, setup and you actually try actions on the learning setup until you get the, what you think is going to be the best action. So you actually feed what you think is right back through the neural network. There's a whole layer there, which is really fun to play with. And then it has an output. Well, think of all those processes. I mean, that is just a huge amount of work it's going to do. Uh, let's go ahead and skip ahead here. And give it a moment. It's going to take a, a, few, a minute or two to go ahead and run. Now, to train it, uh, we went ahead and let it run. 
and it took a while. This this took um, I got a pretty powerful processor, and it took about five minutes plus to run it. And we'll go ahead and uh, run our player setup on here. Oops, I brought in the last. <laughs> Whoops, I brought in the last round. So give me just a moment to re do the policy save. There we go. I forgot to save the policy back in there. And then go ahead and run our player again. So we've, we've saved the policy, and then we want to go ahead and load the policy for P1 as a computer. And we can see the computer's gone in the bottom right corner. I'm going to go ahead and go 1-1, uh, one, one, which is the center. And it's gone right up the top, and if you have ever played tic-tac-toe, you know the computer has me. Uh, but we'll go ahead and play it out. Row 0, column 2. There it is, and then it's gone here, and so I'm going to go ahead and go row 0, 1, 2, no, 0, 1, there we go, and column 0. That's where I want it. Oh, and it says, I, okay, you your action, there we go, boom. Uh, so you can see here, we've got a, didn't catch the win on this, it said tie. Um, kind of funny they didn't catch the win on there. But if we play this a bunch of times, you'll find that it's going to win more and more. The more we train it, the more the reinforcement happens. This lengthy training process uh, is really the stopper on reinforcement learning. As this changes, reinforcement learning will be one of the more powerful uh, packages evolving over the next decade or two. In fact, I would even go as far as to say it is the most important uh, machine learning tool and artificial intelligence tool out there as it learns not only a simple tic-tac-toe board, but we start learning environments. And the environment would be like in language, if you're translating a language or something from one language to the other, so much of it is lost if you don't know the context it's in, what's the environments it's in. And so being able to attach environment and context and all those things together is going to require reinforcement learning to do. So again, if you want to get a copy of the tic-tac-toe board, it's kind of fun to play with. Uh, run it. You can test it out. You can do, um, you know, test it for different uh, uh, values. You can switch from P1 computer, uh, where we loaded the policy 1, to load the policy 2, and just see how it varies. There's all kinds of things you can do on there. A quick uh, recap. So we're going to go back and do a reinforcement learning recap. And you'll remember uh, we have our agent, our action, our environment, and our reward, um, and the state. And so uh, reinforcement learning is a branch of machine learning that trains a model to come to an optimum solution for a problem by taking decisions by itself. So we look at it, we analyze the data, make decisions, solve problems. It consists of an environment which an agent will interact with to learn to reach a goal or perform an action. And you see here we have the dog um, and the action equals fetching. And the first thing uh, you're going to notice here, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, is that our action is some kind of a singularity. Uh, the action isn't a regression type model where we're looking at float numbers or we're trying to predict something uh, or doing a reinforcement learning where we're trying to guess the value of the stock market where you have 5.33, $5.33. This is very a little bit different and uh, you'll see why Q learning is so powerful but also where it falls short. Uh, the agent is also given reward if the action performed by it is bringing it is closer to the goal, is leading to the goal. This is done to train the model in the right direction. We have a reward of a hopefully a doggy cookie and action equals fetching. So it gets a reward, it gets to go fetch the ball. Reinforcement learning can be divided based on whether the machine uses a model to learn or learns by itself. Uh, so reinforcement learning. It's model-based, learn the model, given model. And you can think of uh, neural networks, I think, are the most common right now used for reinforcement learning. There certainly are a lot of other options out there. Uh, but you have this black box and you go back and you send uh, the error back up and it trains it based on how much of an error. The error could be computed uh, based on maybe a maximum reward um, subtraction or something like that. So the closer you get to uh, the maximum reward, the better. And so we talk about a model free. Um, you have your policy optimization and your queue learning. And 
this is kind of the cool thing about Q learning is it can do it's very powerful on, on certain things making it very quick and easy to do a reinforcement learning so what is Q learning Q learning is reinforcement learning policy which will fill the next best action given a current state it chooses this action at random and aims to maximize the reward and so you can see here's our standard reinforcement learning graph um, by now if you're doing any reinforcement learning you should be familiar with this where you have your agent, your agent takes an action, the action affects the environment, and then the environment sends back the reward or the feedback and the state, it's the new state the agent's in. Where is it at on the chessboard? Where is it at in the video game? Um, if your robot's out there picking trash up off the side of the road, where is it at on the road? Consider an ad recommendation system. Usually when you look up a product online, you get ads which will suggest the same product over and over again. Using Q learning, we can make an ad recommendation system which will suggest related products to our previous purchase. The reward will be if user clicks on the suggested product. And again, you can see um, you might have a lot of products on uh, your web advertisement or your pages, but it's still not a float number. It's still a set number. And that's something to be aware of when you're using Q learning. And you can see here that if you have 100 people clicking on ads and you click on one of the ads, it might go in there and say, okay, this person clicked on this ad. What is the best set of ads based on clicking on this ad or these two ads afterwards based on where they are browsing? So let's go ahead and take a look at some important terms when we talk about Q learning. Uh, we have state. The state S represents the current position of an agent in an environment. Um, the action, the action A is the step taken by the agent when it is a particular state. Rewards, for every action, the agent will get a positive or negative reward. And again, uh, when we talk about states, we're usually not, with when you're using a Q table, you're not usually talking about float variables. You're talking about true, false. Um, and we'll take a closer look at that in a second. And episodes, when an agent ends up in a terminating state and can't take a new action. Uh, this might be if you're playing a video game, your character stepped in and is now dead or whatever. Uh, <laughs> Q values used to determine how good an action A taken at a particular state S is Q A of S. And temporal difference, a formula used to find the Q value by using the value of the current state and action and previous state and action and very I mean there's Bellman's equation which basically is the equation that kind of uh, covers what we just looked at in all those different terms the Bellman equation is used to determine the values of a particular state and deduce how good it is to be in take that state the optimal st the optimal state will give us the highest optimal value factor influencing Q values the current state and action that's your SA so your current state and your action. Uh, then you have your previous state and action, which is your S, um, I guess, prime. I'm not sure how they, how they reference that. S prime, A prime. So this is what happened before. Uh, then you have a reward for action. So you have your R reward. And you have your maximum expected future reward. And you can see there's also a learning rate put in there and a discount rate. Uh, so when we're looking at these, just like any other model, we don't want to have an absolute um, final value on here. We don't want it to, if, if you do absolute values instead of taking smaller steps, you don't really have that approach to the solution. You just have a jump, and then pretty soon if you jump one solution out, that's what's going to be the new solution, whichever one jumps up really high first. Um, kind of ruining the whole idea of doing a random selection. I'll, and I'll go into the random selection in just a second. Steps in Q learning. Step one, create an initial Q table with all values initialized to zero. Again, we're looking at zero, one. Uh, so are you, you know, here's our action. We start, we're an idle, we took a wrong action, we took a correct action, and int. And then we have our um, actions, fetching, sitting, and running. And of course, we're just using the dog example and choose an action and perform it. Update values in the table. And of course when we're choosing an action we're going to kind of do something random and just randomly pick one. So you start out and you sit and you have then a, um, 
then depending on that um, um, action you took, you can now update the value for sitting after you start, from start to sitting. Get the value of the reward and calculate the, val the value Q value using the Bellman equation. And so now we attach a reward to sitting. And when we attach all those rewards, we continue the same until the table is filled with or an episode ends. And, you, and I mentioned I was going to come back to the random side of this. And there's a few different formulas they use for the random um, setup to pick it. I usually let whatever Q model I'm using do their standard one because someone's usually gone in and done the math uh, for the optimal uh, spread. Uh, but you can look at this. If I have running has a reward of 10, sitting has a reward of 7, fetching has a reward of 5, um, just kind of without doing like a, a, a means, to, uh, you know, using the bell curve for the means value. And uh, like I said, there's some math you can put in there to pick um, so that you're more like, so that running has even a higher chance. Uh, but even if you were just going to do an average on this, you could do an average, a random number by adding them all together, uh, so you get 10 plus 7 plus 5 is 22. You could do 0 to 22, and, or 0 to 21, but 1 to 22. <laughs> 1 to 5 would be fetching uh, and so forth, you know, the last 10. So you can just look at this as what percentage are you going to go for that particular option. Um, and then that gets your random setup in there. And then as you slowly increment these up, uh, you see that uh, uh, if you're idle, uh, where's one? Here we go. Sitting at the end, if you're at the end of wherever you're at, sitting gets a reward of one. Um, where's a good one on here? Oh, wrong action. Running for a wrong action gets almost no reward. So that becomes very, very less likely to happen, but it still might happen. It still might have a percentage of coming up. And that's where the random programming and cue learning comes in. The below table gives us an idea of how many times an action has been taken and how positively correct action or negatively wrong action it is going to affect the next state. So let's go ahead and dive in and pull up a little piece of code and see what this looks like um, in Python. Uh, in this demo, we'll use Q-learning to find the shortest path between two given points. If getting your learning started is half the battle, what if you could do that for free? Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. If you've seen my videos before, um, I like to do it in the uh, Anaconda Jupyter Notebook um, setup, just because it's really easy to see and it's a nice demo. Uh, and so here's my Anaconda. This one I'm actually using a Python 3.6 environment that I set up in here. And we'll go ahead and launch the Jupyter Notebook on this. And once we're in our Jupyter Notebook, uh, which has the kernel loaded with Python 3, we'll go ahead and create a new Python 3 uh, folder in here. And we'll call this uh, Q Learning. And to start this demo, let's go ahead and import our uh, NumPy array. We'll just run that so it's imported. And like a lot of these uh, model programs, when you're building them, you spend a lot of time putting it all together. Um, and then you end up with this really short answer at the end. <laughs> uh, and we'll, we'll take a look at that as we come into it. So we, we go ahead and start with our location to state. Uh, so we have um, L1, L2. These are our nine locations, one to nine. And then, of course, the state is going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. It's just a mapping of our location to a integer on there. And then we have our actions. Our actions are simply uh, moving from um, one location to another. So I can go to I can go to location zero. I can go to location one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, so these are my actions. I can choose. These are the locations of our state. And if you remember earlier, I mentioned uh, um, that the limitation is that you you don't want to put in um, a continually growing table because you can actually create a dynamic queue table where you continually add in new values as they arise because um, if you have float values it just becomes infinite and then your memory in your computer is gone or it, you know does, it's not going to work at the same time you might think well that kind of really limits the the queue uh, learning setup but there are ways to use it in conjunction with other systems and so you might look at, uh, well, I do, um, I've been doing some work in stock. Um, 
and one of the questions that comes out is to buy or sell the stock and the stake coming in might be um, you might take it and create what we call buckets um, where anything that you predict is going to return more than a certain amount of money um, the error for that stock that you've had in the past you put those in buckets and suddenly as you start putting the, creating these buckets you realize you do have a limited amount of information coming in you no longer have a float number you now have um, bucket one two three and four and then you can take those buckets put them through a, a Q learning table and come up with the best action which stock should I buy it's like gambling stock is pretty much gambling if you're doing day trading you're not doing long-term um, investments and so you can start looking at it like that a lot of the um, current feeds say that the best algorithms used for day traders where you're doing it on your own is really to ask the question do I want to trade the stock yes or no and now you have it in a Q learning table and now you can take it to that next level and you can see where that can be a really powerful tool at the end of doing a basic linear regression model or something um, what is the best investment and you start getting the best reward on there uh, and so if we're going to have rewards these rewards we just create um, it says uh, if basically if you're um, this should match our Q table because it's going to be uh, you have your state and you have your action across the top if you remember from the dog and so we have whatever state we're in going down and then the next action and what the reward is for it um, and of course if you were actually doing a um, something more connected your reward would be based on um, the actual environment it's in and then we want to go ahead and create a state to location uh, so we can map the indexes so just like we defined our rewards, uh, we're going to go ahead and do state to location. Um, and you can see here it's a, a dictionary setup for location state and location to state with items. And we also need to um, define what we want for learning rates. Uh, you remember we had our two different rates um, as far as like learning from the past and learning from the current so we'll go ahead and set those to uh, 0.75 and the alpha set to 0.9 and we'll see that when we do the formula and of course any of this code uh, send a note to our simply learn team they'll get you a copy of this code on here and let's go ahead and pull there we go well, the new, next two sections um, since we're going to keep it uh, short and sweet here we go so let's go ahead and create our agent um, so our agent is going to have our initialization where we send it all the information uh, we'll define our self gamma equals gamma we could have just set the gamma rate down here instead of uh, submitting it it's kind of nice to keep them separate because you can play with these numbers uh, and our self alpha um, and then we have our location state we'll set that in here uh, we have our choice of actions um, we're going to go ahead and just embed the rewards right into the agent. So obviously this would be coming from somewhere else uh, instead of from uh, self-generated. And then a self-state to location equals our state to location uh, dictionary. And we go ahead and create a Q learning table. And I went ahead and just set the Q learning table up to um, uh, zero to zero, what, what, what the setup is, uh, location to state, how many of them are there. Uh, and this just creates a, an array of zero to zero setup on there. And then the big part is the training. We have our rewards new equals a copy of self dot rewards. Ending state equals the self location state in location. So this is whatever we end up at. Rewards new equals ending state plus ending state equals nine nine nine. Just kind of goes to a dead end. And we start going through iterations. And we'll go ahead, um, let's do this. Uh, so this, we're going to come back and we're going to call uh, call it on here. Uh, let me just erase that. Switch it to an arrow. There we go. Uh, so what we're doing is we're going to send in here to train it. We're going to say, hey, um, I want to iterate through this a thousand times and see what happens. Now this part would actually be instead of iterating you might have your external environment and they're going back and forth and you iterate through outside of here uh, but just for ease of use our agents gonna come in here and iterate through this 
sometimes I'll put this iteration in here and I'll have it call the environment and say, hey, this is what I did, what's the next state? And the environment does its thing right in here as I iterate through it. Uh, and then we want to go ahead and pick a random state to start with. That's what's going on here. You have to start somewhere. Um, and then you have your playable actions. We're going to start with just an empty thing for playable actions, and we'll fill that up. So that's what choices I have. And so we're going to iterate through the rewards matrix to get the states uh, directly reachable from the randomly chosen current state. Assign those states to a list named playable actions. And so you can see here we have uh, range 9. I usually use length of whatever I'm looking at, uh, which is our locations or states as they are. Uh, we have a reward. So we want to look at the current, the rewards, uh, the new reward is our uh, is in our chart here of rewards underscore new uh, current state um, plus J. Uh, J being what is the next state we want to try. And so we go ahead and do our playable actions and we append J. And so what we're doing is we're randomly trying different things in here to see what's going to generate a better reward. And then of course we go ahead and choose our next state. Uh, so we have our random choice playable actions. And if you remember I mentioned on this, let me just go ahead and, uh, whoops, let's do a free form. When we were talking about the next state, uh, this right here just does a random selection. Instead of a random uh, selection, you might do something where uh, whatever the best selection is, which might be option three here, and then so you can see that it might use a bell curve and then option two over here might have a bell curve like this Oops. and we start looking at these averages and these spreads um, or we can just add them all together and, and pick the one that kind of goes in all of those uh, so those are some of the options we have in here we just go with a random choice uh, that's usually where you start to play with it um, and then we have our reward section down here and so we want to go ahead and find uh, well in this case the temporal difference uh, so you have your rewards new plus the self gamma, and this is the formula we were looking at. This is Bellman's equation here. Uh, so we have our current value, our learning rate, our discount rate involved in there, the reward system coming in for that, um, and we can add it all together. This is, of course, our uh, uh, maximum expected future setup in here. Uh, so this is all of our, our Bellman's equation that we're looking at here. And then we come up in here and we update our Q table. That's all this is on this one. Uh, and that's right here. We have um, self Q, current state, next state, and we add in our um, alpha because we don't want to we don't want to train all of it at once in case there's slight differentials coming in there. We want to slowly approach the answer, uh, and then we have our route equals the start location, and next location equals start location. So we're just incrementing. We took a step forward, and then finally, remember I was telling you how uh, we're going to do all this and just have some simple thing at the end where it just generates a simple path, we're going to go ahead and, and get the optimal route. We want to find the best route in here. And so we've created a definition for the optimal route down here. Just scroll down for that. And we get the optimal route. Uh, we go ahead and put the information in, including the queue table, self, uh, start location, end location, next location, route, queue. And it says while next location is not equal to end location, so while we can still go, our start location equals self location to state start location. So we already have our best value for the start location. Uh, the next state looks at the Q table and says, hey, what's uh, the next one with the best value? And then the next location, we go ahead and pull that in and we just append it. That's what's going on down here. And then we, our start location equals the next location. And we just go through all the steps. And we'll go ahead and run this. And now that we have our Q table, our um, Q agent loaded, we're going to go ahead and uh, take our Q agent, load them up with our alpha gamma that we set up above, um, along with the location step, action, reward, state to location. And uh, our goal is to plot a course between L9 and L1. And we're going to go through 1,000 a a iterations on here. And so when I run that, it runs pretty quick. 
Uh, why is this so fast? Um, if you've been running neural networks and you've been doing all these other models, you sit here and wait a long time. Well, we're a very small amount of data. These are all integers. These aren't float values. There's not a, the math is not heavy on the on the processing end. And this is where Q tables are so powerful. If you have a small amount of information coming in, you very quickly uh, get an answer off of this, even though we went through it a thousand times to train it. And you'll see here we have L9, 8, 5, 2, and 1. And that's based on our reward table we had set up on there. And this is the shortest path going between these different uh, setups in here. And if you remember on our reward table, uh, you can see that if you start here, you can go to here. There's places you can't go. That's how this reward table was set up. So I can only go to certain places. Uh, so kind of a little maze set up in there. And you can play with it. This is really fun uh, set up to play with. Uh, and you can see how you can take this whole code and you can, like I was saying earlier, you can embed it into another setup in model and predictions where you put things into buckets and you're trying to guess the best investment, the best course of action. As long as you can take that course of action and, and uh, uh, reduce it down to a yes, no, um, or if you're using text, you can use a one-hot encoder, which word is next. There's all kinds of things you can do with a Q table, uh, depending on just how much information you're putting in there. So that wraps up our demo. In this demo, we've uh, found the shortest distance between two paths based on whatever rules or state rewards we have to get from point A to point B and what available actions there are. The principal component uh, analysis, we're going to cover dimensionality reduction, principal component analysis, what is it, important PCA terminologies, and you'll see it abbreviated uh, normally as PCA, principal component analysis, PCA properties, PCA example, and then we'll pull up some Python code in our Jupyter Notebook and have some hands-on demo on the PCA and how it's used. Dimensionality reduction. Dimensionality reduction refers to the technique that reduces the number of input variables in a data set. And so you can see on the table on the right shows the orders made at an automobile parts retailer. The retailer sells different automobile parts from different companies. And you can see we have company uh, B packs, Isomax, and they have the item, the tire, the axle, an order ID, a price number, and a quantity. In order to predict the future sales, we find out that using correlation analysis, that we just need three attributes. Therefore, we have reduced the number of attributes from five to three. And clearly, we don't really care about the part number. I don't think the part number would have an effect on how many tires are bought. Um, and even the store, who's buying them, probably does not have an effect on that. In this case, that's what they've actually done, is remove those. And we just have the item, the tire, the price, and the quantity. One of the things you should be taking away from this is in the scheme of things, we are in the descriptive phase. We're describing the data, and we're pre-processing the data. What can we do to clean it up? Why dimensionality reduction? Well, number one, less dimensions for a given data set means less computation or training time. That can be really important if you're trying a number of different models uh, and you're rerunning them over and over again. And even if you have seven gigabytes of data, that can start taking days to go through all those different models. So this is huge. This is probably the hugest part as far as reducing um, our data set. Redundancy is removed after removing similar entries from the data set. Again, pre-processing some of our models, like a neural network, if you put in two of the same data, it might give them a higher weight than they would if it was just one. So we want to get rid of that redundancy. And it also increases the processing time if you have multiple uh, data coming in. Space required to store the data is reduced. So if we're committing this into a big data uh, pool, we might not send the company that bought it. Why would we want to store two whole extra columns when we add it into that pool of data? Makes the data easy for plotting in 2D and 3D plots. This is my favorite part. Very important. You're in your shareholder meeting. You want to be able to give them a really good, um, clear, and simplified version. You want to reduce it down to something people can take in. It helps to find out the most significant features and skip the rest which also comes in in post-scribing. 
uh, leads to better human interpretation. That kind of goes with number four, where it makes data easy for plotting. You have a better interpretation when we're looking at it. Principal component analysis. So what is it? Uh, principal component analysis is a technique for reducing the dimensionality of data sets, increasing interpretability, but at the same time, minimizing information loss. So we take some very complex data set with lots of variables. We run it through the PCA. We reduce the variables. We end up with a reduced variable setup. This is very confusing to look at because if you look at the end result, we have the different colors all lined up. So what we're going to take a look at is let's say we have a picture here. Uh, let's say you are asked to take a picture of some toddlers and you are deciding which angle would be the best to take the picture from. So if we come up here and we look at this, we say, okay, this is, you know, one angle. Uh, we get the back of a lot of heads, not many faces. Uh, so we'll do it from here. We might get the one person up front smiling. A lot of the people in the class are missing. So we have um, a huge amount off to the right of blank space, maybe from up here. Again, we have the back of someone's head. And uh, it turns out that the best angle to click the picture from might be this bottom left angle. You look at it and you say, hey, that makes sense. It's a, a good um, configuration of all the people in the picture. Now, when we're talking about data, it's not, you really can't do it by what you think is going to be the best. We need to have some kind of mathematical formula so it's consistent and so it makes sense in the back end. One of the projects I worked on many years ago uh, has something similar to the IRIS. And if you've ever done the IRIS data set, it's probably one of the most common ones out there where they have the flower and they're measuring the stamen uh, in the petals and they have width and they have length of the petal. Instead of putting through the width and the length of the petal, we could just as easily do the um, width to length ratio. We can divide the width by the length and you get a single number where you had two. That's the kind of idea that's going on into this in pre-processing and looking at what we can do to bring the data down. A very simplified example on my uh, iris petal example. When we look at the similarity in PCA, we find the best picture or projection of the data points. And so when we look down at from one angle, we've drawn a line down there, uh, we can see these data points based on, in this case, just two variables. Now keep in mind, we're usually talking about 36, 40 variables. Um, almost all of your business models usually have about 26 to 27 different variables they're looking at. Uh, same thing with like a bank loan model. We're talking 26 to 36 different variables they're looking at that are going in. So what we want to do is we want to find the best view. In this case, we're just looking at the XY. We look down at it and we have our second um, idea, PC2. And again, we're looking at the XI, this XY, this time from a different direction. Here, for our ease, we can consider that we get two principal components, namely PC1 and PC2. Comparing both the principal components, we find the data points are sufficiently spaced in PC1. So if you look at what we got here, we have uh, PC1. You can see along the line how the data points are spaced versus the spacing in PC2. And that's what they're coming up with. What is going to give us the best look for these data points when we combine them? And we're looking at them from just a single angle. Whereas in PC2, they are less spaced, which makes the observation and further calculations much more difficult. Therefore, we accept the PC1 and not the PC2 as the data points are more spaced. Now, obviously, the back-end calculations are a little bit more complicated when we get into the math of how they decide what is more valuable. This gives you an idea, though, that when we're talking about this, we're talking about the perspective, uh, which would help in understanding how PCA analysis works. What we want to go ahead and do is dive into the important terminologies under uh, PCA. And important terminologies are views, the perspective through which data points are observed. And so you'll hear that if someone's talking about a PCA presentation and they're not taking the time to reduce it to something you can that the average person, shareholders can understand, you might hear them refer to it as the different views. What view are we taking? Dimension, number of columns in a data set are called the dimensions of that data set. And we talked about, uh, you'll hear features, dimensions. Um, now I was talking about features, there's usually, when you're running a business, you're talking 25, 26, 27 different features, minimal. And then you have the principal component. 
new variables that are constructed as linear combinations or mixtures of the initial variables. Principal component is very important. It's a combination. If you remember my flower example, it would be the width over the length of the petal as opposed to putting both width and length in. You just put in the um, ratio instead, which is a single number versus two separate numbers. Projections. The perpendicular distance between the principal component and the data points. And that goes to that line we had earlier. It's that right angle line of where those point, how all those points fall onto the line. Important properties. Important properties. Number of principal components is always less than or equal to the number of attributes. That just makes common sense. Uh, you're not going to do 10 principal properties with only three features. Uh, you're trying to reduce them, so it's just kind of goofy, but it is important to remember that. People will throw weird code out there and just randomly do stuff with, instead of really thinking it through. Principal components are orthogonal. And this is what we're talking about, that right angle from the line. When we, when we do PC1, we're looking at how those points fall on to that line. Uh, same thing with PC2. And we want to make sure that PC1 does not equal PC2. We don't want to have the same two principal points uh, when we do two points. The priority of principal components decreases as their numbers increase. This is important to understand. If you're going to create uh, one principal component, everything is summarized into that one component. As we go to two components, the priority, um, how much it holds value, decreases as we go down. So if you have five different points, each one of those points is going to have less value than just the one point, which has everything summarized in it. How PCA works. I said there was more in the back end when we talk about the math. This is what we're talking about is how does it actually work. So now we have understanding that you know, you're looking at a perspective. Uh, now we want to see how that math side works. PCA performs the following operations in order to evaluate the principal components for a given data set. First we start with the standardization. Then we have a covariance matrix computation. And we use that to generate our iGene vectors and iGene values, which is the feature vector. And if you remember, the iGene vector is like a translation for um, uh, moving the data from x equals 1 to x equals 2 or whatever, altering it. And the iGene value is the final value that we generate. When we talk about standardization, the main aim of this step is to standardize the range of the attributes so that each one of them lie within similar boundaries. This process involves removal of the mean from the variable values and scaling the data with respect to the standard deviation. And you can see here we have z equals the variable values minus the mean over the standard deviation. The covariance matrix computation. Covariance matrix is used to express the correlation between any two or more attributes in multi-dimensional data set. The covariance matrix has the entries as the variance and the covariance of the attribute values. The variance is denoted by var and the covariance is denoted by cov. On the right we can see the covariance matrix for two attributes and their values. When we do a hands-on look at the code, we'll do a display of this so you can see what we're talking about and what that looks like. For now, you can just notice that this is a matrix that we're generating with the variance and then the covariance of x to y. On the right side, we can see the covariance table for more than two attributes in a multi-dimensional data set. And this is what I was talking about. We usually are looking at uh, not just one feature or two features. We're usually looking at 25, 30 features going on. And so if we do a well, setup like this, we should see all those different features as the different variables. Covariance matrix tells us how the two or more variables are related. Positive covariance indicate that the value of one variable is directly proportional to the other variable. Negative covariance indicate that the value of one variable is inversely proportional to the other variable. That is always important to note when whenever we're doing any of these matrices that we're going to be looking at that positive and negative, whether it's inverted or not. And then we have the iGene values and the iGene vectors. iGene values and iGene vectors are the mathematical value 
that are extracted from the covariance table. They are responsible for the generation of a new set of variables from the old set of variables which further lead to the construction of the principal components. Iogene vectors do not change directions after linear transformation. Iogene values are the scalars or the magnitude of the iogene vectors. And again, this is just transforming that data. So we're going to change uh, the vector b to the b prime as denoted on the chart. And so when we have like multiple variables, how do we calculate that new variable? And then we have feature vectors. Feature vectors is simply a matrix that has iogene vectors of the components that we decide to keep as the columns. Here we decide whether we must keep or discard the less significant principal components that we have generated in the above steps. This becomes really important as we start looking at uh, the back end of this, and we'll do this in the demo, uh, but one of the more important steps to understand. And so we have the PCA example, consider matrix X with N rows or observations and K columns or variables. Now for this matrix, we would construct a variable space with as many dimensions as the variable. But for our simplicity, let's consider this three dimensions for now. Now each observation, row of the matrix X, is placed in the k-dimensional variable space, such that the rows in the data table form a swarm of points in this space. Now we find the mean of all the observations and then place it along the data points on the plot. The first principal component is a line that best accounts for the shape of the point swarm. It represents the maximal variance direction in the data. Each observation may be projected onto this line in order to get a coordinate value along the PC1. This value is known as a score. Usually only one principal component is insufficient to model the systematic variation for a data set. Thus a second principal axis is created. The second principal component is oriented such that it reflects the second largest source of variation in the data. While being orthogonal to PC1, PC2 also passes through the average point. Let's go ahead and pull this up and just see what that means uh, inside our Python scripting. I'm going to use the Anaconda Navigator, and I will be in Python 3.6 for this example. I believe there's even like a 3.9 out. I tend to stay in 3.6 because a lot of the models I use, especially with the neural networks, are stable in 3.6. And then we open up our uh, Jupyter. I'm in Chrome. And we go ahead and create a new Python 3. And for ease of use, uh, our team in the back was nice enough to put this together for me. And we'll go ahead and start with the libraries. The first thing I like to do whenever I'm looking at any new setup, uh, well, you know what, let's do, let's do the libraries first. We're going to do our basic libraries, which is matplot library, uh, the PLT from the matplot library, pandas, our data frame, uh, PD, numpy, our numbers array, NP, Seaborn for graphing, SNS, that goes with the plot that actually sits on matplot library, so the Seaborn sits on there. And then we have our amber sign because we're in Jupyter Notebook, matplot library in line. The newer version actually doesn't require that, um, but I put it in there either anyway just because I'm so used to it. And then we want to go ahead and take a look at the data. And in this case, we're going to pull in, uh, certainly you can have lots of fun with different data, but we're going to use the cancer data set. Um, and one of the reasons the cancer data set is, is it has like 36, 35 different features. So it's kind of fun to use that as our base for this. Then we'll go ahead and run this and look at our keys. And the first thing we notice in our keys for the cancer data set uh, is we have our data, we have our target, our frame, target names, description, feature names, and file name. So what we're looking for in all this is, um, well, let's take a look at the description. Let's go in here and pull up the description on here. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on the description um, because this is we don't want to get into a medical domain. We want to focus on our PCA setup. Uh, what's important is you start looking at what the different attributes are, what they mean, 
Um, if you were in the medical field, you'd want to note all these different things, whether what they're measuring, where it's coming from. You can actually see the actual different um, measurements they're taking. No missing attributes. We page all the way to the bottom. And you're going to have your data, in this case our target. And if you dig deep enough to the target, uh, let's actually do this. Let's go ahead and print target names. Real quick here, I always like to, to just take a look and see what's on the other end of this. Uh, target names. Run that. And so the target name is, is it malignant or is it B9? Um, so in other words, is this uh, dangerous growth or is it something we don't have to worry about? That's the bottom line with the cancer in this case. And then we can go ahead and load our data. And uh, you know what, let me go up a, just a notch here for easy of reading. It's hard to get that just right. I guess I'll have to do. Uh, so let's go ahead and look at our data. Uh, our, our, we're going to use our pandas. And we're going to go ahead and uh, do our data frame. It's going to equal cancer data. Columns equals cancer. Feature equals feature names. So remember up here, we already loaded the, the uh, names up of our of the features in there. What is going to come out of this? Let me just see if we can get to that. It's at the top of target names. Um, that's just this list of names here in the setup. And we can go ahead and run this code. And it'll print the head. And you can see here we have the mean radius, the mean texture, mean perimeter. I don't know about you, this is a wonderful data set if you're playing with it because like many of the data, that most of the data that comes in, half the time we don't even know what we're looking at. Uh, we're just handed a bunch of stuff as a data scientist going, what the heck is this? And so this is a good place to start because this has a number of different features in there and we have no idea what these feature means or where they come from. We want to just look at the data and figure that out. And now we actually are getting into the PCA side of it. As we've noticed before, it is difficult to visualize high dimensional data. We can use PCA to find the first two principal components and visualize the data, this new two dimensional space, with a single scatter plot. Uh, before we do this, we need to go ahead and scale our data. Now, I haven't run this to see if you really have to scale the data on this, um, but as just a general runtime, I almost do that as the first step of any modeling, even if it's pre-modeling as we're doing here. Um, in neural networks, that is so important. With PCA visualization, it's already going to scale it when we do the means and deviation inside the PCA. Uh, but just in case, it's always good to scale it. And then we're going to take our uh, PCA with the scikit-learn uses very similar process to other pre-processing functions that come with scikit-learn. We instantiate a PCA object, find the principal components using the fit method, then apply the rotation and dimensionality reduction by calling transform. We can also specify how many components we want to keep when creating the PCA object. And so the code for this, oops, getting a little bit ahead. <laughs> Let me go ahead and run this code. Uh, so the code for this, is from sklearn decomposition import PCA. PCA equals PCA and components equals two. And that's really important to note that because uh, we're only going to want to look at two components. I would never go over four components, uh, especially if you're going to demo this with somebody else. If you're showing this to the shareholders, the whole idea is to reduce it to something people can see. Uh, and then the PCA fit we're going to, uh, is going to take the scaled data that we generated up here. And then you can see we've created our PCA model with in components equals two. Now, whenever I use a new tool, I like to go in there and actually see what I'm using. So let's go to the Scikit uh, web page for the PCA. Uh, and you can see in here, here's our call statement. It describes what all the different uh, setups you have on there. Probably the biggest one to look at would be, um, well, the biggest one is your components. How many components do you want, uh, which you have to put in there pretty much. 
And then you also might look at the SVD solver. It's on auto right now, but you can override that and do different things with it. It does a pretty good job as it is. And if we go down, all the way down to um, here we go, to our methods, if you notice we have fit, and we have fit transform. Nowhere in here is predict, because this is not a, used for prediction. Uh, it's used to look at the data. Again, we're in the describe setup. We're fitting the data. We're taking a look at it. Uh, we've already looked at our minimum maximum. We've already looked at what's in each quarter. We've done a full description of the data. This is part of describing the data. Um, that's the biggest thing I take away when I come zooming in here. And of course, they have uh, examples of it down here if you forget. Um, and the biggest one, of course, is the number of components. And then, uh, I mean, the rest you can play with. Um, the actual solver, whether you're doing a full or randomized, there's different things. It does pretty good on the auto. And now we can transform this data to its first two principal components. And so we have our um, XPCA. We're going to set that equal to PCA transform scaled data. Uh, so there we go. There's our first transformation. And let's just go ahead and print the scaled data shape and the XPCA data shape. And the reason we want to do this is just to show us uh, what's going on here. We've taken 30 features. I think I said 36 or something like that, but it's 30. And we've compressed it down to two features. And we decided we wanted two features, and that's where this comes from. Uh, we still have 569 data sets. I mean data rows, not data sets. We still have 569 rows of data, but instead of computing 30 features, we're now only doing our model on two features. So let's go ahead and uh, uh, plot these and take a look and see what's going on. And uh, we're just going to use our PLT figure. We're going to set the figure size on here. Here's our scatter plot, um, XPCA, X underscore PCA of, uh, of one. These are our two different perceptions we're using. Uh, and then you'll see right here, C for color, cancer equals target. And so remember we have zero, we have one. And if I remember correctly, zero was malignant, one was B9. Uh, so everything in the zero column is going to be one color, and the other color is going to be one. And then we're going to use the plasma map, just kind of telling you what color it is. Add some labels, first principal component, second principal component. And we'll go ahead and run this. And you can see here, instead of having a chart, one of those heat maps with 30 different columns in it, we can look at this and say, hey, this one actually did a pretty good job of separating the data. And a couple things when I'm looking at this that I notice is first, we have a very clear area where it's clumped together, um, where it's going to be benign. And we have a huge area, it's still clumped together, more spread out, where it's going to be uh, malignant. Or I think I had that backwards. And then in the middle, because we're dealing with something, in this particular case, cancer, we would try to separate, I would be exploring how to separate this middle group out. In other words, there's an area where everything overlaps and we're not going to have a clear result on it. Uh, just because those are the people you want to go in there and have extra tests or treat it differently versus going in and saying just cutting into the, can into the cancer so that the body absorbs it and it dissipates versus... Uh, actively going in there, removing it, testing it, going through chemo and all the different things. That's a big difference, you know, as far as what's going to happen here. And that middle line where they overlap is going to be huge. That's domain specific. Uh, going back to the data, we can see here, uh, clearly by using these two components, we can easily separate these two classes. So the next step is what does that mean? Interpreting the components. Unfortunately, with this great power of dimensionality reduction comes the cost of not being able to easily understand what these components represent. I don't know what principal component one looks, or represents or second principle. 
the components correspond to combinations of original features. The components themselves are stored as an attribute of the filtered PCA object. And so when we talk, look at that, we can go ahead and do uh, look at the PCA components. This is in our model we built. We've trained it. We can run that, and you can see here's the actual components. Uh, it's the two components have each have their own array. And within the array, you can see the uh, what the scores they're using. And these actually give weight to what features are doing what. So in this NumPy matrix array, each row represents a principal component, and each column relates back to the original features. What's really neat about this is we can now go in reverse and drop this onto a heat map and start seeing uh, what this means. And so let me go ahead and just put this down. Oops, I already got it down here. Uh, we go ahead and put this in here. We're going to use our um, DF comp data frame and we do our PCA components. And I want you to notice how easy this is. Uh, we're going to set our columns equal to cancer feature names. That just makes it really easy. And we're dumping it into a data frame. What's neat about a data frame is when we get to Seaborn, it will pull that data frame apart and, uh, and set it up for us what we want. And so we're just going to do the, C the Seaborn heat map of our data frame uh, composition, and we'll use the plasma coloring. And it creates a nice little color graph here. You can see we have the mean radius and all the different features along the bottom. On the right, uh, we have a scale. So we can see we have the dark colors all the way to the really light colors, which are what's really shining there. This is like the primary stuff we want to look at. So this heat map and the color bar basically represent the correlation between the various features and the principal component itself. So, you know, very powerful map to look at. And then you can go in here and we might notice that the mean radius, look how, how on the bottom of the map it is um, on some of this. Uh, so you have some interesting correlations here that change the variations on that and what means what. This is more when you get to uh, uh, postscribe, you can also use this to try to guess as what these things mean and what you want to change to get a better result. Regularization in machine learning. So our agenda on this one is fitting the data, understanding linear regression, bias and variance, what is overfitting, what is underfitting, and those are like the biggest things right now in data science is overfitting and underfitting. What does that mean? And what is regularization? And then we'll do a quick hands-on demo to take a look at this. So fitting the data. Let's start with fitting the data. And we talk about uh, what is data fitting. It's a process of plotting a series of data points and drawing the best fit line to understand the relationship between the variables. And this is what we call data fitting. And you can see here we have a couple of lines we've drawn on this graph. We're going to go in a little deeper on there. Uh, so we might have, in this case, just a two dimensions. We have an efficiency of the car and we have the distance traveled in 1,000 kilometers. And so what is data fitting? Well, it's a linear relationship. And a linear relationship, very specifically, linear means line. Uh, the line used to represent the relationship is a straight line that passes through the data points and the variables have linear relationship. Linear regression. So let's start with uh, how linear regression works. A linear regression uh, finds a line that best fits the data point and gives a relationship between the two variables. And so you can see here we have the efficiency of the car um, versus the distance traveled. And you can see this nice straight line drawn through there. And when you talk about multiple variables, all you're doing is putting this instead of a line, it now becomes a plane. It gets a little more complicated with multiple variables, but they all come down to this linear kind of uh, drawing a line through your data and finding what fits the, the data the best. And so we can consider an example. Uh, let's say that we want to find the relationship between the temperature outside versus the sales of ice cream. And so we start looking at that. We're looking at the how many ice cream cones we're selling or how much money we sold in ice cream. And we're looking at how uh, warm it is outside, which would hopefully draw a lot of people into the ice cream store. And suppose we have two lines. We're going to draw L1 and L2. And we're going to kind of guess which one we think is the best fit. 
and which claim to describe the relationship between the variables. And so first, we find the square of the distance between the line L1 and each data point, and add them all, and find the mean distance. And I want you to think about that when we um, uh, square something, if it's a negative or positive number, it no longer matters, because a minus 2 squared is 4, 2 squared is 4. So we're removing what side of the line it's on, and we're just looking for the error. In this case, the uh, mean distance of each of the little dotted lines you see here. This way of calculating the square of the distance, adding them, and then taking the mean is called mean square error, or loss function. And we talk about loss, how far off are we? That's what we're really talking about. What did we miss? Uh, and we have a positive distance and a negative distance. And of course, when we square it, it is neither, it just becomes a positive error. And so we take the mean square error, and a lot of times you'll see it referred to as MSE. Uh, if I look in a code and I'm going through my Python code and I see MSE, I know that's a mean squared error. And we take all the dotted lines and we calculate this error and we add them all together and then we average it or find the means. And in this case, they ran a demo on this and it was 1,127.27 uh, uh, for our L1 line. Now we find the loss function for line L2 in a similar fashion and we get the mean square error to be 6,397. And it's computed the same way. So maybe you put this line just way outside the data range, and this is the error you get. By analyzing our results, we find that the loss function, or the mean square error, is less for L1 than L2. Hence, L1 is the best fit line. Uh, this process describes a lot of machine learning processes. So we're going to keep guessing and get as close as we can to find the right answer. We have to have some way to, to um, calculate this and figure out which one's the best, and the mean square error is one of the better fits to doing, for doing this and most commonly used. We really want to talk about bias and variance. Very important terms to know in machine learning and with linear regression. So bias. Bias occurs when an algorithm has limited flexibility to learn from data. Variance defines the algorithm's sensitivity to specific sets of data. Let's start with bias and variance. You can see here we have um, the two different setups. Uh, bias, you can think, is very generalized, where variance is very specific. Uh, and so when we talk about bias, such models pay very little attention to the training data and oversimplify the model. Therefore, the validation error or prediction error and training error follow similar trends. And uh, with bias, if you oversimplify it so much, you're going to miss your um, local, uh, if, if you have like a really good fit, you're going to miss it. You're, you're going to just kind of guess what the average is, and that's what your answer is going to be. With variance, a model with a high variance pays a lot of attention to training data and does not generalize. Therefore, the validation error or prediction error are far apart from each other. Such models always lead to a high error on training and test data, as a bias does. Where variance, such models usually perform very well on training data but have high error rates on test data. And I want you to think about this. Um, when we're talking about a bias, uh, the error is going to be high both when you're training it and you're testing it. Why? Because we're just kind of getting an average. We're not really fitting it close. With variance, we're fitting it so close that the test data does really good. It's going to nail it every time. Uh, if you're doing categorical testing, that's a car, that's a truck, that's a bicycle. Um, but with variance, suddenly a truck has to have certain features and it might have to be red uh, because you had so many red pictures so if it has if it's an 18 wheeler it has to be red if it's uh, blue then it has to be a bicycle that's the kind of variance we're talking about where it picks up on something and it, it cannot get the right answer unless it gets a very specific data and we see that so that as you're testing it your models and you programmed it you got to look for how I trained it, what is coming out, and if it's not if it's not looking good on either bias or, or if it's not looking good on the training 
or on the test data, then your bias, uh, then your bias in your data. If it really looks good on the training data, then that's going to be your variance. You've overfitted the data. And those are very important things to know when you are building your models uh, in regression of any kind or any kind of uh, setup for predicting. So in dark games, if all the data fall on a particular pointer, this can be considered as a biased throw, and the player aims for the particular score. For variance, if all the darts fall on different pointers and no two darts fall on the same pointer, then this can be considered as a varied throw, and the player aims for various scores. Uh, again, the bias sums everything up in one point, kind of averages it together, where the variance really looks for the individual uh, predictions coming out. So let's go ahead and talk about overfitting. Uh, when we talk about overfitting, it's a scenario where the machine learning model tries to learn from the details along with the noise, and the data tries to fit each data point on the curve. Uh, you can see that... Um, if you plug in your coordinates, you're just going to get the whatever is fitted every point on the data stream. There's no average. There's no two points that might have the, you know, Y might have two different answers because uh, if the wind blows a certain way um, and your efficiency of your car, maybe you have a headwind. So your car might alter how efficient it is as it goes. And so there's going to be this variance on here. And this says, no, you can't have any variance with, you know, the, this is, it's going to be exactly this. So it can't be any, you can't be the same speed or the same car and have a slightly different efficiency. So as the model has very f less flexibility, it fails to predict new data points. And thus the model rejects every new data point during the prediction. Uh, so you'll get like a really high error on here. And so, uh, reasons for overfitting. Uh, data used for training is not cleaned and contains noise, garbage values in it. You can spend so much time cleaning your data, and it's so important. It's so important that if you have, if you have some kind of, something wrong with the data coming in, it needs to be addressed. Whether it's the source of the data, maybe they use in medical different measuring tools, uh, so you now have to adjust for data that came in from hospital A versus hospital B, or even off of machine A and machine B that's testing something, and those, those numbers are coming in wrong. The model has a high variance. Uh, again, wind is a good example. I was talking about that with the car. You may have 100 tests, but because the wind's blowing, it's all over the place. Uh, size of training data used is not enough, so a small amount of data is going to also cause this problem. You only have a few points, and you try to plot everything. The model is too complex. Uh, this comes up a lot. We put too many pieces together, and how they interact can't even be tracked. Um, and, and so you have to go back, break it up, and find out actually what correlates and what doesn't. So what is underfitting? A scenario where machine learning models can neither learn the relationship between the data points nor predict or classify a new data point. And you can see here we have uh, our efficiency of our car and our line drawn, and it's just going to be way off for both the training and the predicting data. As the model doesn't fully learn the patterns, it accepts every new data point during the prediction. So instead of looking for a general pattern, uh, we just kind of accept everything. Data used for training is not cleaned and contains noise, garbage, and values. Again, underfitting and overfitting, same issue. You've got to clean your data. The model has a high bias. Uh, we've seen this in all kinds of things from uh, the, mo the most common is the driving cars to facial identification or whatever it is. The model itself, when they build it, might have a bias towards one thing. And this would be an underfitted model would have that bias because it's averaged it out. So if you have um, uh, five people from India and 10 people from um, Africa and 20 people from the U.S., you created a bias uh, because it's looking at the 20 people and you only have a small amount of data to work with. Size of training data used is not enough. Uh, that goes with the size I was just talking about. So we have a model with a high bias. We have size of training data used is not enough. The model is too simple. Again, this is one straight line through all the data. 
when it needs has a slight shift to it for other reasons. So what is a good fit? Uh, a linear curve that best fits the data is neither overfitting or underfitting models, but is just right. And of course we have the nice examples here where we have overfitting, lines going up and down, every point's trying to be include, included, underfitting, uh, the line really is off from where the data is, and then a good fit is got to get rid of that, minimize that um, error coming through. Regularization is taking the guesswork out. You're looking at this graph and you're going, oh, which one is that really overfit or is that underfit? That's pretty hard to tell. So we talk about regularization. Regularization techniques are used to calibrate the linear regression models and to minimize the adjusted loss function and prevent overfitting or underfitting. So what that means, uh, in this case, we're going to go ahead and take a look at a couple different things. We're going to look at regularization, which we'll start with a linear model. We'll look at the ridge regularization and the lasso regularization. And these models are just like uh, just like we did the um, MLP, the multi-layered positron in the SK Learn module. You could bring in the ridge module and you can bring in the lasso module. So when we talk about um, ridge regression, it modifies the overfitted or underfitted models by adding the penalty equivalent to the sum of the squares or the magnitude of the coefficients. And so we have a cost function equals loss equals uh, lambda times the sum of w uh, squared or the absolute value of w depending on how you're doing it. Now remember we talked about error where we either square it or we absolute value it uh, because that removes a plus or minus sign on there. And there's reasons to do it either way, but it is more common to square the value. And then we have our, uh, um, in this case, the lambda is going to be the penalty for the errors. We've thrown in a Greek character for you just to confuse everybody. And W is the slope of the curve of the line. So uh, we're going to look at this, and we're going to draw a line. This is going to be like a linear regression model. So if you had, in SKLearn, you could import just a standard linear regression model. Uh, it would plot this line across whatever data we're working on. And we look at this, and of course we're just extrapolating this. Um, I'm, I know they use some specific data, but we don't want to get into the actual domain. And so for a linear regression line, let's consider two points that are on the line. And we'll go ahead and have a loss equals zero. Uh, considering the two points on the line, we'll go ahead and do lambda equals one. We'll set our W is going to be 1.4. Then the cost function equals 0 plus 1 times 1.4 squared, which equals 1.96. Uh, so really don't get caught up too much in the math on this, other than understanding um, that this is something that's very easy for a computer to calculate. And if you ever see the loss plus the, la plus the uh, lambda times w, the sum is w squared. And then let's say we have a ridge uh, regression line and it does this, we go ahead and plot it and we do the calculations on the data. And for the ridge regression, let's assume a loss equals 0.3 squared plus 0.2 squared equals 0.13. So when they put all the calculations through of the two points, we end up with the 0 .0, uh, 0.62. Uh, so we've now had a linear regression model. We now had a ridge regression model. And the ridge regression model plots a little differently than the standard linear regression model. And comparing the two models with all the data points, we can see that the ridge regression line fits the model more accurately than the linear regression line. And I find this true on a lot of data I work with. I'll end up using either the ridge regression model or the lasso uh, Mars regression model for fitting, um, especially dealing with a lot of like uh, stock markets daily um, setup. They come out slightly better. Uh, you get a slightly better um, fit. And so we have our lasso. We just talked about lasso coming in here. And the cost function equals, uh, um, instead of doing a squared, we're just going to do the absolute value. And so if you remember, this is where ridge regression changes. Where's my ridge regression model? Uh, we're squaring the value here. And if you look at this, we're not squaring the value. We're just finding the absolute value on here. And so the loss of the, squ of the squared individuals um, and here is our lambda symbol again, penalty for errors, and W equals the slope of the curve.
And comparing the two models with all the data points, we can see that the lasso regression line fits the model more accurately than the linear regression line. And this is, like I said, a lot, I use these two models a lot. Uh, the ridge, and this is important, this is, this is kind of the meat of the matter. How do you know which one to use? Some of it is you just do it a bunch of times and then you figure it out. Uh, ridge regularization is useful when we have many variables with relatively smaller data samples. The model does not encourage convergence towards zero, but is likely to make them closer to zero and prevent overfitting. The Lasser regularization model is preferred when we are fitting a linear model with fewer variables. So in the, in the iris thing, we had four or five variables as we measured the different leaf pieces. Uh, you might be doing the measurements on the cancer project, which has 36 different variables. Um, so as we get down to the iris with four variables, lasso lar will probably uh, work pretty good where you might use the ridge regularization with more model with if you have something uh, significantly larger and it encourages the coefficients of the variables to go towards zero because of the shape of the constraint which is an absolute value and with any of this we want to go ahead and uh, do a demo in lasso and ridge regression so let's take a look and see what that looks like in our code and bring up our jupyter notebook we'll start with our imports Pandas is PD, import numpy is NP, import matplotlibrary is PLT, um, sklearn, we're going to import our data sets, it's kind of more generic, um, we usually just import one data set instead of all of them, but you know, quick and dirty when you're putting some of these together. Uh, we have our sklearn model selection, we're going to import our train test split for splitting our data up, and then we'll bring in our linear regression model. And we'll go ahead and run these just to load them up and then load our data set. We were just talking about that. Uh, you could just um, um, have imported the load Boston and Boston data set in there instead of loading all the data sets. Um, and then once we've loaded our data set, we want to go ahead and take a look at that data and see what we got here. Let me just go ahead and pop that down there and go ahead and run it. And so we've gone ahead and taken our uh, Boston uh, data. We're going to we put it into our pandas data frame, um, the Boston data set, and then the Boston columns. So we want to see what's going on with them. Um, we have our target. We have the house price, uh, etc. And so our x equals Boston um, i location. Now remember in pandas, the new updates to pandas, they want i location if you're going to pull data. We used to be able to leave this off, but it does something different. It creates a slice versus a direct um, setup. So make sure you're using that I location and the I, the output. So this is all just bringing our data together. And we can see here if we do, uh, we print the Boston um, Pandas head, we can see here all of our different um, aspects we're looking for. And if you're following the X and the Y, the X is um, everything except for the last column, where Y is uh, all the, it's, it, that's what this means, all the rows except for the last column, and then Y is all the rows, but just the last column. So Y is our house price, and the X is the Crim, Zian, Industry, Chaz, Knox, and all these other different um, statistics they've collected for house sales in Boston. There we go. Whoops, control. Ah. So we'll go ahead and split our data. Uh, X train and our X uh, test, Y train, Y test equals the train test split, which we imported. And we have our Boston. Um, you could have easily used the X and Y on here as opposed to Boston um, I location. And we'll create our test size. We're going to take 25% of the data and put it in as a test. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and run this. Uh, <clears throat> need an extra drink there. Uh, so we have our train and test, and then of course the print the train data shape. I love doing this kind of thing whenever I'm working with this data. Print out the shape, make sure everything looks correct, uh, so that we have 127 by 13 and 127 by 1, 379 by 13. They should match. And if, if the, the data sets are not quite matching, 
then you know something's wrong and you're going to get all those errors. I don't know how many times I've gone through here and it's dropped a row on one of them and not on the other or something weird has happened when I'm cleaning the data. This is pretty straightforward and simple because the data comes in a nice prepackaged and is all clean for you. So let's go ahead and apply, apply the multiple linear regression model. And uh, we'll call this LREG, LREG, linear regression. And we're going to go ahead and fit that linear regression model to X train and Y train. Then we'll generate the prediction on the test set. Uh, so here's our LREG Y predict with our X test going into the prediction. And let's calculate that mean square error, MSE. I told you you'll see MSE used a lot. Um, people use it in variables and things like that. It's pretty common. And we get our mean squared error equals, uh, this is just the basic formula we've already been talking about. What's the difference squared? Uh, and then we look for the average of that. And we'll go ahead and just run this. And you can see when we get through the end of this, we have our mean square error on test. We have our total, and then we have each column coming down. And at this point, unless you really know the data you're working with, it's not going to mean a whole lot. So if it's in your domain, you might be, know what you're looking at when you see, see these kinds of numbers coming up. Uh, but if it's not, it's just a bunch of numbers, and that's okay. At least that's okay for this demo. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and plot these so we can see what's going on. And this is always kind of fun. It's always nice to have a nice visual of what you're looking at. And you can see here, um, when we plot the coefficient scores on here, and we, the guys in the back did a great job putting some pretty colors together and making it look nice, and setting up the columns. You can see here, uh, your NOx has like just a huge coefficient. Um, when I look at a table like this, I look for what has very little um, different coefficients. So they're not using a huge change, and what has huge changes. And that flags you for all kinds of things as you're working with the data, but it depends so much on the domain you're working with. These are great things, though, as uh, just a quick look to see what's going on with your data and what you're looking for. And, of course, once we look at this, now our motive is to reduce the coefficient score. So now we want to take these and, and uh, bring them down as much as we can. And for that, we're going to work with the ridge regression on here. So let's start by going and we're going to import our uh, ridge model, the ridge regression from the sklearn library or the site kit. And we're going to go ahead and train the model. So here's our ridge um, r equals alpha equals 1. And I mentioned that earlier. Um, when I work with the ridge model, you'll see alpha equals 1. If you set alpha equal to 0, that's a standard linear regression model. So you have alpha equals 1, 2, 3, 4, and you usually use 1, 2, or 3, 4 in a standard integer on there. And we'll go ahead and fit the ridge model on there with our X train and our Y train data. Generate a prediction for that, um, for our X test, and we'll calculate the mean square error, uh, just like we did before. This should all look familiar. And we'll go ahead and print that out, and we'll look at the uh, ridge coefficients for our data and see what that looks like. Now, if I jump up and down between these two, you'll get a headache. Uh, <laughs> you'll still see the NOx value. Let's, let's just look at the NOx, because that was the biggest value, is a minus 9 here. And if we go back up here, the NOx value is a minus 18. So right off the bat, I'm seeing a huge change um, in the biggest coefficient there. Uh, so if we're going to do that nice setup, we want to go ahead and just print it and see what that looks like. Here we go. And we've uh, set up our um, plots, subplots, and again, the team put together some nice colors so it makes it look good. And we're doing an X bar based on the columns and our um, L regress coefficients, color equals color, X spine, bottom, and so forth. Uh, so just puts together a nice little graph. And you're starting to see, uh, one, this when you compare this, if you put it on the same graph as this one up here, this is up here at minus 18. This is at minus 9. And so this graph is half the size of the graph above. Uh, the same thing with these values here. 
they might look the same, but they're actually all um, almost half the value on here. And then finally, you can do the same thing for the lasso regression. This would all look uh, very similar as far as what we worked on before. And I'm just going to go ahead and print that on here and run it. And again, let's go up to uh, Knox. Look where Knox is. It's all the way down to zero. And if we look at our next biggest coefficient, it's minus 0.8. And really, here's our 22.73. We go up here, um, 16.7. And we go up here and we look at the same number, 16.69. Uh, and so we look at this, uh, if I was running this and doing a, working on a project with this, I would look at these numbers. I start with the 16.69, uh, come down here and compare it to 16.78. Uh, 6.9 6 is better than 7.8. Uh, so from the very beginning, we might start looking at this first model for overall predicting. But there's other factors involved. Uh, we might know that uh, the Knox value is central and the other ones aren't quite as good. And so we might start looking at just certain setups, like what is our what is this particular coefficient? Because it might have a certain meaning to us and so forth. And so you gotta look at all those different um, items in there. Again, but the bottom dollar is our first model did better than our other two models. Our mean square error on the test set um, continues to come down on this. Today we're going to look at feature selection in machine learning. What's in it for you? The need for feature selection. What is feature selection? Feature selection methods. Feature selection statistics. So the need for feature selection. To train a model we collect huge quantities of data to help the machine learn better. Consider a table which contains information on old cars. The model decides which cars must be crushed for spare parts. And when we talk about huge quantities of data, they save everything from people's favorite cat pictures to, and you can imagine there's so much data out there, even in a company, they'll save all these little pieces of information about people and companies and corporations. You need some way to sort through because if you try to run your models on all of it, you'll end up with these very clunky models and they might have uh, issues, which we'll talk about later. But in this case, we're talking about cars and crushing. But not all this data will be useful to us. Some classes or part of the data may not contribute much to our model and can be dropped. And you can see right here we have uh, who was the owner of the car. Um, in our data, a car will not be crushed based on its previous owner. Um, so that, you know, that's kind of a clear cut. You can see that. Why would I care who owned the car before? Once it's in the junkyard and we're crushing the cars, we're not going to really care about that. So here we have dropped the owner column as it does not contribute to the model. Having too much unnecessary data can cause the model to be slow. The model may also learn from this irrelevant data and be inaccurate. So feature selection is a process of reducing the input variable to your model by using only relevant data and getting rid of the noise in the data. Consider the database given below. A library wants to donate some old books to make place in their shelves for new books. We want to train a model to automate this task. In this case, the color of the book does not matter, and keeping it can cause a model to learn to donate books based on color. We can remove this as a feature. Using feature selection, we can optimize our model in several ways. And so the number one is to prevent learning from noise and overfitting. Uh, that's actually the huge one because we, we don't want it to give us the wrong prediction. And it, that means also improved accuracy. Uh, so instead of giving us a wrong prediction, we also want it to be as close to the right answer as we can get. And we want to reduce the training time. It's an exponential growth in some of these models. So the, each feature you add in increases that much more training time. We talk about feature selection methods. Uh, we put together a nice little flow chart that shows the various methods used for feature selection. And you have your basic feature selection and then there is supervised and unsupervised. Under supervised there's intrinsic, wrapper method, filter method. So when we talk about unsupervised feature selection it refers to the method which does not need the output label class for feature selection. 
and that was uh, you can see here under super unsupervised we don't have I mean that's really a growing market right now um, unsupervised learning and so feature selection is the same thing supervised feature selection refers to the method which uses the output label class for the feature selection and if you remember we looked at uh, three different we have intrinsic wrapper and filter method. So we're going to start with the filter method on this. Now remember, we know what the output is. So we're going to be looking at that output to see how well it's doing versus the features. In this method, features are dropped based on their relation to the output or how they are correlating to the output. And you can see here we have a set of features, selecting best feature, learning algorithm, and then performance. And so we want to find out which feature correlates to the performance on the output. Consider the example of book classifier. Here we drop the color column based on simple deduction. And that kind of sums it up in, the, in a nutshell, is we want to filter out things that clearly do not go with what we're looking for. We look at the wrapper method. Uh, in the wrapper method, we split our data into subsets and train a model using this. Based on the output of the model, we add and subtract features and train the model again. And you can see here in the wrapper method where we have a set of features, uh, we generate a subset, we run it through the algorithm, and we see how each one of those subset of features performs. Consider the book data set. By using the wrapper method, we would use a subset of different features to train the machine and adjust the subset according to the output. And so you can see here, let's say we take uh, name and number of times read, and we run just those, and we look at the output. And if we looked at them with all four inputs and look at the output, we'd see quite a different variation in there. And we might say, you know what, condition of the book and color really doesn't uh, affect what we're looking for. And you can see here we've run it on uh, condition of the book and color. Depending on the output of the model, we will choose our final set of features. These features will give us the best result for our model. And it might come up that the name, number of times read, is probably pretty important. The intrinsic method, uh, this method combines the qualities of both filter and wrapper method to create the best subset. The model will train and check the accuracy of different subsets and select the best among them. We kind of looked at a little overview of some of the stuff. Um, some of the common feature selection algorithms based on which method they belong to are given below. And you'll see it's primarily under supervised. There's not, like I said, a lot of unsupervised methods. And the ones that are usually use these methods and finds a way to create a supervised um, connection between the data. And we talk about supervised uh, methods. We have our filter method, which we talked about. Uh, and it uses like the Pearson's coefficient, uh, chi squared, ANOVA coefficient. Those are all under the filter method. And in the wrapper method, recursive feature elimination. So remember, we're choosing a subset, and we want to go through there and look at each one. So you're just doing a lot of loops or recursive um, calculations to see which one works best and which ones don't have an impact on the output. And there's a lot of genetic algorithms to go with this, too, on the wrapper method and how they evaluate it. And with the intrinsic method, uh, there's the two main ones we're looking at is the lasso regularization. The lasso algorithms are basically your standard um, regression model. So it's finding out how these different methods fit together and which ones have the best um, add together to have the least amount of error. The other one used in the intrinsic method is the decision tree. It says, hey, if this one is, uh, this one produces this result, this one produces this result, yes, no, which way do we go? Based on the input and the output variables, we can choose our feature selection model. So you have your numeric input coming in, you have your numeric output. If you use the Pearson's correlation coefficient or Spearman's rank coefficient, uh, you can then select what features you're going to feed into that specific model. And you maybe have a, a numerical input and a categorical input, so we're going to be looking more at a NOVA correlation coefficient or Kindle's rank coefficient. And if you have a core categorical input and a numerical output, we might be looking at a NOVA correlation coefficient and Kindle's rank coefficient. So based on the input and the output variables, we can choose our feature selection model. And you can see we have categorical to categorical. We might be looking at the um, chi-squared test um, contingency tables and mutual information. Let's go ahead and take a look and see uh, in the Python code what we're talking about here. And I'm going to go ahead and use for my IDE the Jupyter Notebook, in the, and I always launch it out of Anaconda on here. And we'll go ahead and go up here and create a new Python 3 module. And 
we'll call it uh, feature select. Since we're in Python, we're going to be working mainly with uh, your NumPy, your Pandas, your Matplot library. So we have our number array, our data frame setup, which goes with the number array, the NumPy, the Pandas data frame. And then we want to go ahead and graph everything. So we're going to import these three modules. And then we put down together some uh, data. Um, we're going to read this in. It's uh, Kobe Bryant. I guess he's a basketball player. Our guys in the back, uh, we have a number of them. Guys, it's both, we have a lot of men and women, so it's probably a misnomer. Our team in the back, um, they have a, some of them have a liking for basketball, and they know who Kobe Bryant is, and they want to learn a little bit more about Kobe Bryant and what's going in for what, whatever's going on with his game in basketball. So we're going to take a look at him. Uh, and once we import the data, we can see what columns are available, uh, original features count, so we can see how many features there are, um, the length of it, and we'll actually have a list of them, and then print just a, uh, the data head, the top five rows. And so when we do this, we can see from the CSV file, uh, we have 25 original features. Our original features are your action type, combined shot type, game event ID, and so forth. There's a lot of features in here that they recorded on all of his shots. This is what we talk about, like a massive amount of data. I mean, people are sitting there and they, they record all this stuff and they import this stuff for different reasons. But depending on what we want to look at, do we really want all those features? Maybe the question we're going to ask is, uh, what's the chance of him making any one specific shot? Um, and right from the beginning, we can look at the some of these things and say team name. Uh, team name probably, I don't know, maybe it does matter because the other team might be really good at defense. Uh, Game date, maybe we don't really want to look at the game date. Team ID, definitely not of importance in any of this. Uh, so when we look at this, we have 25 features, and some of these features just really don't matter to us. We also have location X, location Y, latitude and longitude. I'm guessing that's the same data. We've actually imported the, the very similar data. Maybe they're slightly zoned differently. But as far as our program, we don't want to repeat data. Some of the models, when you repeat data into them, and this is true for most models, create a huge bias. They weigh that data over other data. So just at a glance, these are the things we're looking at. We want to find out, well, how do we get this these features down and get rid of this bias and all these um, extraneous features that we don't really want to spend time running our models on and programming on. And as I pointed out, there's a location X, a location Y, latitude and longitude. Uh, let's just take a look at that and see what we're looking at here. Uh, we'll go ahead and create a plot of these. And we'll just plot, uh, we'll do a scatter plot of location X and location Y. And then we'll do a, um, a scatter plot of um, data lon, data lat, which is probably longitude and latitude. And the scatter plot. Let's go ahead and actually put a little title here, location and scatter on there. And we'll just go ahead and plot these. And when you look at this uh, coming in, these two graphs are pretty identical except they're flipped. And so when we look at the location from which they're shooting from, they're probably the same. And at this point we can say, okay, we can get rid of one of these sets of data. So we don't need both X and Y and latitude and longitude because it's the same data coming in. And as we look at this particular data, the latitude, longitude, uh, we might also ask, does it really make a difference which side of the court you're on, uh, whether you're on the left side or the right side? And so we might go ahead and explore, um, instead of looking at this as uh, x, y, we might look at it as a distance and an angle. And we can easily compute that. And you can see we can create our data distance equals the location x, um, plus the location y squared, standard uh, Euclidean geometry, or triangular geometry. <laughs> Hypotenuse squared equals the each side squared. And then uh, once we've done that, uh, we can also compute the angle. Uh, so the data angle is based on the arc tangent, uh, and so forth on here. So this is all this is, is we're just going to compute the angle here, and then set that up uh, pi over 2 to get our angle. And we'll go ahead and run that. 
and you'll see some errors run come up and that's because when we took slices over here we took a slice of a slice um, there's ways to fix that but it's really not important for this example uh, so if you do see that you want to start looking up here for um, instead of data location x of uh, not location x zero this would be like um, I believe the term is I lo dot I location uh, if this was yeah this is in pandas uh, so there's different things in there but for this it doesn't really matter uh, these are just warnings that's all they are and then let's combine our remaining minutes and seconds column into one uh, there's another one so if you remember up here we're trying to get rid of these columns do we really need let me see if I can find it on here there we go there's our minutes remaining um, and then they had what was it? It was uh, minutes remaining and seconds column. So there's also a seconds column on here. Uh, let me see if I can find that one. This is where it really gets kind of crazy because here's our seconds remaining. So you can see that and here's our minutes remaining. This gets crazy when you're looking at hundreds of these features. Uh, and you can see that if, if I'm going to say um, write a model that's going to predict a lot of this and I want it to run, in this case it's a basketball and how good his shots are, as the data comes in, let's say I want to have it run on your phone, if I'm running it across hundreds of features, it's going to just hang up on your phone, where if I can get it down to just a handful, um, we'll actually be able to come in here and run it on a smaller device and not use up as much memory or processing power. Uh, so we'll go ahead and take data remaining time here. Um, and data minutes remaining times 60 plus data seconds remaining. So we're just going to combine those. And we'll go ahead and reprint our data so we can see what we got um, coming across. We have our action type combined. And this is, we do this a lot. Uh, we want to take a look at, oops, I got it so, so zoomed in. Let me see if I can zoom out just a little bit. There we go. Uh, boom. All right, so we come up here, you can see that we now have our distance, our angle, remaining time, which is now just a number uh, that computes both the minutes and seconds together. And we still have, we've, we've been adding columns. I thought you said we we're supposed to subtract columns, right? Um, we're going to delete the obsolete columns when we get to them. Uh, so we're just filtering out, and this is the filter method. We're just filtering through the things uh, that we really don't need. And next, let's go ahead and explore team ID and team name. And let me just go ahead and run that. And if you look at this, uh, we have Los Angeles Lakers, and then they have the team ID here, and they're unique. Uh, there's not that's not really anything that's going to come up uh, because that's this particular athletes works for that team, so it's the same on every line. So there's another thing we can filter out on there. Team ID and team name is just useless. Uh, the whole column contains only one value each, and it's pretty much useless. Let's go ahead and take a look at matchup and opponent. That's an interesting one. And we see here that uh, we have the LAL versus POR, and the opponent is POR and IND. Again, here's a lot of duplicate information. Uh, so this basically contains the same information on here. Again, we're filtering all this stuff out, and this is because we're only looking at one athlete. And this might change if you're looking at multiple athletes, that kind of thing. Now, these are easy to see, but we might have something that looks more like this. Uh, we might have something where we're looking at the distance, which we computed, and the shot distance. Are they the same thing? And what we can do is we can plot that and plot them against each other on here, and we see it just draws a nice straight line. Uh, and so... Again, we're looking at the same information. So again, we're repeating stuff, and we really don't want to be running our model on uh, repeat information on here. So again, it contains the same information. So now let's look at the shot zone area, shot zone basic, shot zone range. So now we're looking at the zones, and what does that mean? And we'll go ahead and, and do this also in a scatter plot. Um, in this case, we're going to just create three of these side by side. So we're going to create um, our plot figure side 20 by 10. And then we're going to define our scatter plot by category feature. And we're going to do each one uh, set up on here, give it a slightly different color. And so our shot zone area is going to be plot uh, subplot 131. Scatter 131 is how that's read, by the way, uh, meaning that it's number one, 
Um, we have three across, and this is the first one down, so one, one, one. Our scatter plot by category is going to be the shot zone area. We're going to plot that, and then we're going to do the um, shot zone basic, and then the shot zone range, and each just push them through our definition. So each of those areas go through, and you'll see one, three, one, one, three, two, one, three, three. Again, it's a one by three um, setup, and then it's just a place on each one. And so when we look at this, we can see that these shots, uh, they map out the same. So it's very, again, redundant information. That should be intuitive. Um, when we're looking at this in these color graphs, it kind of helps. And you start looking at something you that, that's very intuitive, like this is, and you start to realize that some of this stuff um, you'll be looking for in data you might not understand. And you'll see these circular patterns where they match, or they mostly match. And you start to realize, um, when you're looking at these, that they're repetitive data. And then you want to explore them more closely, depending on what domain you're working in. So we, we look at these, and we look at them, and they look just like the regions of the court. Uh, but we already have stored this information in angle and distance columns. So we've seen this image before. We go back up here, and here's our the similar image. And repeating that image is down here, and so let's go ahead and drop some of this in this stuff. Uh, so now let's drop all the useless columns. And we can drop the shot ID, team ID, team name, shot zone area, shot zone range, shot zone basic, uh, the matchup, uh, the longitude and latitude, because we're putting that into distance, seconds remaining, minutes remaining, because we combine that into one column, shot distance, because we have just distance on there, location X, location Y, the game event ID, game ID, all of this stuff is just being dropped on here. And we'll just go ahead and loop through our drops. And this is a nice way of doing this, because as you're playing with this, um, this kind of data, putting your list into one setup helps, uh, because then you're just running it through an iteration, and you can come back and change it. Uh, you might be playing with different models and do this with models. You might be looking at all kinds of different things that you can drop and add in as you test these out. And again, we're working in the filter method. So this is a lot of human interaction with the data. And it takes a lot of critical thinking to look at this stuff and say what matches and what doesn't. And so when we look at the remaining features, uh, let me go ahead and just run this. Uh, the original to the new count, we had 25 features. Now we have 11 features. You can see that right there. We just circle that. There's our 25, and there's uh, old, new. Now we're down to 11. So we've cut it down to less than half. Uh, and you can just see the actual different information on here and the remaining time. At this point, we filtered it through, and then we'd move into the next process, which would be to run our model on this, and maybe we would drop... Um, some of the features and see if it runs better or worse and what happens. Uh, that's kind of would be the next step on there versus this is the filter setup and that would be one of the other setups depending on which algorithm you use. So that wraps up our demo on uh, filter, the feature selection and going through and seeing how these different features are being repeated in this particular in a basketball uh, setup. Hi everyone. Today we have a really interesting topic for you. In this video We'll be analyzing the upcoming United States presidential election using Twitter sentiment analysis in Python. In the course of this session, we will understand in brief about the upcoming election, the candidates fighting the 2020 US election, and throw light on the result of the 2016 US election. We'll look at the election forecast by some of the popular news agencies, as well as poll analysis websites such as 538. Before we begin, I want to make it clear that this video is solely for learning purposes. We at Simply Learn do not lean towards any party in the United States or are biased towards any candidate. The analysis is based on what people have tweeted and we will understand the mood and sentiment of the public. The main objective of this video is to help you understand how to extract tweets from Twitter handles using Python libraries, store it in a CSV file and perform textual analysis. The results obtained are purely based on the data that we have collected. Let's begin. The battle for the 2020 US presidential election has begun with the 59th United States presidential election scheduled to be held on the 3rd of November 2020. This will decide who will be in the White House for the next four years. All 435 seats in the United States House of Representatives, 35 of the 100 seats in the United States Senate and Office of the President of the United States will be contested. 
Both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party have nominated their respective president and vice presidential candidates. The incumbent president, Donald Trump, is the Republican nominee, while the 47th vice president of the United States, Joe Biden, is the Democratic Party's nominee. The current vice president, Mike Pence, is the Republican Party's vice presidential nominee and is running for a second term in office. Senator Kamala Harris of California was chosen by Joe Biden as his running mate on 11th of August 2020. Now, let's see the results of the last US presidential election in 2016. The Republican ticket of businessman Donald Trump and Indiana Governor Mike Pence had defeated the Democratic ticket of former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and US Senator from Virginia Tim Kaine. Donald Trump received a total of 304 electoral votes while Hillary Clinton got 227 electoral votes. A significant number of central states in the United States were swept by the Republican Party. It was surprising to see that Donald Trump getting nearly 46.4% popular vote as compared to Hillary Clinton who got 48.5% votes. Donald Trump's victory came after crucial wins in the battleground states of Florida, Ohio, Iowa, North Carolina and Pennsylvania. Will Donald Trump be re-elected to the White House or are we going to see a new president and a vice president of the United States is the big question. Let's see what our pollsters have to say and what has been their forecast for the upcoming election. According to 538, Donald Trump has not gained ground since the final debate on 22nd of October. At this moment, Joe Biden is favored to win the election and he leads in both national and state polls. The Economist is analyzing polling, economic and demographic data to predict the US elections. Their model thinks Joe Biden is very likely to beat Donald Trump in the Electoral College. As per their forecast, Joe Biden has 96% chance of winning the Electoral College and there's 99% chance of Biden winning the most votes. The Democrats have 75% chance of controlling the Senate while the Republicans have around 25%. The Democrats are highly likely to keep their majority in the House of Representatives. Now, according to The Guardian, Joe Biden is leading Donald Trump in the national polls for the presidential election. But to keep in mind, this does not guarantee the Democratic candidate Joe Biden's victory. Hillary Clinton also had a clear lead over Donald Trump in the polls for almost the entire 2016 campaign. She ended up losing the Electoral College. Now, the BBC forecast tells that Biden is leading national presidential polls with 51%. He has hovered around 50% in recent months and has had a 10-point lead on occasions. So clearly, Joe Biden is set to be the next US president. Let's wait and watch what happens on the 3rd of November. The voters of America will decide on 3rd of November whether Donald Trump remains in the White House for another four years. Let's perform a Twitter sentiment analysis to understand the sentiments of people tweeting about Donald Trump and Joe Biden by tagging them in their tweets. We have our code implemented already. I'll run through each line of code and explain our analysis in detail. The objective is to check the polarity of each tweet to figure out if it's positive, negative or neutral. We'll compare the tweets of Donald Trump and Joe Biden to see who people are favoring the most. Finally, we learn to create a word cloud. I have already extracted the tweets and stored them in two separate CSV files. It takes some time to fetch 10,000 tweets Hence, it won't be possible for me to show it to you live. If you want to know how we extracted the tweets for Donald Trump and Joe Biden, then please put your email IDs in the comment section of the video. We'll share the code file and the source file with you. Now, you would need to install the TweetP library, fetch the Twitter keys and access tokens, and then authenticate the Twitter API. I've extracted 5,000 tweets each for Donald Trump and Joe Biden, converted it into a data frame, and stored it in a CSV file. So let me open and show you both the files. So here is my data set for Donald Trump. On the top you can see Trump underscore data 5000 which means there are 5000 tweets here. The first column has the number of tweets. It starts from 0 and goes all the way to 4999. The next column is the text column which has the content of the tweet. You can see they have tagged at the rate real Donald Trump. There are links as well. There are special characters like emoticons. And the third column is the user, which means it's the username who had put that tweet. Similarly, 
I have another data for Biden. You can see these are for Joe Biden and here you can see the content they have tagged Kamala Harris also. Similarly, we have the username. Now let me take you straight to my Jupyter Notebook where I have implemented the code. Okay, so first and foremost, let's import all the required libraries. So we have the NumPy library for numerical computation. Then we have the Pandas library for data manipulation. Next we are importing two libraries matplotlib and seaborn for data visualization. Then we have text blob and word cloud to get the sentiment and to build the word cloud. And finally we are importing the plotly library for creating graphs. Let me run this cell. In the current cell we'll import the data sets using read underscore csv function present in the pandas library. So I have passed in my location where the data file is so I have placed it on my desktop and the index underscore col parameter or column parameter refers to the columns to be used as the row labels of the data frame. Here 0 indicates that the first column will be used as row labels. Let me run it. Ok, now we have imported both the data files. Let me go ahead and print the shape of one of the data frames. So I'll write print. Let's say we'll check the shape of Biden data frame. So I'll write print Biden dot shape. I'll hit shift enter. You can see there are 5000 rows and there are two columns. One is the text column and the next column is the user column. Now let me go ahead and print the head of the data sets. So the head function will return the first five rows. I'll write trump dot head. You can see these are the first five rows from the trump data frame. And similarly, if you want to check for Biden, I can write Biden dot head. You can see it here. Now you can also use the info method. So let me show you that you can write drum dot info. And this is the result. So it tells there are 5000 entries from 0 to 4999. There are two columns. And these are the number of rows. And similarly you have the data types. Ok. Moving ahead. In the next cell I am displaying the 200th tweet present in the Trump data frame. So I have my data frame name mentioned. Then I have my text column. And inside one more square bracket I have put 200 which means I want to see what's there in the 200th row. If I hit enter. So you can see this was the tweet. Fake shit. Fake president. Next, let me show you the tweet number 1000 for Biden. So I'll write Biden and inside square brackets I'll give the text column and the number is 1000. If I hit shift enter, so this is the tweet. Now, the text blob function is used in natural language processing. The sentiment property returns a named tuple in the form of sentiment in brackets polarity and subjectivity. Let's check the sentiment of the 200th tweet made for Donald Trump. If I hit shift enter, you can see this was the polarity. Now minus 0 0.399 means the polarity was negative and you can see the subjectivity is around 0 0.933. Similarly, Let's check for Biden's tweet number 1000. So I'll write text blob which is my function name and inside brackets I'll give Biden then pass in my column name that is text and I'll give the row number which is 1000 and then I'll give the parameter or the attribute sentiment. I hit shift enter you can see the polarity and the subjectivity. Now moving ahead here I have defined a function that will add another column called polarity to our two data frames Trump and Biden. Let me run this. Okay. 
in the next cell I have used the apply function that will return the polarity based on the tweets you can see we have the apply function this might take some time to run it okay we are done now let me now display the top five rows of the data frame so what I'll do is I'll click on this cell go to insert and I'll hit insert cell below let's do one more okay now here I'll display the head of the data frame once again so that you can see the polarity column added you can see it here so for Donald Trump we have the polarity you can see the tweet and the polarity now 0.0, .0 which means these are neutral minus is negative and anything that's in positive value indicates it's a positive tweet or it has positive polarity similarly let's see for Biden I'll write Biden dot head okay so here you can see the polarity for Biden now this 0.5 means it's a positive tweet okay now I want to create another column called expression where we will classify the tweets as positive negative or neutral based on the polarity value so I have used the NP dot where function and the condition we have here is if polarity is greater than 0 it's a positive tweet else if it is less than 0 it's a negative tweet and if the polarity is equal to 0 it means it's a neutral tweet let me run this okay so here you can see we have the column called expression and it has classified the polarity based on negative neutral as well as positive similarly let's do the same for Biden data frame as well okay before moving ahead if you want to get access to the source code and the data sets we have used in this demo then please put your email address in the chat section we'll send it to you via mail also please subscribe to simply learn channel and hit the bell icon to never miss an update from simply learn in the next cell of code we have another function that will basically help us creating a bar plot based on the expression column from both the data frames so this is my user defined function name and it has two parameters reviews and title you can see we have grouped the expression column and found out the count using the count function then we have created or converted it into a list similarly below you can see here we have defined the color for the bars using RGB values now let me run it okay so we have successfully created our user defined function now let me go ahead and call the function and pass in my two parameters reviews and title so here we have the function name and under reviews we have the data frame name Trump and the title we have given is analysis for Trump let me run this okay so you can see we have a horizontal bar plot on the top you can see the title of the plot which is analysis for Trump and as per the tweets it has classified as positive neutral or negative if I hover over you can see there were 2831 neutral tweets 1211 positive tweets and similarly there were 958 negative tweets for Donald Trump now let me call that function once again so I'll write exp underscore graph which is my function name then I'll pass in my parameters this time I'll take Biden and the title I'll put is analysis for Biden if I run it okay you can see the plot for Biden now if I hover over there were 1290 positive tweets for Biden and 747 negative tweets okay let's scroll down now let me check the number of rows that have polarity equal to 0 the number of rows that have polarity less than 0 and greater than 0 for both the data frames using the 
dot shape attribute so first we have for trump now equal to equal to zero means we are checking the total number of neutral tweets you can see the result now let's check for biden we have the result below let me run it okay now we'll drop those columns that have a polarity equal to zero from both the data frames and display the shape you can see we have the condition mentioned and we have also used the drop function so all the neutral tweets will be deleted and i'm printing the shape of the data frame there you go so out of the 5000 tweet it has deleted all the neutral tweets or dropped all the neutral tweets and this is the final result in the current cell we have defined another function called balanced underscore data now this will help us get an equal number of rows and columns and delete a specified number of rows let me run it all right now i'll call that function to delete 169 rows from the trump's data frame and 37 rows from biden's data frame this will help us subset the data frames you can see we have now 2000 tweets from each of the data frames up next we'll create some visualizations to analyze the textual data so first i'm using the seaborn library and creating a distribution plot for donald trump if i hit shift enter you can see this is the distribution plot thus there are bars at the back and there's a trend line okay Similarly, let me now create a box plot. So this is a box plot. Here you can see there are some outliers. Now let me add a few cells below so that I can show that plot for Biden. So I'll write SNS dot. I'll use the function dist plot, and under dist plot, I'll give Biden underscore subset and I'll pass in my column that is polarity let me run it so this is the distribution plot for Joe Biden and now let me also create the box plot so I'll use the seaborn library and the box plot function I'll pass in my data frame which is Biden underscore subset and I'll give my column name that is polarity I'll run it so here you can see the box plot for Joe Biden let me tell you how you can create a cross table using the group by function so before coming to this cell of code let me insert cell above okay now using group by function you can create a cross table so I'll use the Trump underscore subset data frame and then I'll give my group by function and inside group by function I'll give my expression column and I'll count the number of expressions if I run this you can see this is a cross table similarly you can do it for Joe Biden as well I'll just replace the names I'll write Biden and the rest is the same you can see this is the cross table for Biden underscore subset now moving ahead let's find the polarity percentage for negative and positive tweets to do this I have defined a function called poll underscore percent and we have two parameters declared subset and total let me run this okay now here I am calling the above defined function and printing the polarity percentage for Biden and Trump and I have mentioned my two parameters subset and the total number so these are the values moving ahead 
Now let's create a bar graph that will show the negative and positive polarity percentage for Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Let me hit shift enter. You can see we have a really good bar graph now. If I hover the mouse cursor, you can see Donald Trump had 27.825% of positive tweets and 22.17 negative. Similarly, Joe Biden had 31.6 positive tweets and 18.4 negative tweets. Now we want to find the public sentiment based on Trump and Biden tweets. Let me run this two cells first. Okay. Now for Donald Trump, the total positive polarity is a combination of Trump's total positive percentage and Biden's negative percentage. Similarly, for Joe Biden, the total positive polarity is a combination of Biden's total positive percentage and Trump's negative percentage. Let me run this. You can see the result here. Next, let's plot a horizontal bar graph to visualize the public sentiment. We have our X and Y labels defined. We also have set our bar colors with the help of RGB values and we have the title as well. Now if I go up, you can see this is the public sentiment. So 26.88 is the percentage that is in favor of Joe Biden and for Donald Trump we have 23.11. Now in the next cell of code, we have a user defined function that will basically plot a table which has the most positive tweets for Donald Trump and Joe Biden. The condition we are checking is that the polarity should be equal to 1. So if it's close to 1 or equal to 1, which means the tweet has positive polarity. Let me run it. Okay. Now let me go ahead and call the function now. Let me scroll over to the top. You can see these are the top five positive tweets for Donald Trump. And here you can see the top five positive tweets for Joe Biden. Likewise, let's check the polarity for most negative tweets. Here the condition will be the polarity should be equal to minus one, which means it's highly negative. Let me run it. Okay, now let's go ahead and call the function negative tweets. So I'll write neg underscore tweets and then inside bracket I'll give my parameters which is trump underscore subset and then I'll give my title as negative tweets for Donald Trump. Okay, now I'll just copy this. We'll also check for Joe Biden. So I'll just replace this with Biden and let's say negative tweet for Joe Biden. Let's run it. Okay, if I go on top, here you can see the top negative tweets for Donald Trump and similarly we have the top five negative tweets for Joe Biden. All right. Finally, let's see how to create a word cloud. Now word cloud is a method to show which words are most frequently occurring among the given text. I have defined a function called word cloud you can see here and it has two parameters data and title inside the built-in function or the word cloud function we have mentioned the max font size the maximum words scale value there's also background color which is white okay let's run it now this will create a word cloud so let me go ahead and call the word cloud function and pass in the arguments. So I'll write word cloud, which is my user defined function. 
and I'll give my parameters trump underscore subset comma I'll give my title as word cloud for Donald Trump let's say Donald Trump tweet replies okay similarly let's do it for Joe Biden I'll write word cloud Biden underscore subset and then I'll give the title as word cloud for Joe Biden tweet replies okay let me run it there you go you can see we have a nice word cloud so on the top you can see the title which says word cloud for Donald Trump tweet replies so here you can see some of the words like real Donald Trump then there's president love right all these similarly if I scroll down you can see the word cloud for Joe Biden tweet replies you can see this is the handle Joe Biden false there are some other words like due taxes believe even will it's fact and you can see Kamala Harris name here okay now that brings us to the end of this demo on Twitter sentiment analysis using text data you learned how to classify tweets and find the polarity we also looked at how to create interesting visualizations with this data and understood the mood of the public finally you saw how to create a word cloud that had the most frequently occurring words in the tweets today we'll talk about interview questions for machine learning now this video will probably help you when you are attending interviews or machine learning positions and the attempt here is to probably consolidate 30 most commonly asked uh, questions and to help you in answering these questions we tried our best to give you the best possible answers but of course what is more important here is rather than the theoretical knowledge you need to kind of add to the answers or supplement your answers with your own experience so the responses that we put here are a bit more generic in nature so that if there are some concepts that you are not clear this video will help you in kind of getting those concepts cleared up as well but what is more important is that you need to supplement these responses with your own practical experience okay so with that let's get started so one of the first questions that you may face is what are the different types of machine learning now what is the best way to respond to this there are three types of machine learning if you read any material you will always be told there are three types of machine learning but what is important is you would uh, probably be better off emphasizing that there are actually two main types of machine learning which is supervised and unsupervised and then there is a third type which is reinforcement learning so supervised learning is where you have some historical data and then you feed that data to your model to learn now you need to be aware of a keyword that they will be looking for which is labeled data right so if you just say past data or historical data the impact may not be so much you need to emphasize on labeled data so what is labeled data basically let's say if you are trying to do train your model for classification you need to be aware of for your existing data which class each of the observations belong to right so that is what is labeling so it is nothing but a fancy name you must be already aware but just make it a point to throw in that keyword labeled so that will have the right impact okay so that is what is supervised learning when you have existing labeled data which you then use to train your model that is known as supervised learning and unsupervised learning is when you don't have this labeled data so you have data it is not labeled so the system has to figure out a way to do some analysis on that 
class. Okay, so that is unsupervised learning. And you can then add a few things like what, what are the ways of performing uh, supervised learning and unsupervised learning or what are some of the techniques. So supervised learning, we, we perform or we do uh, regression and classification and unsupervised learning, uh, we do clustering. Okay? And clustering can be of different types. Similarly, regression can be of different types, but you don't have to probably elaborate so much. If they are asking uh, for uh, just the different types, you can just mention these and just at a very high level, you can see. But if they want you to elaborate, give examples, then of course, if, I think there is a different question for that. We will see that later. Then the third, so we have supervised, then we have unsupervised, and then reinforcement. You need to provide a little bit of information around that as well because it is uh, sometimes a little difficult to come up with a good definition for reinforcement learning so you may have to a little bit elaborate on how reinforcement learning works right so reinforcement learning works in in such a way that it basically has two parts to it one is the agent and the environment and the agent basically is working inside of this environment and it is given a target that it has to achieve and uh, every time it is moving in the direction of the target so the agent basically has to take uh, some action and every time it takes an action which is moving uh, the agent towards the target right towards a goal uh, a target is nothing but a goal okay then it is rewarded and every time it is going in a direction where it is away from the goal then it is punished so that is the way you can a little bit explain and uh, this is used primarily or very very impactful for teaching the system to learn games and so on examples of this are basically used in AlphaGo you can throw that as an example where AlphaGo used reinforcement learning to actually learn to play the game of go and finally it defeated the go world champion right this much of information that would be good enough okay then there could be a question on overfitting uh, so the question could be what is overfitting and how can you avoid it so what is overfitting so let's first try to understand the concept because sometimes overfitting may be a little, little difficult to understand. Overfitting is a situation where the model has uh, kind of memorized the data. So this is an equivalent of memorizing the data. So we can draw an analogy so that it becomes easy to explain this. Now let's say you're teaching a child about some recognizing some fruits or something like that. Okay, and you're teaching this child about recognizing, let's say three fruits, apples, oranges, and pineapples. Okay, so this is a, a small child and for the first time you're teaching the child to recognize fruits. Then, so what will happen? So this is very much like that is your training data set. So what you will do is you will take a basket of fruits which consists of apples, oranges and pineapples. Okay, and you take this basket to this child and uh, there may be let's say hundreds of these fruits so you take this basket to this child and keep showing each of this fruit and then first time obviously the child will not know what it is so you show an apple and you say hey this is apple then you show maybe an orange and say this is orange and so on and so forth and then again you keep repeating that right so till that basket is over this is basically how training works in machine learning also that's how training works so Till the basket is completed, maybe 100 fruits, you keep showing this child. And then in the process, what has happened, the child has pretty much memorized these. So even before you finish that uh, basket, right? By the time you are halfway through, the child has learned about uh, recognizing the apple, orange and pineapple. Now what will happen after halfway through, initially you remember it made mistakes in recognizing but halfway through now it has learned. So every time you show a fruit, it will exactly, 100% accurately, it will identify. It will say, the child will say this is an apple, this is an orange and uh, if you show a pineapple, it will say this is a pineapple. Right? So that means it has kind of memorized this data. Now let's say you bring another basket of fruits and it will have a mix of maybe apples which were already there in the previous set but it will also have in addition to apple it will probably have a banana or maybe another fruit like a jackfruit. Right. So this is an equivalent of your test data set, which the child has not seen before. Some parts of it, it probably has seen like the apples it has seen, but this banana and uh, jackfruit it has not seen. So then what will happen in the first round, which is an equivalent of your training data set towards the end, it has 100% it was telling you what the fruits are. 
right? Apple was accurately recognized. Orange were, was accurately recognized and pineapples were accurately recognized, right? So that is like 100% accuracy. But now when you get another a fresh uh, set, which were not a part of the original one, what will happen? All the apples, maybe it will be able to recognize correctly, but all the others like the jackfruit or the banana will not be recognized by the child. Right? So this is an analogy, this is an equivalent of overfitting. So what has happened during the training process, it is able to recognize or reach 100% accuracy maybe, very high accuracy. Okay, And we call that as very low loss. Right, So that is the technical term. So the loss is pretty much zero and accuracy is pretty much 100%. Whereas when you use testing, there will be a huge error, which means the loss will be pretty high and therefore the accuracy will be also low. Okay, this is known as overfitting. This is basically a process where training is done. Training process is, it goes very well, almost reaching 100% accuracy, but while testing, it really drops down. Now, how can you avoid it? So that is the extension of this question. There are multiple ways of avoiding overfitting. There are techniques like what you call regularization. That is the most common technique that is used uh, for uh, avoiding overfitting. And within regularization, there can be a few other uh, subtypes like dropout in case of neural networks and a few other examples. But I think if you uh, give example or if you give regularization as the technique, probably that should be sufficient. So, so there will be some questions where the interviewer will try to test your fundamentals and your knowledge and depth of knowledge and so on and so forth. And then there will be some questions which are more like trick questions that will be more to stump you. Okay, then the next question is around the methodology. So when we are performing machine learning training, we split the data into training and test, right? So this question is around that. So the question is, what is training set and test set in machine learning model? And how is the split done? So the question can be like that. So in machine learning, when we are trying to train the model, so we have a three-step process. We train the model and then we test the model and then once we are satisfied with the test, only then we deploy the model. So what happens in the train and test is that you remember the labeled data. So let's say you have 1000 records with labeling information. Now, one way of doing it is you use all the 1000 records for training and then maybe right which means that you have exposed all this thousand records during the training process and then you take a small set of the same data and then you say okay i will test it with this okay and then you probably what will happen you may get some good results right but there is a flaw there what is the flaw this is very similar to human beings it is like you are showing this model the entire data as a part of training Okay. So obviously it has become familiar with the entire data. So when you're taking a part of that again and you're saying that I want to test it, obviously you will get good results. So that is not a very accurate way of testing. So that is the reason what we do is we have the label data of this thousand records or whatever. We set aside before starting the training process, we set aside a portion of that data and we call that test set. And the remaining we call as training set and we use only this for training our model. Now, the training process, remember, is not just about passing one round of this data set. So let's say now your training set has 800 records. It is not just one time you pass this 800 records. What you normally do is you actually, as a part of the training, you may pass this data through the model multiple times. So this thousand records may go through the model maybe 10, 15, 20 times till the training is perfect, till the accuracy is high, till the errors are minimized okay now so which is fine which means that your that is what is known as the model has seen your data and gets familiar with your data and now when you bring your test data what will happen is this is like some new data because that is where the real test is now you have trained the model and now you are testing the model with some data which is kind of new that is like a situation like like a realistic situation because when the model is deployed that is what will happen it will receive some new data not the data that it has already Already seen, right? So this is a realistic test. So you put some new data. So this data which you have set aside is for the model, it is new. And if it is able to accurately predict the values, that means your training has worked. 
okay the model got trained properly but let's say while you're testing this with this test data you're getting a lot of errors that means you need to probably either change your model or retrain with more data and things like that now coming back to the question of how do you split this what should be the ratio there is no fixed uh, number again this is like individual preferences some people split it into 50 50 50 percent test and 50 percent training some people prefer to have a larger amount for training and a smaller amount for test so they can go by either 60 40 or 70 30 or some people even go with some odd numbers like 65 35 or uh, 63.33 and 33, which is like one third and two third so there is no fixed rule that it has to be something the ratio has to be this you can go by your individual preferences all right then you may have questions around uh, data handling data manipulation or what do you call data management or preparation so these are all some questions around that area there is again no one answer one single good answer to this it really varies from situation to situation and depending on what exactly is the problem what kind of data it is how critical it is what kind of data is missing and what is the type of corruption so there are a whole lot of things this is a very generic question and therefore you need to be a little careful about uh, responding to this as well so probably have to illustrate this again if you have experience in doing this kind of work in handling data you can illustrate with examples saying that i was on one project where i received this kind of data these were the columns uh, where data was not filled or these were the this many rows where the data was uh, missing that would be in fact a perfect way to respond to this question but if you don't have that obviously if you have to provide some good answer i think it really depends on what exactly the situation is and there are multiple ways of handling the missing data or corrupt data now let's take a few examples now let's say you have data where some values in some of the columns are missing and you have pretty much half of your data having these missing values in terms of number of rows okay that could be one situation another situation could be that you have records or data missing but uh, when you do some initial calculation how many records are corrupt or how many rows or observations as we call it has this missing data let's assume it is very minimal like uh, 10 percent okay now between these two cases how do you so let's assume that this is not a mission critical situation and in order to fix this 10 percent of the data the effort that is required is much higher and obviously effort means also time and money right so it is not so mission critical and it is okay to let's say get rid of these records so obviously one of the easiest ways of handling the data part or missing data is remove those records or remove those observations from your analysis so that is the easiest way to do but then the downside is as i said in as in the first case if let's say 50 percent of your data is like that because some column or the other is missing so it is not like every in every place in every row the same column is missing but you have in maybe 10 percent of the records column one is missing and another 10 percent column two is missing another 10 percent column three is missing and so on and so forth so it adds up to maybe half of your data set so you cannot completely remove half of your data set then the whole purpose is lost Okay. so then how do you handle then you need to come up with ways of filling up this data with some meaningful value right that is one way of handling so when we say meaningful value what is that meaningful value let's say for a particular column you might want to take a mean value for that column and fill wherever the data is missing fill up with that mean value so that when you're doing the calculations your analysis is not completely way off so you have values are not missing first of all so your system will work number two these values are not so completely out of whack that your whole analysis goes for a toss right there may be situations where if the missing values instead of putting mean may be a good idea to uh, fill it up with the minimum value or with a zero so or with a maximum value again as i said there are so many possibilities so there is no like one correct answer for this you need to basically uh, talk around this and illustrate with your experience as i said that would be the best otherwise this is how you need to handle this question okay so then the next question can be how can you choose a classifier based on a training set data size so again this is one of those questions uh, where you probably do not have uh, like a one size fits all answer first of all you may not uh, let's say uh, decide your classifier based on the training set size 
may be not the best way to decide the type of the classifier. And uh, even if you have to, there are probably some thumb rules which we can use. But then again, every time, so in my opinion, the best way to respond to this question is you need to try out few classifiers irrespective of the size of the data. And you need to then decide on your particular situation, which of these classifiers are the right ones. This is a very generic issue. So you will never be able to just by if somebody defines a, a problem to you and somebody even if, you, if they show the data to you or tell you what is the data or even the size of the data i don't think there is a way to really say that yes this is the classifier that will work here no that's not the right way so you need to still uh, you know test it out get the data try out a couple of classifiers and then only you will be in a position to decide which classifier to use you try out multiple classifiers see which one gives the best accuracy and only then you can decide then you can have a question around confusion matrix so the question can be explain confusion matrix so confusion matrix, I think the best way to explain it is by taking an example and drawing like a small diagram. Otherwise, it can really become tricky. So my suggestion is to take a piece of pen and paper and uh, explain it by drawing a small a matrix. And confusion matrix is about to find out this is used especially in classification uh, learning process. And uh, when you get the results, when the, our model predicts the results, you compare it with the actual value and try to find out what is the accuracy okay so in this case let's say this is an example of a confusion matrix and uh, it is a binary matrix so you have the actual values which is the labeled data right and uh, which is so you have how many yes and how many no so you have that information and you have the predicted values how many yes and how many no right so the total actual values the total yes is 12 plus 130 and they are shown here and uh, the actual value no's are 9 plus 3 12 okay so that is what this information here is so this is about the actual and this is about the predicted similarly the predicted values there are yes are 12 plus 3 15 yeses and no are 1 plus 9 10 no's Okay, so this is the way to look at this confusion matrix. Okay, and uh, out of this, what is the meaning conveyed? So there are two or three things that needs to be explained outright. The first thing is for a model to be accurate, the values across the diagonal should be high, like in this case, right? That is one. Number two, the total sum of these values is equal to the total observations in the test data set. So in this case, for example, you have 12 plus 3, 15 plus 10, 25. So that means we have 25 observations in our test data set. Okay, so these are the two things you need to first explain that the total sum in this matrix of the numbers is equal to the size of the test data set and the diagonal values indicate the accuracy. So by just by looking at it, you can uh, probably have an idea about is this uh, an accurate model? Is the model being accurate? If they're all spread out equally in all these four boxes, that means probably the uh, accuracy is not very good. Okay. Now, how do you calculate the accuracy itself? Right. How do you calculate the accuracy itself? So it is a very simple mathematical calculation. You take some of the diagonals. Right. So in this case, it is 9 plus 12, 21 and divide it by the total. So in this case, what will it be? Let me uh, take a pen. So your your diagonal values is equal to if I say D is equal to 12 plus 9. So that is 21. Right. And the total data set is equal to right. We just calculated it is 25. So what is your accuracy? It is 21 by so your accuracy is equal to 21 by 25. And this turns out to be about 85%. Right. So this is 85 percent. So that is our accuracy. OK, so this is the way you need to explain. Draw a diagram, give an example. And maybe it may be a good idea to be prepared with an example so that it becomes easy for you. you don't have to calculate those numbers on the fly. Right. So a couple of uh, hints are that you take some numbers which are with which add up to 100. That is always a good idea. So you don't have to really do this complex calculations. So the total value will be 100 and then diagonal values you divide. Once you find the diagonal values, that is equal to your percentage. OK. All right. So the next question can be a related question about false positive and false negative. 
So what is false positive and what is false negative? Now, once again, the best way to explain this is using a piece of paper and pen. Otherwise, it will be pretty difficult to, to explain this. So we use the same example of the confusion matrix and uh, we can explain that. So a confusion matrix looks somewhat like this. And um, when we just take look somewhat like this and we continue with the previous example where this is the actual value this is the predicted value and uh, in the actual value we have 12 plus 1 13 yeses and 3 plus 9 12 noes and the predicted values there are 12 plus 3 15 yeses and uh, 1 plus 9 10 noes okay now in this particular case which is the false positive what is a false positive first of all the second word which is positive Okay, is referring to the predicted value. So that means the system has predicted it as a positive, but the real value, so this is what the false comes from, but the real value is not positive. Okay, that is the way you should understand this term false positive or even false negative. So false positive, so positive is what your system has predicted. So where is that system predicted? This is the one. Positive is what? Yes. So you basically consider this row. Okay. Now if you consider this row, so this is this is all positive values. This entire row is positive values. Okay. Now the false positive is the one which where the value, actual value is negative. Predicted value is positive, but the actual value is negative. So this is a false positive, right? And here is a true positive. So the predicted value is positive and the actual value is also positive. Okay. I hope this is making sense. Now let's take a look at what is false negative. False negative. So negative is the second term. That means that is the predicted value that we need to look for. So which are the predicted negative values? This row corresponds to predicted negative values. All right. So this row corresponds to predicted negative values. And what they are asking for? False. So this is the row for predicted negative values and the actual value is this one right this is predicted negative and the actual value is also negative therefore this is a true negative so the false negative is this one predicted is negative but actual is positive right so this is the false negative so this is the way to explain and this is the way to look at false positive and false negative same way there can be true positive and true negative as well so again positive the second term you will need to use to identify the predicted row right so if we say true positive positive we need to take for the predicted part so predicted positive is here okay and then the first term is for the actual so true positive so true in case of actual is yes right so true positive is this one okay and then in case of actual the negative now we are talking about let's say true negative true negative negative is this one and the true comes from here so this is true negative right? 9 is true negative. The actual value is also negative and the predicted value is also negative. Okay. So that is the way you need to explain this, the terms false positive, false negative and true positive, true negative. Then uh, you might have a question like what are the steps involved in the machine learning process or what are the three steps in the process of developing a uh, machine learning model right so it is around the methodology that is applied so basically the way you can probably answer in your own words but the way the model development of the machine learning model happens is like this so first of all you try to understand the problem and try to figure out whether it is a classification problem or a regression problem Based on that, you select a few algorithms and then you start the process of training these models. Okay, so you can either do that or you can, after due diligence, you can probably uh, decide that there is one particular algorithm that, which is most suitable. Usually it happens through trial and error process, but at some point you will decide that, okay, this is the model we are going to use. Okay, so in that case, we have the model algorithm and the model decided and then you need to do the process of training the model and testing the model. And this is where if it is supervised learning, you split your data, the label data into training data set and test data set. And you use the training data set to train your model. And then you use the test data set to check the accuracy, whether it is working fine or not. So you test the model before you actually 
put it into production, right? So once you test the model, you're satisfied, it's working fine, then you go to the next level, which is putting it for production. And then in production, obviously new data will come and uh, the inference happens. So the model is readily available and only thing that happens is new data comes and the model predicts the values, whether it is regression or classification. Now, so this can be an iterative process. So it is not a straightforward process where you do the training, do the testing, and then you move it to production now. So during the training and test process, there may be a situation where because of either overfitting or, or things like that, the test doesn't go through, which means that you need to put that back into the training process. So that can be a, an iterative process. Not only that, even if the training and test goes through properly and you deploy the model in production, there can be a situation that the data that actually comes real data that comes with that this model is failing so in which case you may have to once again go back to the drawing board or initially it will be working fine but over a period of time maybe due to the change in the nature of the data once again the accuracy will deteriorate so that is again a recursive process so once in a while you need to keep checking whether the model is working fine or not and if required you need to tweak it and modify it and so on and so forth so net net this is a continuous process of um, tweaking the model and testing it and making sure it is up to date then you might have question around deep learning so because deep learning is now associated with ai artificial intelligence and so on so it can be as simple as what is deep learning so uh, i think the best way to respond to this could be deep learning is a part of machine learning and then, then the, obviously the, the question would be then what is the difference right so deep learning you need to mention there are two key parts that interviewer will be looking for when you are defining deep learning so first is of course deep learning is a subset of machine learning so machine learning is still the bigger let's say uh, scope and deep learning is one one part of it so then what exactly is the difference deep learning is primarily when we are implementing these uh, our algorithms or when we are using neural networks for doing our training and classification and regression and all that right so when we use neural network then it is considered as deep learning and the term deep comes from the fact that you can have several layers of neural networks and these are called deep neural networks and therefore the term deep uh, you know deep learning uh, the other difference between machine learning and deep learning, which the interviewer may be wanting to hear, is that in case of machine learning, the feature engineering is done manually. What do we mean by feature engineering? Basically, when we are trying to train our model, we have our training data, right? So we have our training label data. And uh, this data has several, uh, let's say if it is a regular table, it has several columns. Now, each of these columns actually has information about a feature. Right? So if we are trying to predict the uh, height, weight, and so on and so forth. So these are all features of human beings, let's say. We have census data and we have all this. So those are the features. Now, there may be probably 50 or 100. In some cases, there may be 100 such features. Now, all of them do not contribute to our model. right? So we, as a data scientist, we have to decide whether we should take all of them, all the features, or we should throw away some of them. Because again, if we take all of them, number one, of course, your accuracy will probably get affected. But also there is a computational part. So if you have so many features and then you have so much data, it becomes very tricky. So in case of machine learning, we manually take care of identifying the features that do not contribute to the learning process and thereby we eliminate those features and so on. Right. So this is known as feature engineering and in machine learning we do that manually whereas in deep learning where we use neural networks the model will automatically determine which features to use and which to not use and therefore feature engineering is also done automatically. So this is a explanation these are two key things probably will add value to your response. All right, so the, the next question is, what is the difference between, or what are the differences between machine learning and deep learning? So here, this is a, a quick comparison table between machine learning and deep learning. And in machine learning, learning enables machines to take decisions on their own based on past data. So the, here we are talking primarily of supervised learning. And um, it needs uh, only a small amount of data for training and then works well on low end systems. So you don't need large uh, machines. And most features need to be identified in advance and manually coded. So basically the feature engineering part is done manually. 
and uh, the problem is divided into parts and solved individually and then combined so that is about the machine learning part in deep learning deep learning basically enables machines to take decisions with the help of artificial neural networks so here in deep learning we use neural networks so that is the key differentiator between machine learning and deep learning and usually deep learning involves a large amount of data and therefore the training also requires usually the training process requires high end machines uh, because it needs a lot of computing power and the machine learning features are the, or the feature engineering is done automatically so the neural networks takes care of doing the feature engineering as well and in the case of deep learning therefore it is said that the problem is handled end to end so this is a quick comparison between machine learning and deep learning in case you have that kind of a question then you might get a question around the uses of machine learning or some real life applications of machine learning in modern business the question may be worded in different ways but the the meaning is how exactly is machine learning used or actually supervised machine learning it could be a very specific question around supervised machine learning so this is like give examples of supervised machine learning use of supervised machine learning in modern business so that could be the next question so there are quite a few examples or quite a few use cases if you will for supervised machine learning the very common one is email spam detection so you want to train your application or your system to detect between spam and non spam so this is a very common business application of supervised machine learning so how does this work the way it works is that you obviously have historical data of all of your emails and they are categorized as spam and not spam so that is what is the labeled information and then you feed this information or the all these emails as an input to your model right and the model will then get trained to detect which of the emails are to detect which is spam and which is not spam so that is the training process and this is supervised machine learning because you have labeled data you already have emails which are tagged as spam or not spam and then you use that to train your model right so this is one example now there are a few industry specific applications for supervised machine learning one of the very common ones is in healthcare diagnostics in healthcare diagnostics you have these images and you want to train models to detect whether from a particular image uh, whether it can find out if the person is sick or not whether a person has cancer or not right so this is a very good example of supervised machine learning here the way it works is that existing images it could be x ray images it could be mri or any of these images are available and they are tagged saying that okay this x ray image is defective or the person has an illness or it could be cancer which were illness right so it is tagged as a defective or a clear or good image and defective something like that so we come up with a binary or it could be multi class as well saying that this is defective to 10% this is 25% and so on but let's keep it simple you can give an example of just a binary classification that would be good enough so uh, you can say that in uh, healthcare diagnostics using image we need to detect whether a person is ill or whether a person is having cancer or not so here the way it works is you feed labeled images and you allow the model to learn from that so that when new image is fed it will be able to predict whether this person is having that illness or not having cancer or not right so i think this would be a very good example for supervised machine learning in modern business all right then we can have a question like so we've been talking about supervised and uh, unsupervised then so there can be a question around semi supervised machine learning so what is semi supervised machine learning now semi supervised learning as the name suggests it falls between supervised learning and unsupervised learning but for all practical purposes it is considered as a part of supervised learning and the reason this has come into existence is that in supervised learning you need labeled data so all your data for training your model has to be labeled now this is a big problem in many industries or in many under many situations getting the labeled data is not that easy because there's a lot of effort in labeling this data let's take an example of the diagnostic images uh, we can just 
let's say take x-ray images now there are actually millions of x-ray images available all over the world but the problem is they are not labeled so their images are there but whether it is defective or whether it is good that information is not available along with it right in a form that it can be used by a machine which means that somebody has to take a look at these images and usually it should be like a doctor and uh, then say that okay yes this image is clean and this image is cancerous and so on and so forth now that is a huge effort by itself so this is where semi-supervised learning comes into play so what happens is there is a large amount of data maybe a part of it is labeled then we try some techniques to label the remaining part of the data so that we get completely labeled data and then we train our model so I know this is a little long winding explanation, but unfortunately there is no uh, quick and easy definition for semi-supervised machine learning. This is the only way probably to explain this concept. We may have another question as uh, what are unsupervised machine learning techniques or what are some of the techniques used for performing unsupervised machine learning? So it can be worded in so how do we answer this question so unsupervised learning you can say that there are two types clustering and association and clustering is a technique where similar objects are put together and there are different ways of finding similar objects so their characteristics can be measured and if they have in most of the characteristics if they are similar then they can be put together this is clustering then association you can i think the best way to explain association is with an example in case of association you try to find out how the items are linked to each other so for example if somebody bought a maybe a, a laptop uh, the person has also purchased a mouse so this is more in an e-commerce scenario for example so you can give this as an example so people who are buying laptops are also buying a mouse so that means there is an association between laptops and mouse or maybe people who are buying bread are also buying butter so that is a association that can be created so this is unsupervised learning one of the techniques Okay. All right, then we have very fundamental question. What is the difference between supervised and unsupervised machine learning? So machine learning, these are the two main types of machine learning, supervised and unsupervised. And in case of supervised, and again here, probably the key word that the person may be wanting to hear is labeled data. Now, very often people say, yeah, we have historical data and if we run it, it is supervised and if we don't have historical data yes but you may have historical data but if it is not labeled then you cannot use it for supervised learning so it is it's very key to understand that we put in that keyword labeled okay so when we have labeled data for training our model then we can use supervised learning and if we do not have labeled data then we use unsupervised learning and there are different algorithms available to perform both of these types of uh, trainings. So there can be another question, a little bit more theoretical and conceptual in nature. This is about inductive machine learning and uh, deductive machine learning. So the question can be, what is the difference between inductive machine learning and deductive machine learning or somewhat in that manner so that the exact phrase or exact question can vary and they can ask for examples and things like that but that could be the question so let's first understand what is inductive and deductive training inductive training is induced by somebody and you can illustrate that with a small example i think that always helps so whenever you're doing some explanation try as much as possible as i said to give examples from your work experience or give some analogies and that will also help a lot in explaining as well and for the interviewer also to understand so here we'll take an example or rather we will use an analogy so inductive training is when we induce some knowledge or the learning process into a person without the person actually experiencing Okay. What can be an example? So we can probably tell the person or show a person a video that uh, fire can burn the thing, burn his finger or fire can cause damage. So what is happening here? This person has never probably seen a fire or never seen anything getting damaged by fire. But just because he has seen this video, he knows that, okay, fire is dangerous and if uh, fire can cause damage, right? So 
This is inductive learning. Compared to that, what is deductive learning? So here you draw conclusion or the person draws conclusion out of experience. So we will stick to the analogy. So compared to the showing a video, let's assume a person is allowed to play with fire. Right? And then he figures out that if he puts his finger, it's burning or if he throws something into the fire, it burns. So he is learning through experience. So this is known as deductive learning. Okay? So you can have applications or models that can be trained using inductive learning or deductive learning. All right. I think uh, probably that explanation will be sufficient. The next question is, are KNN and K-means clustering similar to one another or are they same, right? Because the, the letter K is kind of common between them, okay? So let us take a little while to understand what these two are. One is KNN and another is K-means. Uh, KNN stands for K nearest neighbors and uh, K-means, of course, is the clustering mechanism. Now, these two are completely different except for the letter K being common between them. KNN is completely different. K-means clustering is completely different. KNN is a classification process and uh, therefore it, it comes under supervised learning whereas K-means clustering is actually uh, unsupervised. Okay, When you have KNN, when you want to implement KNN which is basically K nearest neighbors, the value of K is a number. So you can say K is equal to 3. You want to implement KNN with K is equal to 3. So which means that it performs the classification in such a way that how does it perform the classification? Classification. So it will take three nearest objects and that's why it's called nearest neighbor. So basically uh, based on the distance, uh, it will try to find out its nearest objects that are let's say three of the nearest objects and then it will check whether the class they belong to which class. right? So if all three belong to one particular class, obviously this new object is also classified as that particular class. But it is possible that they may be from two or three different classes. Okay, So let's say they are from two classes. And then if they are from two classes, now usually you take an odd number, you assign an odd number to. So if there are three of them and two of them belong to one class and then one belongs to another class. So this new object is assigned to the class to which the two of them belong. Now the value of k is sometimes tricky whether should you use 3, should you use 5, should you use 7. That can be tricky because the ultimate classification can also vary. So it's possible that if you're taking k as 3, the object is probably in one particular class. But if you take uh, k is equal to 5, maybe the object will belong to a different class. Because when you're taking three of them, probably two of them belong to uh, class 1 and one belong to class 2. Whereas when you take five of them, it is possible that only two of them belong to class 1 and the three of them belong to class 2. So which means that this object will belong to class 2, right? So you see that? So it is the class allocation can vary depending on the value of k. Now k means on the other hand is a clustering process and it is unsupervised where what it uh, does is the system will basically identify how the objects are, how close the objects are with respect to some of their features. Okay. And but the similarity, of course, is the, the letter K. And in case of K means also we specify its value and it could be three or five or seven. There is no technical limit as such, but it can be any number of clusters that uh, you can create. Okay, so based on the value that you provide, the system will create that many clusters of similar objects. So there is a similarity to that extent that K is a number in both the cases, but actually these two are completely different processes. We have what is known as naive base classifier and people often get confused thinking that naive base is the name of the person who found this uh, classifier or who developed this classifier, which is not 100% true. Base is the name of the person, B-A-Y-E-S is the name of the person, but naive is not the name of the person, right? So naive is basically an English word and that has been added here because of the nature of this particular classifier. Naive base classifier is a probability based uh, classifier and uh, it makes some assumptions that uh, presence of one feature of a class is not related to the presence of any other feature of maybe other classes, right? So which is not a uh, very strong or not a very what do you say accurate assumption because these features can be related and so on but even if we go with this assumption this whole algorithm works very well even with this assumption and uh, that is the good side of it but the term comes from there 
So that is the explanation that you can give. Then there can be question around reinforcement learning. It can be paraphrased in multiple ways. One could be, can you explain how a system can play a game of chess using reinforcement learning? Or it can be any game. So the best way to explain this is again to talk a little bit about what reinforcement learning is about and then elaborate on that to explain the process. So first of all, reinforcement learning has an environment and an agent and the agent is basically performing some actions in order to achieve a certain goal. And these goals can be anything, either if it is related to game, then the goal could be that you have to score very high, score a high value, high number. Or it could be that your uh, number of lives should be as high as possible. Don't lose lives. So these could be some of them. A more advanced examples could be for driving. In the automotive industry, self-driving cars, they actually also make use of reinforcement learning to teach the car how to navigate through the roads and so on and so forth. That is also another example. Now, how does it work? So if the system is uh, basically there is an agent and environment and every time the agent takes a step or performs a task which is taking it towards the goal the final goal let's say to maximize the score or to minimize the number of lives and so on or minimize the deaths for example it is rewarded and every time it takes a step which goes against that goal right contrary or in the reverse direction it is uh, penalized okay so it is like a carrot and stick system now how do you use this to create a game of chess or to create a system to play a game of chess now the way this works is and this could probably go back to this alpha go example where alpha go defeated a human champion so the way it works is in reinforcement learning the system is allowed for example if in this case we are talking about chess so we allow the system to first of all watch playing a game of chess so it could be with a human being or it could be the system itself there are computer games of chess right so either this new learning system has to watch that game or watch a human being play the game because this is reinforcement uh, learning is pretty much all visual so when you're teaching the system to play a game the system will not actually go behind the scenes to understand the logic of your software of this game or anything like that it is just visually watching the screen and then it learns okay so reinforcement learning to a large extent works on that so you need to create a mechanism whereby your model will be able to watch somebody playing the game and then you allow the system also to start playing the game. So it pretty much starts from scratch. Okay. And as it moves forward, it, it, it's at, right at the beginning, the system really knows nothing about the game of chess. Okay. So initially it is a clean slate. It just starts by observing how you're playing. So it will make some random moves and keep losing badly. But then what happens is over a period of time, so you need to now allow the system or you need to play with the system, not just one, two, three, four or five times, but hundreds of times, thousands of times, maybe even hundreds of thousands of times. And that's exactly how AlphaGo has done. It played millions of games between itself and the system, right? So for the game of chess also, you need to do something like that. You need to allow the system to play chess and uh, then learn on its own over a period of repetition. So I think you can probably explain it uh, to this much, to this extent, and uh, it should be uh, sufficient. Now, this is another question, which is again, somewhat similar, but here the size is not coming into picture. So the question is, how will you know which machine learning algorithm to choose for your classification problem? Now, this is not only classification problem, it could be a regression problem. I would like to generalize this question. So if somebody asks you, how will you choose? How will you know which algorithm to use? The simple answer is there is no way you can decide exactly saying that this is the algorithm I'm going to use. In a variety of situations, there are some guidelines. Like for example, you will obviously, depending on the problem, you can say whether it is a classification problem or a regression problem. And then in that sense, you are kind of restricting yourself to if it is a classification problem, there 
are you can only apply a classification algorithm right to that extent you can probably uh, let's say limit the number of algorithms but now within the classification algorithms you have decision trees you have svm you have logistic regression is it possible to outright say yes so for this particular problem since you have explained this now this is the exact algorithm that you can use that is not possible Okay, so we have to try out a bunch of algorithms, see which one gives us the best performance and best accuracy and then decide to go with that particular algorithm. So in machine learning, a lot of it happens through trial and error. There is uh, no real possibility that anybody can just by looking at the problem or understanding the problem tell you that, okay, in this particular situation, this is exactly the algorithm that you should use. Then the questions may be around application of machine learning. And this question is specifically around how Amazon is able to recommend other things to buy. So this is around recommendation engine. How does it work? How does the recommendation engine work? So this is basically the question is all about. So the recommendation engine again works uh, based on various inputs that are provided. Obviously something like uh, you know Amazon uh, a website or e-commerce site like Amazon collects a lot of data around the customer behavior. Who is purchasing what? And if somebody is buying a particular thing, they're also buying something else. So this kind of association, right? So this is the unsupervised learning we talked about. They use this to associate and link or relate items. And that is one part of it. So they kind of build association between items saying that somebody buying this is also buying this. That is one part of it. Then they also profile the users, right? Based on their age, their gender, their geographic location, they will do some profiling and then when somebody is logging in and when somebody is shopping kind of the mapping of these two things are done they try to identify obviously if you have logged in then they know who you are and your information is available like for example your age maybe your gender and uh, where you're located what you purchased earlier right so all this is taken and the recommendation engine basically uses all this information and comes up with recommendations for a particular user so that is how the recommendation engine works all right then the question can be uh, something uh, very basic like when will you go for classification versus uh, regression right when do you do classification instead of regression or when will you use classification instead of regression now yes so so this is basically going back to the understanding of the basics of classification and regression so classification is used when you have to identify or categorize things into discrete classes so the best way to respond to this question is to take up some examples and use it otherwise it can become a little tricky the question may sound very simple but explaining it can sometimes be very tricky in case of regression we use of course there will be some keywords that they will be looking for so just you need to make sure you use those keywords one is the discrete values another is the continuous values so for regression if we are trying to find some continuous values you use regression whereas if you are trying to find some discrete values you use classification and then you need to illustrate what are some of the examples so classification is like let's say there are images and you need to put them into classes like cat dog elephant tiger something like that so that is a classification uh, problem or it can be that is a multi-class classification uh, problem it could be binary classification problem like for example whether a customer will buy or he will not buy that is a classification binary classification it can be in the weather uh, forecast area now weather forecast is again combination of regression and classification because on the one hand you want to predict whether it's going to rain or not that's a classification problem that's a binary classification right whether it's going to rain or not rain however you also have to predict what is going to be the temperature tomorrow right now temperature is a continuous value you can't answer the temperature in a yes or no kind of a response right so what will be the temperature tomorrow so you need to give a number which can be like 20 degrees 30 degrees or whatever right so that is where you use regression one more example is stock price prediction so that is where again you will use regression so these are the various examples so you need to illustrate with examples and make sure you include those keywords like discrete and continuous so the next question is more about a little bit of a design related question to understand your concepts and things like that so it is how will you design a spam 
filter. So how do you basically design or develop a spam filter? So I think the main thing here is he is looking at probably understanding your concepts in terms of uh, what is the algorithm you will use or what is your understanding about difference between classification and regression uh, and things like that, right? And the process, of course methodology and the process so the best way to go about responding to this is we say that okay this is a classification problem because we want to find out whether an email is a spam or not spam so that we can apply the filter accordingly so first thing is to identify what type of a problem it is so we have identified that it is a classification then the second step may be to find out what kind of algorithm to use now since this is a binary classification problem logistic regression is a very common very common algorithm but however right as i said earlier also we can never say that okay for this particular problem this is exactly the algorithm that we can use so we can also probably try decision trees or even support vector machines for example svm so we will kind of list down a few of these algorithms and we will say okay we want to we would like to try out these algorithms and then we go about taking your historical data which is the labeled data which are marked so you will have a bunch of emails and uh, then you split that into training and test data sets you use your training data set to train your model that or your algorithm that you have used or rather the model actually so and you actually will have three models let's say you are trying to test out three algorithms so you will obviously have three models so you need to try all three models and test them out as well see which one gives the best accuracy and then you decide that you will go with that model okay so training and test will be done and then you zero in on one particular model and then you say okay this is the model will we use we will use and then go ahead and implement that or put that in production so that is the way you design a spam filter the next question is about random forest. So what is random forest? So this is a very straightforward question. However, the response, you need to be again a little careful. While we all know what is random forest, explaining this can sometimes be tricky. So one thing is random forest is kind of in one way, it is an extension of decision trees because it is basically nothing but you have multiple decision trees and uh, trees will basically we will use for doing if it is classification mostly it is classification you will use the, the trees for classification and then you use voting for finding the, the final class so that is the underlying so, but how will you explain this how will you respond to this so first thing obviously we will say that random forest is one of the algorithms and the more important thing that you need to probably the interviewer is is waiting to hear is ensemble learner right so this is one type of ensemble learner what is ensemble learner ensemble learner is like a combination of algorithms so uh, it is a learner which consists of more than one algorithm or more than one uh, maybe models okay so in case of random forest the algorithm is the same but instead of using one instance of it we use multiple instances of it and we use so in a way that is a, a random forest is an ensemble learner there are other types of ensemble learners where we have like we use different algorithms itself so you have one maybe logistic regression and a decision tree combined together and so on and so forth or there are other ways like for example splitting the data in a certain way and so on so that's all about ensemble we will not go into that but random forest itself i think the interviewer will be happy to hear this word ensemble learner and so then you go and explain how the random forest works so if the random forest is used for classification then we use what is known as a voting mechanism so basically how does it work let's say your random forest consists of 100 trees okay and each observation you pass through this forest and each observation let's say it is a classification problem binary classification zero or one and you have 100 trees now if 90 trees say that it is a zero and 10 of the trees say it is a one you take the majority you may take a vote and since 90 of them are saying zero you classify this as zero then you take the next observation and so on so that is the way uh, random forest works for classification if it is a regression problem it's somewhat similar but only thing is instead of what what we will do is so re in regression remember what happens you actually calculate a value right so for example you're using regression to predict the temperature and uh, you have 100 trees and each tree obviously will probably predict a different value of the temperature they may be close to each other but they may not be exactly the same value 
So these 100 trees. So how do you now find the actual value, uh, the output for the entire forest, right? So you have outputs of individual trees which are a part of this forest, but then you need to find the final output of the forest itself. So how do you do that? So in case of regression, you take like an average or the mean of all the 100 trees, right? So this is also a way of reducing the error. So maybe if you have only one tree and if that one tree makes a error, it is basically 100% wrong or 100% right right but if you have on the other hand if you have a bunch of trees you are basically mitigating that error or reducing that error okay so that is the way random forest works so the next question is considering the long list of machine learning algorithms how will you decide on which one to use so once again here there is no way to outright say that this is the algorithm that we will use for a given data set this is a very good question but then the response has to be like again there will not be a one size fits all so we need to first of all you can probably shorten the list in terms of by saying okay whether it is a classification problem or it is a regression problem to that extent you can probably uh, shorten the list because you don't have to use all of them if it is a classification problem you only can pick from the classification algorithms right so for example if it's a classification you cannot use linear regression algorithm there or if it is a regression problem you cannot use svm or maybe no you can use svm but maybe a logistic regression right so to that extent you can probably shorten the list but still you will not be able to 100 percent decide on saying that this is the exact algorithm that i am going to use so the way to go about is you choose a few algorithms based on what the problem is you try out your data you train some models of these algorithms check which one gives you the lowest error or the highest accuracy accuracy and based on that you choose that particular algorithm okay all right then there can be questions around bias and variance so the question can be what is bias and variance in machine learning uh, so you just need to give out a definition for each of these for example uh, bias in machine learning it occurs when the predicted values are far away from the actual value so that is a bias Okay. And whereas uh, they are all, all the values are probably, they are far off, but they are very near to each other though. The predicted values are close to each other, right? While they are far off from the actual value, but they are close to each other. You see the difference? So that is bias. And then the other part is your variance. Now variance is when the predicted values are all over the place. Right? So the variance is high. That means it may be close to the target, but it is kind of very scattered. So the point, the predicted values are not close to each other, right? In case of bias, the predicted values are close to each other, but they are not close to the target. But here they may be close to the target, but they may not be close to each other. So it, they are a little bit more scattered. So that is what in case of a variance. Okay, then the next question is about again related to bias and variance. What is the trade-off between bias? bias and variance yes i think this is a interesting question because these two are heading in different directions so for example if you try to minimize the bias variance will keep going high and if you try to minimize the variance bias will keep going high and there is no way you can minimize both of them so you need to have a trade-off saying that okay this is the level at which i will have my bias and this is the level at which i will have variance so the trade-off is that pretty much uh, that you, you decide what is the level you will tolerate for your bias and what is the level you will tolerate for variance and a combination of these two in such a way that your final results are not way off and having a trade-off will ensure that the results are consistent right so that is basically the output is consistent and which means that they are close to each other and they are also accurate which that means they are as close to the target as possible right so if either of these is high then one of them will go off the track define precision and recall now again here i think uh, it would be best to uh, draw a diagram and take a uh, confusion matrix and it is very simple the definition is like a formula your precision is true positive by true positive plus false positive and your recall is true positive by true positive plus false negative okay so that's you can just show it in a mathematical way that's pretty much uh, you know that can be shown that's the easiest way to define so the next question can be about uh, decision tree what is decision tree pruning and why is it so 
basically decision trees are really simple to implement and understand but one of the drawbacks of decision trees is that it can become highly complicated as it grows right and the rules and the conditions can become very complicated and this can also lead to overfitting which is basically that during training you will get 100% accuracy but when you're doing testing you will get a lot of errors so that is the reason pruning needs to be done so the purpose or the reason for doing uh, decision tree pruning is to reduce overfitting or to cut down on overfitting and uh, what is decision tree pruning it is basically that you reduce the number of branches because uh, as you may be aware a tree consists of the root node and then there are several internal nodes and then you have the leaf nodes now if there are too many of these internal nodes that is when you face the problem of overfitting and pruning is the process of reducing those internal nodes all right so the next question can be what is logistic regression uh, so basically logistic regression is um, uh, one of the techniques used for uh, performing classification especially binary classification now there is something special about logistic regression and there are a couple of things you need to be careful about first of all the name is a little confusing it is called logistic regression but it is used for classification so this can be sometimes confusing so you need to probably clarify that to the interviewer if, if it's really you know if it is required and they can also ask this like a trick question right so that is one part second thing is the term logistic has nothing to do with the usual logistics that we talk about but it is derived from log so that the mathematical derivation was log and therefore the name logistic regression so what is logistic regression and how is it used so logistic regression is used for binary classification and the output of a logistic regression is either a zero or a one and it varies so it's basically it calculates a probability between zero and one and we can set a threshold that can vary typically it is 0.5 so any value above 0.5 is considered as one and if the probability is below 0.5 it is considered as zero so that is the way we calculate the probability or the system calculates the probability and based on the threshold it sets a value of zero or one which is like a binary classification zero or one okay then we have a question around k nearest neighbor algorithm so explain k nearest neighbor algorithm so first of all what is a k nearest neighbor algorithm this is a classification algorithm so that is the first thing we need to mention and we also need to mention that the k is a number it is an integer and this is variable and we can define what the value of k should be it can be two three five seven and usually it is an odd number so that is something we need to mention technically it can be even number also but then typically it would be odd number and we will see why that is okay so based on that we need to classify objects okay we need to classify objects so again it will be very helpful to draw a diagram you know if you are explaining i think that will be the best way so draw some diagram like this and let's say we have three clusters or three classes existing and now you want to find for a new item that has come you want to find out which class this belongs to right so you go about as the name suggests it you go about finding the nearest neighbors right the points which are closest to this and how many of them you will find that is what is defined by k now let's say our initial value of k was 5 okay? so you will find the k the five nearest data points so in this case as it is illustrated these are the five nearest data points but then all five do not belong to the same class or cluster so there are one belonging to this cluster one the second one belonging to this cluster two three of them belonging to this third cluster okay so how do you decide that's exactly the reason we should as much as possible try to assign a odd number so that it becomes easier to assign this so in this case you see that the majority actually if there are multiple classes then you go with the majority so since three of these items belong to this class we assign which is basically the in in this case the green or the tennis or the third cluster as i was uh, talking about 
right? So we assign it to this uh, third class. So in this case, it is uh, that's how it is decided. Okay. So k nearest neighbors. So first thing is to identify the number of neighbors that are mentioned as k. So in this case, it is k is equal to five. So we find the five nearest points and then find out out of these five which class has the maximum number in that. Okay. And and then the uh, new data point is assigned to that class. Okay. So that's pretty much how k nearest neighbors work. Welcome to this video on Machine Learning Roadmap 2021. AI and machine learning have been the top buzzed words in 2020. Machine learning can be an interesting career move for programmers, developers and other professionals looking for a shift in their career. Over the last few years, machine learning and artificial intelligence together have become a crucial component in many of the world's most popular business applications. As we approach 2021, it's a good time for us to take a look at the machine learning roadmap for 2021. In this video, we will discuss the basics of machine learning and the companies actively hiring for machine learning roles. You will understand the skills required to become a machine learning expert in 2021, the salary of a machine learning engineer, and how Simply Learn can help you get certified in machine learning. Now let's look at what machine learning is. Machine learning is an application of artificial intelligence that allows systems to learn from vast volumes of data. It enables you to process, analyze and train machines using data and create models to solve business problems. Machine learning has the potential to learn from structured, semi-structured and unstructured data. There are various supervised, unsupervised and reinforcement learning algorithms used to build machine learning models. Some of the most popular machine learning algorithms are linear regression, logistic regression, support vector machines, k-nearest neighbors, k-means clustering, naive and others. Now some of the top companies hiring for machine learning roles are Microsoft, Spotify, Google, Cell, Ericsson, Oracle and Walmart. There are numerous product based, service based as well as startup companies that are hiring for machine learning positions. Now learning machine learning can position an individual for a variety of exciting careers in a growing number of industries. With machine learning becoming more widely accepted and adapted technology, let's look at the important skills you need to know to become a machine learning expert in 2021. First, we have programming. Machine learning mostly depends on algorithms, which means one should possess sound knowledge of different programming languages such as Python and R. You should have knowledge of basic programming concepts and understand data structures. This will help you write better and efficient codes. You should also know about searching, sorting and optimization algorithms. The second skill you need to know is mathematics and statistics. Statistics is the backbone of data analytics. You should have knowledge of various measures such as mean, median, variance, etc. Distributions such as uniform, normal, binomial, poison, etc. And analysis methods such as ANOVA, MANOVA, t-test, chi-square test, hypothesis testing and others. Now this is required for building and validating models from observed data. A basic understanding of high school mathematics will help you understand how machine learning algorithms work. The topics include probability, linear algebra and calculus. The third skill you need to know is database and SQL. Very often, machine learning tasks are carried out using data stored in the form of tables that are present in database servers. So it's important to know about databases and SQL. Good understanding of relational databases and NoSQL databases such as MySQL, PostgreSQL, Oracle Database, Microsoft SQL Server is vital to store, manipulate, retrieve and handle structured data. Now we have data wrangling. Now, there's a lot of pre-processing of data that is needed before you start building your machine learning model. Collecting the data, cleaning it, identifying the problems, asking the right questions, and formatting the data are crucial steps in machine learning. You should have knowledge of libraries and packages such as NumPy, Pandas, Plyr, Dplyr, and Tidier to perform data wrangling. Next, we have data visualization. While working on any machine learning problem, it's important to understand the data well. Data visualization and exploratory data analysis skills are very important to show the hidden trends and insights in a visual form using various charts and graphs. This will help you find out unseen patterns in the data. You need to have experience with Matplotlib, Seaborn, Plotly and ggplot libraries. It would be an advantage to know BI tools such as Tableau and Power BI. Finally, the most important skill is machine learning itself. You need to learn different machine learning techniques and algorithms that are widely used to solve business problems. Then implement the algorithms using Python and R libraries such as scikit-learn, TensorFlow, Caret, and MLR. Having knowledge of natural language processing, computer vision and time series analysis would be a really good advantage. 
To gain more experience in solving real-world problems, you need to work on small projects using variety of datasets. Data science and machine learning challenges such as those on GitHub and Kaggle are a great way to get exposed to different kinds of problems and their nuances. Now talking about the salary of a machine learning engineer, according to Glassdoor, in the United States, a machine learning engineer can earn around $114,000 per annum, while in India, you can earn nearly rupees per annum. This salary may vary based on your experience, the industry you are applying for, and the company policy. Now moving on to the final section, let me tell you how Simply Learn can help you start your career in machine learning. So let me take you to our website first. Okay, so I am on the Chrome browser. Let me search for simplylearn.com. And here, under what you want to learn, let me type machine learning. It will show me the relevant courses that Simply Learn offers in the machine learning category. So you can see here, there are multiple courses. First, let me open the first link and let's open the second link as well. So, so this is the postgraduate program in AI and machine learning, which is in collaboration with Purdue University and IBM. If I scroll down, you can see the key features of this course. So we'll get Purdue Alumni Association membership industry recognized IBM certificates, enrollment to Simply Learn's job assist, there's 25 plus hands-on projects on GPU enabled labs, you have 450 plus hours of applied learning, capstone projects in three domains and much more. And here you can see on the right, this is the certificate that you will get after completing this program. And you will also get certificates recognized by IBM. And another key feature of this course is you can enroll to Simply Learn Job Assist program. So you will get IIM Jobs Pro membership for six months, resume assistance and career monitoring, there's interview preparation and career affairs. If I scroll further, here you can see the learning path. And you will learn about Python for data science, there's machine learning, deep learning with TensorFlow and Keras, there's advanced deep learning and computer vision. You will also learn about natural language processing, that is NLP and speech recognition. We have reinforcement learning and you also have the opportunity to select a few electives. So we have IBM Watson for chatbots, machine learning with R, there's Git and GitHub training and two others. Here you can see the skills that will be covered. So you will learn about statistics, which is a core component of machine learning. We learn about Python, supervised learning, there's GANs, computer vision, TensorFlow. This reinforcement learning, speech recognition, you will also learn about NumPy, Pandas and other libraries. And here you can see, these are some of the tools that will be covered in this course. If I scroll further, now this is the important section, you can see the industry projects that you will get to work on. So this is on Twitter, this one on Zomato, one on Uber and Mercedes-Benz as well. Now they are our course advisors. So please go ahead and enroll to this postgraduate program in AI machine learning if you want to kickstart your career in machine learning. Now the next course we have is machine learning certification course. If I scroll down you can see the details of this course. So you will gain expertise with 25 plus hands-on exercises. You will get to work on four real life industry based projects with integrated labs. There will be dedicated mentoring sessions from industry experts. 44 hours of instructor led training with certification. Here on the right, you can see the skills that will be covered. So, we learn about time series modeling, linear and logistic regression. You will also learn about support vector machines, game means clustering, knife paste, decision trees, random forest. And you learn the concepts of bagging and boosting and deep learning fundamentals as well. Here you can see the course content. And if I scroll further, now these are the projects that you'll get to work on. And finally, you'll receive this certificate once you complete the course. So that brings us to the end of this video on machine learning full course. I hope it was useful and interesting. If you enjoyed the video, then please subscribe to the Simply Learn channel. Thank you for watching and keep learning.